Section 1 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 15. Review of 1861. Summary of Hostile Acts of United States Government. Fuller details of some of them. Third session of Provisional Congress. Message. Subjugation of the Southern States intended. Obstinacy of the enemy. Insensibility of the North as to the crisis. Vast preparation of the enemy. Embargo and blockade. Indiscriminate war waged. Action of Confederate Congress. Confiscation Act of United States Congress. Declared object of the war. Powers of United States Government. Forfeitures inflicted. Due process of law. How interpreted. Who pleads the Constitution? Wanton destruction of private property unlawful. Adams on terms of the Treaty of Ghent. Sectional hatred. Order of President Lincoln to Army officers in regard to slaves. Educating the people. Fremont's proclamation. Proclamation of General T.W. Sherman. Proclamation of General Halleck and others. Letters of Mark. Our privateers. Officers tried for piracy. Retaliatory orders. Discussion in the British House of Lords. Recognition as a belligerent of the Confederacy. Exchange of prisoners. Theory of the United States. Views of McClellan. Revolutionary conduct of United States government. Extent of the war at the close of 1861. Victories of the year, new branches of manufactures, election of Confederate States President, posterity may ask the cause of such hostile actions. Answer. The inauguration of the permanent government amid the struggles of war was welcomed by our people as a sign of the independence for which all their sacrifices had been made, and the increased efforts of the enemy for our subjugation were met by corresponding determination on our part to maintain the rights our fathers left us at whatever cost. We now enter upon those terrible scenes of wrong and blood in which the government of the United States, driven to desperation by our successful resistance, broke through every restraint of the Constitution, of national law, of justice, and of humanity. But before commencing this fearful narration, let us sum up the hostile acts and usurpations committed during the first year. Our people had been declared to be combinations of insurrectionists, and more than 150,000 men had been called to arms to invade our territory. Our ports were blockaded for the destruction of our regular commerce, and we had been threatened with denunciation as pirates if we molested a vessel of the United States, and some of our citizens had been confined in cells to await the punishment of piracy. One of our states was rent asunder and a new state constructed out of the fragment. Every proposition for a peaceful solution of pending issues had been spurned. An indiscriminate warfare had been waged upon our peaceful citizens, their dwellings burned and their crops destroyed. A law had been passed imposing a penalty of forfeiture on the owner of any faithful slave who gave military or naval service to the Confederacy, and forbidding military commanders to interfere for the restoration of fugitives. The United States government had refused to agree to an exchange of prisoners, and suffered those we had captured to languish in captivity. It had falsely represented us in every court of Europe to defeat our efforts to obtain a recognition from foreign powers. It had seized a portion of the members of the legislature of one state and confined them in a distant military prison, because they were thought merely to sympathize with us, though they had not committed an overt act. It had refused all the propositions of another state for a peaceful neutrality, invaded her, and seized important positions, where not even a disturbance of the peace had occurred, and perpetrated the most despotic outrages on her people. It rejected the most conciliatory terms offered for the sake of peace by the governor of another state, claimed for itself an unrestricted right to move and station its troops whenever and wherever its officers might think it to be desirable, and persisted in its aggressions until the people were involved in conflicts, and a provisional government became necessary for their protection. 
Within the northern states, which professed to be struggling to maintain the Union, the Constitution, its only bond, and the laws made in pursuance of it were in peaceful, undisputed existence. Yet even there the government ruled with the tyrant's hand, and the provisions for the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the personal liberty of the citizen were daily violated, and these sacred rights of man suppressed by military force. But some of these hostile actions require here a more specific consideration. They were the antecedents of oppressive measures which the enemy strove to enforce upon us during the entire war. The third session of the Provisional Congress commenced at Richmond on July 20th, 1861, and ended on August 31st. At the previous session, a resolution had been passed authorizing the President to cause the several executive departments, with the archives thereof, to be removed to Richmond at such time as he might determine, prior to July 20th. In my message to the Congress of that date, the cause of removal was stated to be that the aggressive movements of the enemy required prompt, energetic action, that the accumulation of his forces on the Potomac sufficiently demonstrated that his first efforts were to be directed against Virginia, and from no point could necessary measures for her defense and protection be so effectively provided as from her own capital. My remarks to Congress at this session were confined to such important facts as had occurred during the recess and to the matters connected with the public defense. Quote, the odious features of the policy and purposes of the government of the United States stood revealed. The recent grant of a half million of men and four hundred millions of dollars by their Congress was a confession that their intention was a subjugation of the southern states. End quote. The fact thus briefly presented in the message was established by the course pursued since the first advent to power of those who had come into possession of the sword and the purse of the Union. Not only by the legislation cited was the intent to make war for the purpose of subjugating the southern states revealed, but also, and yet more significantly, was the purpose manifested in the evasion and final rejection of every proposition of the southern states for a peaceful solution of the issues arising from secession. Such extreme obstinacy was unnatural, unreasonable, and contrary to the general precedents of history, except those which resulted in civil war. This unfavorable indication was also observable in the original party of abolition. Its intolerance had a violence which neither truth nor justice nor religion could restrain, and it was transferred undiluted to their successors. The resistance to the demands of the states and persistence in aggressions upon them were the occasion of constant apprehensions and futile warnings of their suicidal tendency on the part of the statesmen of the period. For thirty years had patriotism and wisdom pointed to dissolution by this perverse uncharitableness. Had the North been contending for a principle only, there would have been a satisfactory settlement, not indeed by compromising the principle, but by adjusting the manner of its operation so that only good results should ensue. But when the contest is for supremacy on one side and self-defense on the other, when the aim of the aggressor is, quote, power, plunder, and extended rule, end quote, there will be no concessions by him, no compromises, no adjustment of results. The alternative is subjugation by the sword or peace by absolute submission. The latter condition could not be accepted by us. The former was, therefore, to be resisted as best we might. An amazing insensibility seemed to possess a portion of the northern people as to the crisis before them. They would not realize that their purpose of supremacy would be so resolutely resisted, that, if persisted in, it must be carried to the extent of bloodshed in sectional war. With them, the lust of dominion was stronger than the sense of justice or of the fraternity and the equal rights of the states which the union was formed to secure and so they were blind to palpable results otherwise they must have seen when the remnants of the old whig party joined hands with abolitionism that it was like a league with the spirit of evil in which the conditions of the bond were bestowal of power on one side and the commission of deeds meet for disunion on the other the honest masses should have remembered that when scheming leaders abandon principle and adopt the ideas of dreamers and fanatics, the ladder on which they would mount to power is one on which they cannot return, and upon which it would be a fatal delusion to follow. The reality of armed resistance on our part the North was slow to comprehend. 
the division of sentiment at the south on the question of the expediency of immediate secession was mistaken for the existence of a submission party whereas the division was confined to expediency and wholly disappeared when our territory was invaded then was revealed to them the necessity of defending their homes and liberties against the ruthless assault on both and then extraordinary unanimity prevailed then as hamilton and madison had stated war against the states had effected the deprecated dissolution of the union adjustment by negotiation the united states government had rejected and had chosen to attempt our subjugation this of course adopted without provocation was pursued with a ferocity that disregarded all the laws of civilized warfare and must permanently remain a stain upon the escutcheon of a government once bright among the nations the vast provision made by the united states in the material of war the money appropriated and the men enrolled furnished a sufficient refutation to the pretense that they were only engaged in dispersing rioters and suppressing unlawful combinations too strong for the usual course of judicial proceedings further they virtually recognized the separate existence of the confederate states by an interdictive embargo and blockade of all commerce between them and the united states not only by sea but by land not only with those who bore arms but with the entire population of the confederate states they waged an indiscriminate war upon all private houses in isolated retreats were bombarded and burned grain crops in the field were consumed by the torch and when the torch was not applied careful labor was bestowed to render complete the destruction of every article of use or ornament remaining in private dwellings after their female inhabitants had fled from the insults of brutal soldiers a petty war was made on the sick including women and children by carefully devised measures to prevent them from obtaining the necessary medicines were these the appropriate means by which to execute the laws and in suppressing rioters to secure tranquillity and preserve a voluntary union was this a government resting on the consent of the governed at this session of the confederate congress additional forces were provided to repel invasion by authorizing the president to accept the services of any number of volunteers not exceeding four hundred thousand men authority was also given for suitable financial measures hereafter stated and the levy of a tax an act of sequestration was also adopted as a countervailing measure against the operations of the confiscation law enacted by the congress of the united states on august sixth eighteen sixty one this act of the united states congress with its complement passed in the ensuing year will be considered further on in these pages one of the most indicative of the sections however provided that whenever any person claimed to be held to labor or service under the laws of any state shall be permitted by the person to whom such labor or service is claimed to be due to take up arms against the united states or to work or to be employed in or upon any fort entrenchment etc or in any military or naval service whatever against the government of the united states the person to whom such labor is claimed to be due shall forfeit his claim and to any attempt to enforce it a statement of the facts shall be a sufficient answer the president of the united states in his message of december third eighteen sixty one stated that numbers of persons held to service had been liberated and were dependent on the united states and must be provided for in some way he recommended that steps be taken for colonizing them at some places in a climate congenial to them as the president and the congress of the united states had declared this to be a war for the preservation of the constitution it may not be out of place to see what course they now undertook to pursue under the pretext of preserving the constitution of the united states it had been conceded in all time that the congress of the united states had no power to legislate on slavery in the states and that this was a subject for state legislation it was one of the powers not granted in the constitution but quote, reserved to the states respectively end quote. all the powers of the federal government were delegated to it by the states and all which were reserved were withheld from the federal government as well in time of war as in peace the conditions of peace or war made no change in the powers granted in the constitution the attempt therefore by congress to exercise a power of confiscation one not granted to it was a mere usurpation the argument of forfeiture for treason does not reach the case because there could be no forfeiture until after conviction and the constitution says quote, no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture 
except during the life of the person attainted. End quote. The Confiscation Act of 1861 undertook to convict and sentence without a trial, and entirely to deprive the owner of slaves of his property by giving final freedom to the slaves. Still further, to show how regardless the United States government was of the limitations imposed upon it by the Compact of Union, the reader is referred to the fifth article of the First Amendment, being one of those cases in which the people of the several states, in an abundance of caution, threw additional protection around rights which the framers of the Constitution thought already sufficiently guarded. The last two clauses of the article read thus, No person, quote, shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. End quote. Here was a political indictment on conviction by the Congress and President, with total forfeitures inflicted in palpable violation of each and of all the cited clauses of the Constitution. One can scarcely anticipate such effrontery as would argue that due process of law meant an act of Congress, that judicial power could thus be conferred upon the President and private property be confiscated for party success, without violating the Constitution which the actors had sworn to support. The unconstitutionality of the measure was so palpable that, when the bill was under consideration, Mr. Thaddeus Stevens, a member of Congress from Pennsylvania, said, quote, I thought the time had come when the laws of war were to govern our action, when constitutions, if they stood in the way of the laws of war in dealing with the enemy, had no right to intervene. Who pleads the Constitution against our proposed action? End quote. This subject is further considered in subsequent chapters on the measures of emancipation adopted by the United States government. It is to be remembered in this connection that pillage and the wanton destruction of private property are not permitted by the laws of war among civilized nations. When prosecuting the war with Mexico, we respected private property of the enemy, and when, in 1781, Great Britain, attempting to reduce her revolted American colonies, took possession of the country round and about Point Comfort, Fortress Monroe, the homes quietly occupied by the rebellious people were spared by the armies of the self-asserting ruler of the land. At a later date, war existed between Great Britain and the independent states of the Union, during which Great Britain got possession of various points within the states. At the Treaty of Ghent, 1815, by which peace was restored to the two countries, it was stipulated in the first article that all captured places should be restored, quote, without causing any destruction or carrying away any of the artillery or other public property originally captured in the said forts or places, and which shall remain therein upon the exchange of the ratifications of this treaty, or any slaves or other private property, end quote. Persistent efforts were made to avoid the return of deported slaves, and it was attempted to put them in the category of artillery, which had been removed before the exchange of ratification. Mr. John Quincy Adams, first as United States Minister to England, and subsequently as United States Secretary of State, conducted with great vigor and earnestness a long correspondence to maintain the true construction of the treaty as recognizing and guarding the right of private property in slaves. In his letter to Viscount Castlereagh, the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, after explaining the distinction between artillery or other public property and slaves or other private property as used in the treaty and why it might be impracticable if they had been removed to return the former but that the reasons did not apply to the latter for he proceeds to say quote, private property not having been subject to legitimate capture with the places was not liable to the reason of limitation End quote. in the same letter mr adams writes quote, Merchant vessels and effects captured on the high seas are, by the laws of war between civilized nations, lawful prize, and by the capture become the property of the captors. But, as by the same usages of civilized nations, private property is not the subject of lawful capture in war upon the land. It is perfectly clear that, in every stipulation, private property shall be respected, or that, upon the restoration of places taken during the war, it shall not be carried away. End quote. See American State Papers, Volume 4, pages 122 and 123. Sectional hostility and party zeal had not then so far undermined the feeling of fraternity, which generated the Union as to make a public officer construe the Constitution as it might favor or injure one section or another, and Great Britain was, 
from a sense of right, compelled to recognize the wrong done in deporting slaves, the private property of American citizens. On the 4th of December, 1861, the President of the United States issued an order to the Commander-in-Chief relative to slaves, as above mentioned, in which he said, quote, Their arrest as fugitives from service or labor should be immediately followed by the military arrest of the parties making the seizure, end quote. Had Congress and the President made new laws of war? Although the government of the United States did not boldly proclaim the immediate emancipation of all slaves, the tendency of all its actions was directly to that end. To use a favorite expression of its leaders, the northern people were not at that time, quote, educated up to the point, end quote. A revolt from too sudden a revelation of its entire policy was apprehended. Even as late as July 7, 1862, General McClellan wrote to the authorities at Washington from the vicinity of Richmond, quote, A declaration of radical views, especially upon slavery, will rapidly disintegrate our armies. End quote. Nevertheless, when policy indicated it, the declaration came, as will be seen hereafter. Meantime, General Fremont, in command in Missouri, issued a proclamation on August 31, 1861, declaring the property, real and personal, of all persons in arms against the United States, or taking an active part with their enemies, to be confiscated, and their slaves to be free men. This was subsequently modified to conform to the terms of the above-mentioned Confiscation Act. General Thomas W. Sherman, commanding at Port Royal in South Carolina, was instructed on October 14, 1861, to receive all persons, whether slaves or not, and give them employment, quote, assuring all loyal masters that Congress will provide just compensation to them for the loss of the services of the persons so employed, end quote. To others, no relief was to be given. This was, by confiscation, to punish a class of citizens in the emancipation of every slave whose owner rendered support to the Confederate States. Finally, General Halleck, who succeeded Fremont and General Dix, commanding near Fortress Monroe, issued orders not to permit slaves to come within their lines. They were speedily condemned for this action, because it put a stop to the current of emancipation, which will be hereafter narrated. Reference has been made to our want of a navy, and the efforts made to supply the deficiency. The usual resort under such circumstances to privateers was, in our case, without the ordinary incentive of gain, as all foreign ports were closed against our prizes, and our own ports, being soon blockaded, our vessels, public or private, had but the alternative of burning or bonding their captures. To those who, nevertheless, desired them, letters of mark were granted by us, and there was soon a small fleet of vessels composed of those which had taken out these letters, and others which had been purchased and fitted out by the Navy Department. They hovered on the coasts of the northern states, capturing and destroying their vessels, and filling the enemy with consternation. The President of the United States had already declared in his proclamation of April 19th, as above stated, that, quote, any person who, under the pretended authority of the said Confederate States, should molest a vessel of the United States, or the persons or cargo on board, end quote, should be held amenable to the laws of the United States for the prevention of piracy. This was another violation of international law, another instance of arrogant disregard for universal opinion. The threat, if meant for intimidation, and to deprive the Confederacy of one of the usual weapons of war, was unbecoming the head of a government. To have executed it upon a helpless prisoner would have been a crime intensified by its cowardice. Happily for the United States, the threat was not executed but the failure to carry out the declared purpose was coupled with humiliation, because it was the result of a notice to retaliate as fully as might need be to stop such a barbarous practice. To yield to the notice thus served was a practical admission by the United States government that the Confederacy had become a power among the nations. On June 3, 1861, the little schooner Savannah, previously a pilot boat in Charleston Harbor, and sailing under a commission issued by authority of the Confederate States, was captured by the United States brig Perry. The crew were placed in irons and sent to New York. It appeared from statements made without contradiction that they were not treated as prisoners of war, whereupon a letter was addressed by me to President Lincoln, dated July 6th, stating explicitly that, quote, painful as will be the necessity, 
this government will deal out to the prisoners held by it the same treatment and the same fate as shall be experienced by those captured on the savannah and if driven to the terrible necessity of retaliation by your execution of any of the officers or crew of the savannah that retaliation will be extended so far as shall be requisite to secure the abandonment of a practice unknown to the warfare of civilized man and so barbarous as to disgrace the nation which shall be guilty of inaugurating it a reply was promised to this letter but none came still later in the year the privateer jefferson davis was captured the captain and crew brought into philadelphia and the captain tried and found guilty of piracy and threatened with death immediately i instructed general winder at richmond to select one prisoner of the highest rank to be confined in a cell appropriated to convicted felons and treated in all respects as if convicted and to be held for execution in the same manner as might be adopted for the execution of the prisoner of war in philadelphia he was further instructed to select thirteen other prisoners of the highest rank to be held in the same manner as hostages for the thirteen prisoners held in new york for trial as pirates by this course the infamous attempt made by the united states government to commit judicial murder on prisoners of war was arrested the attention of the british house of lords was also attracted to the proclamation of president lincoln threatening the officers and crew of privateers with the punishment of piracy it led to a discussion in which the earl of derby said quote, he apprehended that if one thing was clearer than another it was that privateering was not piracy and that no law could make that piracy as regarded the subjects of one nation which was not piracy by the law of nations consequently the united states must not be allowed to entertain this doctrine and to call upon her majesty's government not to interfere end quote. the lord chancellor said quote, there was no doubt that if an englishman engaged in the service of the southern states he violated the laws of his country and rendered himself liable to punishment and that he had no right to trust to the protection of his native country to shield him from the consequences of his act but though that individual would be guilty of a breach of the law of his own country he could not be treated as a pirate and those who treated him as a pirate would be guilty of murder end quote. the appearance of this little fleet on the ocean made it necessary for the powers of europe immediately to define their position relative to the contending powers great britain adopting a position of neutrality and recognizing both as belligerents interdicted the armed ships and privateers of both from carrying prizes into the waters of the united kingdom or its colonies all the other powers recognized the confederate states to be belligerents but closed their ports against the admission of prizes captured by either belligerent it is worthy of notice that the united states government though it had previously declined at this time notified the english and french governments that it was now willing to adhere to all the conditions of the paris congress of eighteen fifty six provided the clause abolishing privateers might apply to the confederate states the offer with the proviso was honorably declined by both france and england in the matter of the exchange of prisoners which became important in consequence of these retaliatory measures and the number taken by our troops at manassas the people of the northern states were the victims of incessant mortification and distress through the vacillating and cruel conduct of their government it based all its immense military movements on the theory that quote, the laws of the united states have been for some time past and now are opposed and the execution thereof obstructed by combinations too powerful to be suppressed end quote, by the ordinary methods under this theory the united states are assumed to be one nation and the distinctions among them of states are as little recognized as if they did not exist this theory was false and thereby led its originators into constant blunders when the leaders of a government aspire to the acquisition of absolute unlimited power and the sword is drawn to hew the way it would be more logical and respectable to declare the laws silent than to attempt to justify unlawful acts by unwarranted legislation if their theory had been true then their prisoners of war were insurrectionists and rebels and guilty of treason and hanging would have been the legitimate punishment why were they not hung not through pity but because the facts contradicted the theory the combinations spoken of were great and powerful states and the danger was that the north would be the greater sufferer by our retaliation 
there was no humane course but to exchange prisoners according to the laws of war with this the government of the united states refused to comply lest it might be construed into an acknowledgment of belligerent rights on our part which would explode their theory of insurrectionary combinations tend to restore more correct views of the rights and powers of the states and expose in its true light their efforts to establish the supreme and unlimited sovereignty of the general government the reader may observe the tenacity with which the authorities at washington and behind them the northern states clung to this theory upon its strict maintenance depended the success of their bloody revolution to secure absolute supremacy over the states upon its failure the dissolution of the union would have been established constitutional liberty would have been vindicated the hopes of mankind in the modern institutions of federation fulfilled and a new union might have been formed and held together with a bond of fraternity and not by the sword as under the above revolutionary theory by the exchange of prisoners nothing was conceded except what was evident to the world that actual war existed and that a christian people should at least conduct it according to the usages of civilized nations but sectional hate and the vain conceit of newly acquired power led to the idle prophecy of our speedy subjection and hence the government of the united states refused to act as required by humanity and the usages of civilized warfare at length moved by the clamors of the relatives and friends of the prisoners we held and by fears of retaliation it covertly submitted to abandon its declared purpose and to shut its eyes while the exchanges were made by various commanders under flags of truce thus some were exchanged in new york washington cairo and columbus kentucky and by general mcclellan in western virginia and elsewhere on the whole the partial exchanges were inconsiderable and inconclusive as to the main question the condition at the close of the year eighteen sixty one summarily stated was that soldiers captured in battle were not protected by the usage of exchange and citizens were arrested without due process of law deported to distant states and incarcerated without assigned cause all this by persons acting under authority of the united states government but in disregard of the united states constitution which provides that quote, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or an indictment of a grand jury nor be deprived of life liberty or property without due process of law end quote. Quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons houses papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated end quote. these provisions were of no avail to protect the citizens from the outrages because those who derived their authority from the constitution used that authority to violate its guarantees it has been stated that the rule upon which the united states government was conducting affairs was entirely revolutionary its efforts to clothe the government of the Union with absolute power involved the destruction of the rights of the states and the subversion of the Constitution. Hence, on every occasion the provisions of the Constitution afforded no protection to the citizens. Their rights were spurned, their persons were seized and imprisoned beyond the reach of friends, their houses sacked and burned. If they pleaded the Constitution, the government of the Constitution was deaf to them, unsheathed its sword, and said the union was at stake and the constitution which was the compact of union must stand aside this was indeed a revolution a constitutional government of limited powers derived from the people was transformed into a military despotism the northern people were docile as sheep under the change reminding one of the words of the psalmist all we like sheep have gone astray posterity may ask with amazement what cause could there have been for such acts by a government that was ordained quote, to form a more perfect union establish justice ensure domestic tranquillity provide for the common defense promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity end quote. posterity may further ask where could a government of limited powers constructed only for certain general purposes and on the principle that all power proceeds from the people and that quote, the powers not delegated by the constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people end quote, 
find a grant of power or an authority to perpetrate such injuries upon the states and the people as to the first question it may be said there was no external cause for such acts all foreign nations were at peace with the united states no hostile fleets were hovering on her coasts nor immense foreign armies threatening to invade her territory the cause if any plausible one existed was entirely internal it lay between it and its citizens if it had treated them with injustice and oppression and threatened so to continue it had departed from the objects of its creation and they had the resulting right to dissolve it who was to be the umpire in such a case not the united states government for it was the creature of the states it possessed no inherent original sovereignty the constitution says quote, the powers not delegated to the united states by the constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people end quote. the umpireship is therefore expressly on the side of the states or the people when the state of south carolina through a sovereign convention withdrew from the union she exercised the umpireship which rightly belonged to her and which no other could exercise for her this involved the dissolution of the union and the extinction of the government of the united states so far as she was concerned but the officers of that government instead of justly acquiescing in that which was constitutionally and legally inevitable drew the sword and resolved to maintain by might that which had no longer existence by right a usurpation thus commenced in wrong was the mother of all the usurpations and wrongs which followed the unhallowed attempt to establish the absolute sovereignty of the government of the united states by the subjugation of states and their people brought forth its natural fruit well might the victim of the guillotine exclaim o liberty what crimes are committed in thy name as to the other question where could a government of limited powers find authority to perpetrate such injuries upon its own constituents an answer will be given in succeeding pages up to the close of the year the war enlarged its proportions so as to include new fields until it then extended from the shores of the chesapeake to the confines of missouri and arizona sudden calls from the remotest points for military aid were met with promptness enough not only to avert disaster in the face of superior numbers but also to roll back the tide of invasion on the border at the commencement of the war the enemy were possessed of certain strategic points and strong places within the confederate states they greatly exceeded us in numbers in available resources and in the supplies necessary for war military establishments had been long organized and were complete the navy and the army once common to both were in their possession to meet all this we had to create not only an army in the face of war itself but also military establishments necessary to equip and place it in the field the spirit of the volunteers and the patriotism of the people enabled us under providence to grapple successfully with these difficulties a succession of glorious victories at bethel manassas springfield lexington leesburg and belmont checked the invasion of our soil after seven months of war the enemy had not only failed to extend their occupancy of the soil but new states and territories had been added to our confederacy instead of their threatened march of unchecked conquest the enemy were driven at more than one point to assume the defensive and upon a fair comparison between the two belligerents as to men military means and financial condition the confederate states were relatively much stronger at the end of the year than when the struggle commenced the necessities of the times called into existence new branches of manufactures and gave a fresh impulse to the activity of those previously in operation and we were gradually becoming independent of the rest of the world for the supply of such military stores and munitions as were indispensable for war at an election on november sixth eighteen sixty one the chief executive officers of the provisional government were unanimously chosen to similar positions in the permanent government to be inaugurated on the ensuing twenty second of february eighteen sixty two end of section one section two of the rise and fall of the confederate government volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 16. Military Arrangements of the Enemy. Marshall and Garfield. Fishing Creek. Crittenden's Report. Fort Henry, its surrender. Fort Donelson, its position. Assaults. Surrender. Losses. Important changes in the military arrangements of the enemy were made about this time. Major General George B. McClellan was assigned to the chief command of his army, in place of Lieutenant General Scott, retired. A department of Ohio was constituted, embracing the states of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, and Kentucky, east of the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers, and Brigadier General D.C. Buell was assigned to its command. At the same time, General Henry W. Halleck superseded General John C. Fremont in command of the United States Department of the West. General W.T. Sherman was removed from Kentucky and sent to report to General Halleck. General A.S. Johnston was now confronted by General Halleck in the West and by General Buell in Kentucky. The former, with armies at Cairo and Paducah under Generals Grant and C.F. Smith, threatened equally Columbus, the key of the lower Mississippi River, and the water lines of the Cumberland and the Tennessee, with their defenses at Forts Donelson and Henry. The right wing of General Buell also menaced Donelson and Henry, while his center was directed against Bowling Green, and his left was advancing against General Zollicoffer at Mill Spring, on the upper Cumberland. If the last-named position could be forced, the way seemed open to East Tennessee, by either the Jacksboro or the Jamestown routes, on the one hand, and to Nashville on the other. At the northeastern corner of Kentucky, there was a force under Colonel Garfield of Ohio, opposed to the Confederate force under General Humphrey Marshall. The strength of Marshall's force in effective men was about 1,600. Knowing that a body of the enemy under Colonel Garfield was advancing to meet him, and that a small force was moving to his rear, he fell back some 15 miles and took position on Middle Creek, near Prestonsburg. On January 10, 1862, Garfield attacked him. The firing was kept up, with some intervals, about four hours, and was occasionally very sharp and spirited. Marshall says in his report, quote, The enemy did not move me from any one position I assumed, and at nightfall withdrew from the field, leaving me just where I was in the morning. He came to attack, yet came so cautiously that my left wing never fired a shot and he never came up sufficiently to engage my center or left wing. End quote. Garfield was said to have fallen back 15 miles to Paintsville, and Marshall 7 miles, where he remained two days, then slowly pursued his retreat. He stated his loss at 10 killed and 14 wounded, and that of the enemy to have been severe. The Battle of Fishing Creek has been the subject of harsh criticism, and I think it will be seen by the report herein inserted that great injustice has been done to General George B. Crittenden, who commanded on that occasion. In July 1880, I wrote to him requesting a statement of the affair at Fishing Creek, and a short time before his decease, he complied with my request by writing as follows, quote, In November 1862, I assumed by assignment the command of a portion of East Tennessee and southeastern Kentucky, which embraced the troops stationed at Mill Springs, on the Cumberland River, and under the command of General Zollicoffer, who, as I understood the matter, had been stationed there by General Johnston to prevent the enemy under Schaff and confronting him on the opposite side of the river from crossing and penetrating into Tennessee. Schaff's camp was at Somerset on Fishing Creek, a tributary of the Cumberland, emptying into it a mile above Mill Springs. He was several miles away from the bank of the Cumberland, so that both the river and creek intervened between him and General Zollicoffer. While I was detained in Knoxville, on business connected with my command, I received an official communication from General Zollicoffer informing me that he had crossed the Cumberland by fording and was fortifying a camp on the right bank, etc. By the messenger who bore me this communication, I ordered him to recross the river and resume his original position on the left bank. Early in January, I reached Mill Springs and found, to my surprise, General Zollicoffer still on the right bank. He called on me immediately and informed me that his messenger, who bore back my order, 
had lost several days in returning, and that when it was received he supposed that I would arrive almost immediately, and hoping to be able to convince me that it would be better to remain on the right bank, he had postponed crossing until, by a rise in the river, it had become impossible to do so, that all his artillery and a large portion of his wagons were on the right bank, and his only means of transferring them to the other bank were a small ferry boat and a very small stem wheel steamer, entirely inadequate to the purpose. I was dissatisfied, but, as I knew that the general had been actuated by pure motives, I accepted his excuse. Details were promptly placed in the woods to prepare timber for flatboats to transport the artillery and wagons to the left bank of the river. The weather was execrable, and the men unskilled, so that the work progressed slowly. Such was the posture of affairs when, on the 18th of January, I was informed that General Thomas was approaching with a large force of all arms, and would encamp that night within a few miles of us. Here was thrust upon me the very contingency which my order to General Zollicoffer was intended to obviate. It rained violently throughout this day until late in the afternoon. It occurred to me that Fishing Creek must so rise as to render it impossible for Schaff to connect with Thomas. Acting upon this idea, I summoned a council of superior officers, and laying before them the circumstances of the case, asked their advice. There was not one of them who did not concur with me in the opinion that Thomas must be attacked immediately, and if possible by surprise, that such attack, if successful, merely in repulsing him, would probably give us time to cross the Cumberland with artillery and wagons, by means of our boats then being built. Accordingly, at twelve o'clock in the night, we marched for the position of the enemy, ascertained to be some six miles away. We had scarcely taken up the line of march when the rain began to fall, the darkness became intense, and the consequent confusion great, so that day dawned before we reached his position. The attack, as a surprise, failed. Nevertheless, it was promptly made. It rained violently throughout the action, rendering all the flintlock guns useless. The men bearing them were allowed to fall back on the reserve. The action was progressing successfully when the fall of General Zollicoffer was announced to me. Apprehending disastrous consequences, I hastened to the front. My apprehensions were well founded. I found the line of battle in confusion and falling back, and, after a vain effort to restore the line, yielded to necessity, and, by the interposition of the reserve, covered the shattered line and effected my retreat to camp without loss. I reached camp late in the afternoon. Not long afterward, the enemy opened fire at long range. Night coming on, he ceased to fire. The few shot and shells that fell in the camp so plainly demonstrated the demoralization of the men that I doubted, even if I had had rations, which I had not, whether the camp could have been successfully defended for twenty-four hours. There was not, and had not been for some time in the camp, rations beyond the daily need. This state of affairs was due to the exhaustion of the neighboring country and the impracticability of the roads. It became now my sole object to transfer the men with their arms, the cavalry horses and teams, to the left bank of the river. This was successfully accomplished by dawn of the next day. I attributed the loss of the battle in a great degree to the inferiority of our arms and the untimely fall of General Zollicoffer who was known and highly esteemed by the men, who were almost all Tennesseans. I think I have shown that the Battle of Fishing Creek was a necessity, and that I ought not to be held responsible for that necessity. As to how I managed it, I have nothing further to say. End quote. General Crittenden's gallantry had been too often and too conspicuously shown in battle during the war with Mexico, and on the Indian frontier, to admit of question and the criticism has been directed solely to the propriety of the attack at Fishing Creek. His explanation is conclusive against any arraignment of him for the presence of the troops on the right bank of the Cumberland, or for his not immediately withdrawing them to the left bank when his position was threatened. Under these circumstances, to attack one portion of the enemy, when a junction with the other part could not be effected, was to act in accordance with one of the best settled rules of war. The unforeseen accident of renewed rain, with intense darkness, delayed his march beyond reasonable expectation, 
and whereas the whole force should have reached the enemy's encampment before dawn, the advance of two regiments only reached there after broad daylight. To hesitate would have been to give the enemy time for preparation, and I think it was wisely decided to attack at once and rely upon the rear coming up to support the advance. But the rear, encumbered with their artillery, were so far behind that, though the advance were successful in their first encounter, they did not receive the hoped-for support until they had suffered severely. And then, the long-known and trusted commander of the forces there, the gallant and most estimable Zollicoffer, fell. Whence confusion resulted. General Crittenden had been but a few days with the troops, a disadvantage which will be readily appreciated. Had the whole force been in position at early dawn, so as to have surprised the enemy, the plan would have been executed, and victory would have been the probable result, after which Schaff's force might have been readily disposed of. But had the attack done no more than to check the advance of Thomas until the boats under construction could have been finished, so as to enable Crittenden to save his artillery and equipments, it would have justified the attempt. I therefore think the strategy not only defensible, but commendable, and the affair to be ranked with one of the many brilliant conceptions of the war. The reader will not fail to remark the evidence which General Crittenden's report affords of the fallacy of representing the South as having been prepared by supplying herself with the materiel necessary for war. The heart of even a noble enemy must be moved at the spectacle of citizens defending their homes, with muskets of obsolete patterns and shotguns, against an invader having all the modern improvements in arms. The two regiments constituting the advance were Battles 20th Tennessee and the 15th Mississippi, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel E.C. Walthall. With dauntless courage, they engaged the whole array of the enemy, and drove him from his first position. When at length our forces fell back to their entrenched camp, it was with solemn determination, and the pursuit was so cautious that whenever it ventured too near, it was driven back by our rear guard. The valiant advance, the 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee, bore the burden of the day. The Mississippians lost 220 out of 400 engaged and the Tennesseans lost half as many, this being about three-fourths the casualties in our force. That night, General Crittenden crossed his troops over the river, with the exception of those too badly wounded to travel. He was compelled to leave his artillery and wagons, not having the means of transporting them across, and moved with the remnant of his army toward Nashville. Both by General Crittenden and those who have criticized him for making the attack at Fishing Creek it is assumed that General Zollicoffer made a mistake in crossing to the right bank of the Cumberland, and that thence it resulted as a consequence that General Johnston's right flank of his line through Bowling Green was uncovered. I do not perceive the correctness of the conclusion, for it must be admitted that General Zollicoffer's command was not adequate to resist the combined forces of Thomas and Shove, or that the Cumberland River was a sufficient obstacle to prevent them from crossing either above or below the position at Mill Springs. General Zollicoffer may well have believed that he could better resist the crossing of the Cumberland by removing to the right bank rather than by remaining on the left. The only difference, it seems to me, would have been that he could have retreated without the discomfiture of his force or the loss of his artillery and equipments. But, in either case, Johnston's right flank would have been alike uncovered. To Zollicoffer and the other brave patriots who fell with him, let praise, not censure, be given and to Crittenden, let tardy justice render the meed due to a gallant soldier of the highest professional attainments, and whose fault, if fault it be, was a willingness to dare much in his country's service. When the state of Tennessee seceded, measures were immediately adopted to occupy and fortify all the strong points on the Mississippi, as Memphis, Randolph, Fort Pillow, and Island No. 10. As it was our purpose not to enter the state of Kentucky, and construct defenses for the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers on her territory, they were located within the borders of Tennessee, and as near to the Kentucky line as suitable sites could be found. On these were commenced the construction of Fort Donelson on the west side of the Cumberland, and Fort Henry on the east side of the Tennessee, and about twelve miles apart. The latter stood on the lowlands adjacent to the river, about high water mark, and being just below a bend in the river, and at the head of a straight stretch of two miles, it commanded the river for that distance. 
it was also commanded by high ground on the opposite bank of the river which it was intended should be occupied by our troops in case of a land attack the power of ironclad gunboats against land defenses had not yet been shown and the low position of the fort brought the battery to the water level and secured the advantage of ricochet firing the most effective against wooden ships fort donelson was placed on high ground and with the plunging fire from its batteries was thereby more effective against the ironclads brought to attack it on the water side but on the land side it was not equally strong and required extensive outworks and a considerable force to resist an attack in that quarter in september eighteen sixty one lieutenant dixon of the engineer corps was instructed to make an examination of the works at the two forts he reported that fort henry was nearly completed it was built not at the most favorable position but it was a strong work and instead of abandoning it and building at another place he advised that it should be completed and other works constructed on the highlands just above the fort on the opposite side of the river measures for the accomplishment of this plan were adopted as rapidly as the means at disposal would allow in relation to donelson it was his opinion that although a better position might have been chosen for this fortification on the cumberland under the circumstances surrounding the command it would be better to retain and strengthen the position chosen general polk in a report to general johnston just previous to the battle of shiloh said quote, the principal difficulty in the way of a successful defense of the rivers was the want of an adequate force a force of infantry and a force of experienced artillerists end quote. this was the unavoidable result of the circumstances heretofore related but tells only half of the story to match the vessels of the enemy floating forts we required vessels like theirs or the means of constructing them we had neither the efforts which were put forth to resist the operations on the western rivers for which the united states made such vast preparations were therefore necessarily very limited there was a lack of skilled labor of shipyards and of materials for constructing ironclads which could not be readily obtained or prepared in a beset and blockaded country proposals were considered both for building gunboats and for converting the ordinary side wheel high pressure steamboats into gunboats but the engineer department though anxious to avail itself of this means of defense decided that it was not feasible there was not plate iron with which to armor a single vessel and even railroad iron could not be spared from its uses for transportation unless a fleet could have been built to match the enemies we had to rely on land batteries torpedoes and marching forces it was thought best to concentrate the resources on what seemed practicable one ironclad gunboat however the eastport was undertaken on the tennessee river but under so many difficulties that after the surrender of fort henry while still unfinished it was destroyed lest it should fall to the enemy the fleet of gunboats prepared by the united states for the mississippi and its tributaries consisted of twelve seven of which were ironclad and able to resist all except the heaviest solid shot the boats were built very wide in proportion to their length so that in the smooth river waters they might have almost the steadiness of land batteries when discharging their heavy guns this flotilla carried one hundred and forty three guns some sixty four pounders some thirty two pounders and some seven inch rifled guns carrying eighty pound shells on february second general grant started from cairo with seventeen thousand men on transports commodore foote accompanied him with seven gunboats on the fourth the landing of the troops commenced three miles or more below fort henry general grant took command on the east bank with the main column while general charles f smith with two brigades of some five to six thousand men landed on the left bank with orders to take the earthwork opposite fort henry known as fort hindman on the fifth the landing was completed and the attack was made on the next day the force of general tillman who was in command at fort henry was about thirty four hundred men it is evident that on the fifth he intended to dispute grant's advance by land but on the sixth before the attack by the gunboats he changed his purpose abandoned all hope of a successful defense and made arrangements for the escape of his main body to fort donelson while the guns of fort henry should engage the gunboats he ordered colonel hindman to withdraw the command to fort donelson 
while he himself would obtain the necessary delay for the movement by use of the battery and standing a bombardment in fort henry for this purpose he retained his heavy artillery company seventy-five men to work the guns a number unequal to the strain and labor of the defense noon was the time fixed for the attack but grant impeded by the overflow of water and unwilling to expose his men to the heavy guns of the fort held them back to await the result of the gunboat attack in the meantime the confederate troops were in retreat four ironclads mounting forty-eight heavy guns approached and took position within six hundred yards of the fort firing as they advanced about half a mile behind these came three unarmored gunboats mounting twenty-seven heavy guns which took a more distant position and kept up a bombardment of shells that fell within the works some four hundred of the formidable missiles of the ironclad boats were also thrown into the fort the officers and men inside were not slow to respond and as many as fifty-nine of their shots were counted as striking the gunboats on the ironclad essex a cannonball ranged her whole length another shot passing through the boiler caused an explosion that scalded her commander porter and many of the seamen and soldiers on board five minutes after the fight began the twenty-four pounder rifled gun one of the most formidable in the fort burst disabling every man at the piece then a shell exploded at the muzzle of one of the thirty-two pounders ruining the gun and killing or wounding all the men who served it about the same moment a premature discharge occurred at one of the forty-two pounder guns killing three men and seriously injuring others the ten-inch columbiad the only gun able to match the artillery of the assailants was next rendered useless by a priming wire that was jammed and broken in the vent an heroic blacksmith labored for a long time to remove it under the full fire of the enemy but in vain the men became exhausted and lost confidence and tillman seeing this in person served a thirty-two pounder for some fifteen minutes though but four of his guns were disabled six stood idle for want of artillerists and but two were replying to the enemy after an engagement of two hours and ten minutes he ceased firing and lowered his flag for this soldierly devotion and self-sacrifice the gallant commander and his brave band must be honored while patriotism has an advocate and self-sacrifice for others has a votary our casualties were five killed and sixteen wounded those of the enemy were sixty-three of all kinds Twelve officers and sixty-three non-commissioned officers and privates were surrendered with the fort. The Tennessee River was thus open, and a base by short lines was established against Fort Donelson. The next movement was a combined attack by land and water upon Fort Donelson. This fort was situated on the left bank of the Cumberland, as has been stated, near its great bend, and about forty miles from the mouth of the river. It was about one mile north of the village of Dover where the commissary and quartermaster's supplies were in depot the fort consisted of two water batteries on the hillside protected by a bastioned earthwork of irregular outline on the summit enclosing about one hundred acres the water batteries were admirably placed to sweep the river approaches with an armament of thirteen guns eight thirty-two pounders three thirty-two pound carronade one ten-inch columbiad and one rifled gun of thirty-two pound caliber the field work which was intended for infantry supports occupied a plateau about one hundred feet above the river commanding and protecting the water batteries at close musket range these works afforded a fair defense against gunboats but they were not designed or adapted for resistance to a land attack or investment by an enemy generals pillow and floyd were ordered with their separate commands to fort donelson general buckner also was sent with a division from bowling green so that the Confederate effective force at the fort during the siege was between 14,500 and 15,000 men. The force of General Grant was not less than thirty to 35,000 men. On February 12th, he commenced his movement across from Fort Henry, and the investment of Donelson was made without any serious opposition. On the 13th, General Buckner reports that, quote, the fire of the enemy's artillery and riflemen was incessant throughout the day but was responded to by a well-directed fire from the entrenchments which inflicted upon the assailant a considerable loss and almost silenced his fire late in the afternoon quote. 
The object of the enemy undoubtedly was to discover the strength and position of our forces. The artillery fire was continued at intervals during the night. Nearly every Confederate regiment reported a few casualties from the shot and shell which frequently fell inside of the works. Meanwhile, a gunboat of thirteen guns arrived in the morning and, taking a position behind a headland, fired 138 shots, when our 128-pound shot crashed through one of her ports, injuring her machinery and crippling her. The enemy's fire did no damage to the fort itself, but a shot disabled a gun and killed Captain Dixon, a valuable engineer, whose loss was greatly deplored. The weather became cold during the night, and a driving snowstorm prevailed, so that some of the soldiers were frozen, and the wounded between the lines suffered extremely. The fleet of gunboats under Commodore Foote arrived, bringing enforcements to the enemy. These were landed during the night and the next day, which was occupied with placing them in position. Nevertheless, though no assault was made, a rambling and ineffective fire was kept up. About 3 p.m., the commander of the naval force, expecting an easy victory, like that at Fort Henry, brought his four ironclads, followed by two gunboats, up to the attack. Each of the ironclads mounted thirteen guns and the gunboats nine. Any one of them was more than a match for the guns of the fort. Their guns were eight, nine, and ten inch, three in the bow of each. Our columbiad and the rifle gun were the only two pieces effective against the ironclads. The enemy moved directly toward the water batteries, firing with great weight of metal. It was the intention of Commodore Foote to silence these batteries, pass by, and take a position where he could enfilade the fort with broadsides. The gunboats opened at a mile and a half distance, and advanced until within three or four hundred yards. The shot and shell of the fleet tore up the earthworks, but did no further injury. But the Confederate guns, aimed from an elevation of not less than thirty feet, by cool and courageous hands, sent their shot with destructive power, and overcame all the enemy's advantages in number and weight of guns. The bolts of our two heavy guns went crashing through iron and massive timbers with resistless force, scattering slaughter and destruction through the fleet. Hoppen, in his Life of Commodore Foote, says, quote, The Louisville was disabled by a shot, which cut away her rudder chains, making her totally unmanageable so that she drifted with the current out of action. Very soon the St. Louis was disabled by a shot through her pilot house, rendering her steering impossible, so that she also floated down the river. The other two armored vessels were also terribly struck, and a rifled cannon on the carondelet burst, so that these two could no longer sustain the action, and after fighting for more than an hour, the little fleet was forced to withdraw. The St. Louis was struck fifty-nine times the Louisville 36 times, the Carondelet 26, the Pittsburgh 20, the four vessels receiving no less than 141 wounds. The fleet, gathering itself together and rendering mutual help to its disabled members, proceeded to Cairo to repair damages. End quote. The loss of the enemy was 54 killed and wounded. The report of Major Gilmer, who laid out these works, says, quote, Our batteries were uninjured, and not a man in them killed. The repulse of the gunboats closed the operations of the day, except a few scattering shots along the land defenses. End quote. In consequence of reinforcements to the enemy, the plan of operations for the next day was determined by the Confederate generals about midnight. The whole of the left wing of the army, except eight regiments, was to move out of the trenches, attack, turn, and drive the enemy's right until the wind's ferry road which led to Charlotte through a good country, was cleared, and an exit thus secured. The troops, moving in the small hours of the night over the icy and broken roads, which wound through the obstructed area of defense, made slow progress, and delayed the projected operations. At 4 a.m. on the 15th, Pillow's troops were ready, except one brigade which came late into action. By 6 o'clock, Baldwin's brigade was engaged with the enemy, only two or three hundred yards from his lines and the bloody contest of the day had begun. At one o'clock, the enemy's right was doubled back. The Winds Ferry Road was cleared, and it only remained for the Confederates to do one of two things. The first was to seize the golden moment, and, adhering to the original purpose and plan of the sortie, move off rapidly by the route laid open by such strenuous efforts 
and so much bloodshed. The other depended on the inspiration of a mastermind, equal to the effort of grasping every element of the combat, and which should complete the partial victory by the utter rout and destruction of the enemy. Quote, While one or the other alternative seems to have been the only possible safe solution, end quote, says the author of The Life of General Albert Sidney Johnston, quote, the Confederate commander tried neither. A fatal middle policy was suddenly but dubiously adopted, and not carried out. The spirit of vacillation and divided counsels prevented that unity of action which is essential to success. For seven hours the Confederate battalions had been pushing over rough ground and through thick timber, at each step meeting fresh troops massed, where the discomfited regiments rallied. Hence the vigor of assault slackened though the wearied troops were still ready and competent to continue their onward movement. Ten fresh regiments, over 3,000 men, had not fired a musket. But in the turmoil of battle, no one knew the relations of any command to the next, or indeed whether his neighbor was friend or foe. General Buckner had halted, according to the preconcerted plan, to allow the army to pass out by the opened road and to cover their retreat. At this point of the fight, Pillow, finding himself at Hindman's position, heard of or saw preparations by General C. F. Smith for an assault on the Confederate right. But whether he understood this to be the purpose or construed the movement as the signs of a flight was left uncertain by his language at the time. He ordered the regiments which had been engaged to return to the trenches and instructed Buckner to hasten to defend the imperiled point. Buckner, not recognizing him as a superior authorized to change the plan of battle or the propriety of such change, refused to obey, and after receiving reiterated orders, started to find Floyd, who at that moment joined him. He urged upon Floyd the necessity of carrying out the original plan of evacuation. Floyd assented to this view and told Buckner to stand fast until he could see Pillow. He then rode back and saw Pillow and, hearing his arguments, yielded to them. Floyd simply says that he found the movement so nearly executed that it was necessary to complete it. Accordingly, Buckner was recalled. In the meantime, Pillow's right brigades were retiring to their places in the trenches, under orders from the commanders. End quote. The conflict on the left soon ended. Three hundred prisoners, five thousand stand of small arms, six guns, and other spoils of victory had been won by our forces. But the enemy, cautiously advancing, gradually recovered most of his lost ground. It was about 4 p.m. when the assault on the right was made by General C. F. Smith. The enemy succeeded in carrying the advanced work, which General Buckner considered the key to his position. The loss of the enemy during the siege was 400 killed, 1,785 wounded, and 300 prisoners. Our losses were about 325 killed and 1,097 wounded including missing, it was estimated at 1,500. After nightfall, a consultation of the commanding officers was held, and, after a consideration of the question in all its aspects as to what should be done, it was decided that a surrender was inevitable, and that to accomplish its objects it must be made before the assault, which was expected at daylight. General Buckner, in his report, says, quote, I regarded the position of the army as desperate, and, that the attempt to extricate it by another battle, in the suffering and exhausted condition of the troops, was almost hopeless. The troops had been worn down with watching, with labor, with fighting. Many of them were frosted by the cold. All of them were suffering and exhausted by their incessant labors. There had been no regular issue of rations for several days, and scarcely any means of cooking. The ammunition was nearly expended, we were completely invested by a force fully four times the strength of our own. End quote. The decision to surrender having been made, it remained to determine by whom it should be made. Generals Floyd and Pillow declared they would not surrender and become prisoners. The duty was therefore allotted to General Buckner. Floyd said, quote, General Buckner, if I place you in command, will you allow me to draw out my brigade? End quote. General Buckner replied, quote, Yes, provided you do so before the enemy act upon my communication. End quote. Floyd said, quote, General Pillow, I turn over the command. End quote. 
General Pillow, regarding this as a mere technical form by which the command was to be conveyed to Buckner, then said, quote, I pass it, end quote. Buckner assumed the command, sent for a bugler to sound the parley for pen, ink, and paper, and opened the negotiations for surrender. There were but two roads by which it was possible for the garrison to retire. If they went by the upper road, they would certainly have to cut through the main body of the enemy. If by the lower road, they would have to wade through water three feet deep. This, the medical director stated, would be death to more than one-half the command, on account of the severity of the weather and their physical prostration. To cut through the enemy, if affected, would, it was supposed, involved the loss of three-fourths of the command, a sacrifice which, it was conceded, would not be justifiable. The enemy had, in the conflict of the preceding day, gained possession of our rifle pits on the right flank, and General Buckner, an experienced soldier, held that the fort would immediately fall when the enemy attacked in the morning. General Pillow dissented from this conclusion, believing that the fort could be defended until boats could be obtained to convey the garrison across the river, and also advocated an attempt to cut through the investing lines of the enemy. Being overruled on both points, he announced his determination to leave the post by any means available, so as to escape a surrender, and he advised Colonel N. B. Forrest, who was present, to go out with his cavalry regiment and any others he could take with him through the overflow. General Floyd's brigade consisted of two Virginia regiments and one Mississippi regiment. These, as before mentioned, it was agreed that General Floyd might withdraw before the surrender. Two of the field officers, Colonel Russell and Major Brown, of the Mississippi Regiment, the 20th, had been officers of the 1st Mississippi Riflemen in the war with Mexico, and the 20th, their present regiment, was reputed to be well instructed and under good discipline. This regiment was left to be surrendered with the rest of the garrison, under peculiar circumstances, of which Major Brown, then commanding, gives the following narrative. Quote, About twelve o'clock of the night previous to the surrender, I received an order to report in person at headquarters. On arriving, I met Colonel N. B. Forrest, who remarked, I have been looking for you. They are going to surrender this place, and I wanted you with your command to go out with me. But they have other orders for you. On entering the room, Generals Floyd and Pillow also informed me of the proposed proceedings. General Floyd ordered me to take possession of the steamboat landing with my command, that he had reserved the right to remove his brigade, that, after having guarded the landing, my command should be taken aboard the boat, the Virginia regiments, first crossing to the other side of the river, could make their way to Clarksville. I proceeded at once with my command to the landing. There was no steamboat there, but I placed my regiment in a semicircular line so as to cover the landing place. About daylight, the steamer came down, landed, and was soon loaded with the two Virginia regiments, they passing through my ranks. At the same time, the general and staff, or persons claiming to belong to the staff, passed aboard. The boat, being a small one, was considerably crowded. While the staging of the boat was being drawn aboard, General Floyd hallooed to me, from the hurricane roof, that he would cross the river with the troops aboard and return for my regiment. But about the time of the departure of the boat, General S. B. Buckner came and asserted that he had turned over the garrison and all the property at sunrise, that if the boat was not away immediately, he would be charged by the enemy with violating the terms of the surrender. I mention this incident as furnishing, I suppose, the reason why my regiment was left on the bank of the river. Sorrowfully, I gave the necessary orders to stack arms and surrender. Both morally and materially, the disaster was a severe blow to us. Many, wise after the event, have shown their skill in telling what all knew afterward, but nobody told before. End, quote. End of section two. Section 3 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 17. 
Results of the surrender of Forts Henry and Donelson. Retreat from Bowling Green. Criticism on General A. S. Johnston. Change of plan necessary. Evacuation of Nashville. Generals Floyd and Pillow. My letter to General Johnston. His reply. My answer. Defense of General Johnston. Battle of Elkhorn. Topography of Shiloh. The loss of Forts Henry and Donelson opened the river routes to Nashville and North Alabama, and thus turned the positions both at Bowling Green and Columbus. These disasters subjected General Johnston to very severe criticism, of which we shall take notice further on in these pages. A conference was held on February 7th by Generals Johnston, Beauregard, who had been previously ordered to report to Johnston, and Hardy, as to the future plan of campaign. It was determined, as Fort Henry had fallen and Donelson was untenable, that preparation should at once be made for a removal of the army to Nashville, in rear of the Cumberland River, a strong point some miles below that city being fortified forthwith to defend the river from the passage of gunboats and transports. From Nashville, should any further retrograde movement become necessary, it would be made to Stevenson, and thence according to circumstances. As the possession of the Tennessee River by the enemy separated the array at Bowling Green from the one at Columbus, Kentucky, they must act independently of each other until they could be brought together, the first one having for its object the defense of the state of Tennessee along its line of operation, and the other of that part of the state lying between the Tennessee River and the Mississippi. But as the possession of the former river by the enemy rendered the lines of communication of the army at Columbus liable to be cut at any time by a movement from the Tennessee River as a base, and an overpowering force of the enemy was rapidly concentrating from various points on the Ohio, it was necessary, to prevent such a calamity, that the main body of the army should fall back to Humboldt, and thence, if necessary, to Grand Junction so as to protect Memphis from either point and still have a line of retreat to the latter place, or to Grenada, and, if needful, to Jackson, Mississippi. Captain Hollins's fleet of improvised gunboats and a sufficient garrison was to be left at Columbus for the defense of the river at that point, with transports near at hand for the removal of a garrison when the position became no longer tenable. Every preparation for the retreat was silently made. The defenses of Bowling Green, originally slight, had been greatly enlarged by the addition of a cordon of detached forts, mounted with heavy field guns. Yet the garrison was only sufficiently strong to withstand an assault, and it was never proposed to submit to a siege. The ordnance and army supplies were quietly moved southward, and measures were taken to remove from Nashville the immense stores accumulated there. Only five hundred men were in the hospital before the army commenced to retreat but when it reached Nashville, 5,400 out of 14,000 required the care of the medical officers. On February 11th, the troops began to move, and at nightfall on the 16th, General Johnston, who had established his headquarters at Edgeville, on the northern bank of the Cumberland, saw the last of his wearied columns defile across and safely establish themselves beyond the river. The evacuation was accomplished by a force so small as to make the feat remarkable not a pound of ammunition nor a gun being lost, and the provisions were nearly all secured. The first intimation which the enemy had of the intended evacuation, so far as has been ascertained, was when Generals Hindman and Breckinridge, who were in advance near his camp, were seen suddenly to retreat toward Bowling Green. The enemy pursued and succeeded in shelling the town, while Hindman was still covering the rear. Not a man was lost. At the same time, Crittenden's command was brought back within ten miles of Nashville, and thence to Murfreesboro. Scarcely had the retreat to Nashville been accomplished when the news of the fall of Donelson was received. The state of feeling which it produced is described by Colonel Munford, an aide-de-camp of General Johnston, in an address delivered in Memphis. Quote, Dissatisfaction was general. Its mutterings already heard began to break out in denunciations. The demagogues took up the cry and hounded on one another and the people in hunting down a victim. The public press was loaded with abuse. The government was denounced for entrusting the public safety to hands so feeble. The lower house of Congress appointed a select committee to inquire into the conduct of the war in the Western Department. The senators and representatives from Tennessee, with the exception of Judge Swan, waited upon the president. Quote. Their spokesman, Senator G. A. Henry, 
stated that they came for and in behalf of Tennessee to ask for the removal of General A. S. Johnston and the assignment of a competent officer to the defense of their homes and people. It was further stated that they did not come to recommend any one as a successor, that it was conceded that the President was better able than they were to select a proper officer, and they only asked that he would give them a general. Painfully impressed by this exhibition of distrust toward an officer whose place, if vacated, I was sure could not be filled by his equal, realizing how necessary public confidence was to success, and wounded by the injustice done to one I had known with close intimacy in peace and in war, and believed to be one of the noblest men with whom I had ever been associated, and one of the ablest soldiers I had ever seen in the field, I paused under conflicting emotions, and, after a time, merely answered, If Sidney Johnston is not a general, the Confederacy has none to give you. On February 17th, the rear guard from Bowling Green reached Nashville, and on the 18th, General Johnston wrote to the Secretary of War at Richmond, saying, quote, I have ordered the army to encamp tonight midway between Nashville and Murfreesboro. My purpose is to place the force in such a position that the enemy cannot concentrate his superior strength against the command, and to enable me to assemble as rapidly as possible such other troops in addition as it may be in my power to collect. The complete command which their gunboats and transports give them upon the Tennessee and Cumberland renders it necessary for me to retire my line between the rivers. I entertain the hope that this disposition will enable me to hold the enemy for the present in check, and when my forces are sufficiently increased, to drive him back. End quote. The fall of Fort Donelson made a speedy change of his plans necessary. General Johnston was now compelled to withdraw his forces from the north bank of the Cumberland and to abandon the defense of Nashville. In a word, to evacuate Nashville or sacrifice the army. Not more than 11,000 effective men were left to him with which to oppose General Buell, with not less than 40,000 men moving by Bowling Green, while another superior force under General Thomas was on the eastern flank, and the armies from Fort Donelson with the gunboats and transport had it in their power to ascend the Cumberland so as to interrupt all communication with the South. On February 17th and 18th, the main body of the command was moved from Nashville to Murfreesboro, while a brigade remained under General Floyd to bring on the stores and property upon the approach of the enemy, all of which would have been saved except for the heavy and general rains. By the junction of the command of General Crittenden and the fugitives from Donelson, who were reorganized, the force of General Johnston was increased to 17,000 men. The stores not required for immediate use were ordered to Chattanooga, and those which were necessary on the march were ordered to Huntsville and Decatur. On February 28th, the march was commenced for Decatur through Shelbyville and Fayetteville. Halting at those points for the purpose, he saved his provisions and stores, removed his depots and machine shops, obtained new arms, and finally, at the close of March, joined Beauregard at Corinth with 20,000 men, making their aggregate force 50,000. Considering the great advantage which the means of transportation upon the Tennessee and Cumberland afforded the enemy, and the peculiar topography of the state, General Johnston found that he could not, with the force under his command, successfully defend the whole line against the advance of the enemy. He was, therefore, compelled to elect whether the enemy should be permitted to occupy Middle Tennessee, or turn Columbus, take Memphis, and open the valley of the Mississippi. Deciding that the defense of the valley was of paramount importance, he therefore crossed the Tennessee and united with Beauregard. The evacuation of Nashville and the evident intention of General Johnston to retreat still further created a panic in the public mind which spread over the whole state. Those who had refused to listen to his warning voice when it called them to arms were loudest in their passionate outcry at what they considered a base surrender of them to the mercies of the invader. He was accused of imbecility, cowardice, and treason. An appeal from every class was made to the president demanding his removal. Congress took the matter in hand, and though the feeling there resulted merely in a committee of inquiry, it was evident that the case was prejudged. The Confederate House of Representatives created a special committee to inquire into the military disasters at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson and the surrender of Nashville to the enemy, and as to the conduct, number, and disposition of the troops under General Johnston. Great feeling was shown in the debates. 
Generals Floyd and Pillow, the senior officers at Fort Donelson, after it had been decided to surrender, withdrew to avoid being made prisoners. The Secretary of War, Mr. Benjamin, wrote, March 11th, to General Johnston as follows, quote, The reports of Brigadier Generals Floyd and Pillow are unsatisfactory, and the President directs that both these generals be relieved from command until further orders. In the meantime, you will request them to add to their reports such statements as they may deem proper on the points submitted. You are further requested to make up a report from all the sources of information accessible to you of all the particulars connected with the unfortunate affair, which can contribute to enlighten the judgment of the Executive and of Congress, and to fix the blame, if blame there be, on those who were delinquent in duty." End quote. This state of affairs, under the command of General Johnston, was the occasion of the following correspondence. Letter from President Davis to General A. S. Johnston. Quote, Richmond, March 12, 1862. My dear General, The departure of Captain Wycliffe offers an opportunity, of which I avail myself, to write you an unofficial letter. We have suffered great anxiety because of recent events in Kentucky and Tennessee and I have been not a little disturbed by the repetitions of reflections upon yourself. I expected you to have made a full report of events precedent and consequent to the fall of Fort Donelson. In the meantime, I made for you such defense as friendship prompted, and many years of acquaintance justified. But I needed facts to rebut the wholesale assertions made against you, to cover others, and to condemn my administration. The public, as you are aware, have no correct measure for military operations, and the journals are very reckless in their statements. Your force has been magnified, and the movements of an army have been measured by the capacity for locomotion of an individual. The readiness of the people, among whom you are operating, to aid you in every method, has been constantly asserted, the purpose of your army at Bowling Green wholly misunderstood, and the absence of an effective force at Nashville ignored. You have been held responsible for the fall of Donelson and the capture of Nashville. It is charged that no effort was made to save the stores at Nashville, and that the panic of the people was caused by the army. Such representations, with the sad forebodings naturally belonging to them, have been painful to me and injurious to us both. But worse than this, they have undermined public confidence and damaged our cause. A full development of the truth is necessary for future success. I respect the generosity which has kept you silent, but would impress upon you that the question is not personal, but public in its nature, that you and I might be content to suffer, but neither of us can willingly permit detriment to the country. As soon as circumstances will permit, it is my purpose to visit the field of your present operations, not that I shall expect to give you any aid in the discharge of your duties as a commander, but with the hope that my position would enable me to effect something in bringing men to your standard. With a sufficient force, the audacity which the enemy exhibits would no doubt give you the opportunity to cut some of his lines of communication, to break up his plan of campaign, and, defeating some of his columns, to drive him from the soil, as well of Kentucky as of Tennessee. We are deficient in arms, wanting in discipline, and inferior in numbers. Private arms must supply the first want, time, and the presence of an enemy, with diligence on the part of commanders, will remove the second, and public confidence will overcome the third. General Bragg brings you disciplined troops, and you will find him in the highest administrative capacity. General E. K. Smith will soon have in East Tennessee a sufficient force to create a strong diversion in your favor, or, if his strength cannot be made available in that way, you will best know how to employ it otherwise. I suppose the Tennessee or the Mississippi River will be the object of the enemy's next campaign, and I trust you will be able to concentrate a force which will defeat either attempt. The fleet which you will soon have on the Mississippi River, if the enemy's gunboats ascend the Tennessee, may enable you to strike an effective blow at Cairo. But, to one so well informed and vigilant, I will not assume to offer suggestions as to when and how the ends you seek may be attained. With the confidence and regard of many years, I am very truly your friend, Jefferson Davis. End quote. Letter of General Johnston in answer to that above. Quote, Decatur, Alabama, March 18, 1862. My dear General, I received the dispatches from Richmond, 
with your private letter by Captain Wycliffe three days since. But the pressure of affairs and the necessity of getting my command across the Tennessee prevented me from sending you an earlier reply. I anticipated all that you have told me as to the censure which the fall of Fort Donelson drew upon me, and the attacks to which you might be subjected. But it was impossible for me to gather the facts for a detailed report, or to spare time, which was required to extricate the remainder of my troops and save the large accumulation of stores and provisions after that disheartening disaster. I transmitted the reports of Generals Floyd and Pillow without examining or analyzing the facts and scarcely with time to read them. When about to assume command of this department, the government charged me with the duty of deciding the question of occupying Bowling Green, Kentucky, which involved not only military but political considerations. At the time of my arrival at Nashville, the action of the legislature of Kentucky had put an end to the latter by sanctioning the formation of camps menacing Tennessee, by assuming the cause of the government at Washington, and by abandoning the neutrality it professed and in consequence of their action the occupation of bowling green became necessary as an act of self-defense at least in the first step about the middle of september general buckner advanced with a small force of about four thousand men which was increased by the fifteenth of october to twelve thousand and though accessions of force were received it continued at about the same strength until the end of november measles and other diseases keeping down the effective force the enemy's force then was reported to the War Department at 50,000, and an advance was impossible. No enthusiasm, as we imagined and hoped, but hostility, was manifested in Kentucky. Believing it to be of the greatest moment to protract the campaign, as the dearth of cotton might bring strength from abroad and discourage the North, and to gain time to strengthen myself by new troops from Tennessee and other states, I magnified my forces to the enemy but made known my true strength to the department and the governors of states. The aid given was small. At length, when General Beauregard came out in February, he expressed his surprise at the smallness of my force, and was impressed with the danger of my position. I admitted what was so manifest, and laid before him my views for the future, in which he entirely concurred, and sent me a memorandum of our conference, a copy of which I send to you. I determined to fight for Nashville at Donelson, and gave the best part of my army to do it, retaining only 14,000 men to cover my front, and giving 16,000 to defend Donelson. The force at Donelson is stated in General Pillow's report at much less, and I do not doubt the correctness of his statement, for the force at Bowling Green, which I suppose to be 14,000 effective men, the medical report showing only a little over 500 sick in the hospital, was diminished more than five thousand by those who were unable to stand the fatigue of a march and made my force on reaching nashville less than ten thousand men i enclose medical director's report had i wholly uncovered my front to defend donelson buell would have known it and marched directly on nashville there were only ten small steamers in the cumberland in imperfect condition only three of which were available at nashville while the transportation of the enemy was great. The evacuation of Bowling Green was imperatively necessary, and was ordered before and executed while the battle was being fought at Donelson. I had made every disposition for the defense of the fort my means allowed, and the troops were among the best of my forces. The generals Floyd, Pillow, and Buckner were high in the opinion of officers and men for skill and courage, and among the best officers of my command. They were popular with the volunteers, and all had seen much service. No reinforcements were asked. I awaited the event opposite Nashville. The result of the conflict each day was favorable. At midnight on the 15th, I received news of a glorious victory. At dawn of a defeat. My column during the day and night was thrown over the river. A battery had been established below the city to secure the passage. Nashville was incapable of defense from its position, and from the forces advancing from Bowling Green and up the Cumberland. A rear guard was left, under General Floyd, to secure the stores and provisions, but did not completely affect the object. The people were terrified, and some of the troops were disheartened. The discouragement was spreading, and I ordered the command to Murfreesboro, where I managed, 
by assembling Crittenden's division and the fugitives from Donelson to collect an army able to offer battle. The weather was inclement, the floods excessive, and the bridges were washed away, but most of the stores and provisions were saved and conveyed to new depots. This having been accomplished, though with serious loss, in conformity with my original design, I marched southward and crossed the Tennessee at this point, so as to cooperate or unite with General Beauregard for the defense of the valley of the Mississippi. The passage is almost completed, and the head of my column is already with General Bragg at Corinth. The movement was deemed too hazardous by the most experienced members of my staff, but the object warranted the risk. The difficulty of effecting a junction is not wholly overcome, but it approaches completion. Day after tomorrow, the 22nd, unless the enemy intercepts me, my force will be with Bragg, and my army nearly 50,000 strong. This must be destroyed before the enemy can attain his object. I have given this sketch so that you may appreciate the embarrassment which surrounded me in my attempts to avert or remedy the disaster of Fort Donelson, before alluding to the conduct of the generals. When the force was detached, I was in hopes that such disposition would have been made as would have enabled the forces to defend the fort or withdraw without sacrificing the army. On the 14th, I ordered General Floyd, by telegraph, if he lost the fort, to get his troops to Nashville. It is possible that might have been done, but justice requires us to look at events as they appeared at the time, and not alone by the light of subsequent information. All the facts in relation to the surrender will be transmitted to the Secretary of War as soon as they can be collected, in obedience to his order. It appears from the information received that General Buckner, being the junior officer, took the lead in advising the surrender, and that General Floyd acquiesced, and that they all concurred in the belief that their force could not maintain the position. All concurred that it would involve a great sacrifice of life to extricate the command. Subsequent events show that the investment was not so complete as their information from their scouts led them to believe. The conference resulted in the surrender. The command was irregularly transferred and devolved on the junior level, but not apparently to avoid any just responsibility or from any want of personal or moral intrepidity. The blow was most disastrous, and almost without a remedy. I, therefore, in my first report, remained silent. This silence you were kind enough to attribute to my generosity. I will not lay claim to the motive to excuse my course. I observed silence as it seemed to be the best way to serve the cause and the country. The facts were not fully known, discontent prevailed, and criticism and condemnation were more likely to augment than to cure the evil. I refrained, well knowing that heavy censures would fall upon me, but convinced that it was better to endure them for the present and defer for a more propitious time an investigation of the conduct of the generals, for, in the meantime, their services were required, and their influence was useful. For these reasons, Generals Floyd and Pillow were assigned to duty, for I still felt confidence in their gallantry, their energy, and their devotion to the Confederacy. I have thus recurred to the motives by which I have been governed, from a deep personal sense of the friendship and confidence you have always shown me, and from the conviction that they have not been withdrawn from me in adversity. All the reports requisite for a full official investigation have been ordered. Generals Floyd and Pillow have been suspended from command. You mentioned that you intend to visit the field of operations here. I hope soon to see you, for your presence would encourage my troops, inspire the people, and augment the army. To me personally, it would give the greatest gratification. Merely a soldier myself, and having no acquaintance with the statesmen or leaders of the South, I cannot touch springs familiar to you. Were you to assume command, it would afford me the most unfeigned pleasure, and every energy would be exerted to help you to victory and the country to independence. Were you to decline, still, your presence alone would be of inestimable advantage. The enemy are now at Nashville, about 50,000 strong, advancing in this direction by Columbia. He has also forces, according to the report of General Bragg, landing at Pittsburgh, from twenty-five to fifty thousand, and moving in the direction of Purdy. This Army Corps, moving to join Bragg, is about twenty thousand strong. Two brigades, Hindman's and Woods's, 
are, I suppose, at Corinth. One regiment of Hardy's division, Lieutenant Colonel Patton commanding, is moving by cars today, March 20th, and Statham's brigade, Crittenden's division. The brigade will halt at Iuka, the regiment at Burnsville. Cleburne's brigade, Hardy's division, except the regiment at Burnsville, and Carroll's brigade, Crittenden's division, and Helm's cavalry at Tuscumbia, Bowen's brigade at Cortland, Breckenridge's brigade here, the regiments of cavalry of Adams and Wharton on the opposite bank of the river, Scott's Louisiana regiment at Pulaski sending forward supplies, Morgan's cavalry at Shelbyville ordered on. Tomorrow Breckenridge's brigade will go to Corinth, then Bowen's. When these pass Tuscumbia and Iuka, transportation will be ready there for the other troops to follow immediately from those points, and, if necessary, from Burnsville. The cavalry will cross and move forward as soon as their trains can be passed over the railroad bridge. I have troubled you with these details, as I cannot properly communicate them by telegram. The test of merit in my profession with the people is success. It is a hard rule, but I think it right. If I join this corps to the forces of Beauregard, I confess a hazardous experiment, then those who are now declaiming against me will be without an argument. Your friend, A. S. Johnston. End quote. To this letter, the following reply was made. Quote, Richmond, Virginia, March 26, 1862. My dear General, Yours of the 18th instant was this day delivered by your aide, Mr. Jack. I have read it with much satisfaction. So far as the past is concerned, it but confirms the conclusions at which I had already arrived. My confidence in you has never wavered, and I hope the public will soon give me credit for judgment rather than continue to arraign me for obstinacy. You have done wonderfully well, and now I breathe easier in the assurance that you will be able to make a junction of your two armies. If you can meet the division of the enemy moving from the Tennessee, before it can make a junction with that advancing from Nashville, the future will be brighter. If this cannot be done, our only hope is that the people of the Southwest will rally, en masse, with their private arms, and thus enable you to oppose the vast army which will threaten the destruction of our country. I have hoped to be able to leave here for a short time, and would be much gratified to confer with you and share your responsibilities. I might aid you in obtaining troops. No one could hope to do more unless he underrated your military capacity. I write in great haste, and feel that it would be worse than useless to point out to you how much depends on you. May God bless you, is the sincere prayer of your friend, Jefferson Davis. End quote. Let us now review the events which had brought such unmeasured censure on General Johnston for some months preceding this correspondence. We have seen him, with a force numerically much inferior to that of the enemy in his front, holding the position of Bowling Green, and, by active operations of detached commands, keeping up to foe and friend the impression that he had a large army in position. With self-sacrificing fortitude, he remained silent under reproaches for not advancing to attack the enemy. When Forts Donelson and Henry were more immediately threatened, he gave reinforcements from his small command until his own line became more like one of skirmishers than an entrenched line of battle. And when those forts were surrendered, and his position became both untenable and useless, he withdrew in such order and with such skill that his retreat was unmolested by the enemy. Though he continued to be the subject of unreasoning vituperation, he sought not to justify himself by blaming others or telling what he would have done if his government had sent him the arms and munitions he asked for, but which his government, he learned, did not possess. There are yet those who, self-assured, demand why Johnston did not go himself to Donelson and Henry, and why his forces were not there concentrated. A slight inspection of the map would suffice to show that, Bowling Green abandoned, the direct road to Nashville would be open to the advance of Buell's army then the forts, if held, would cease to answer their purpose, and, being isolated, and also between hostile armies above and below, would be not only valueless, but only temporarily tenable. And of his critics, it may be asked, who else than himself could, with the small force retained at Bowling Green, have held the enemy in check so long, and at last have retired without disaster? 
to collect the widely separated troops of his command so as to form an army which might offer battle to the invading foe was a problem which must have been impossible if the organized armies by which he was threatened had been guided by a capacity equal to his own it was done and with the genius of a great soldier he seized the opportunity by the rapid combination of new levies and of forces never before united to attack the armies of the enemy in detail while they were endeavoring to form a junction the southwestern states presented a field peculiarly favorable for the application of a new power in war deep rivers with banks frequently but little elevated above the water traverse the country on these rivers iron-plated steamboats with heavy guns may move with a rapidity incomparably greater than that of marching armies it is as if forts with armaments garrison and stores were endowed with locomotion more swift and enduring than that of cavalry the ohio mississippi cumberland and tennessee rivers all were in the field of general johnston's operations and at the stage of water most suited to naval purposes apart from the heavy guns which could thus be brought to bear at interior places upon an army having only field artillery the advantage of rapid transportation for troops and supplies can hardly be overestimated it has been seen how these advantages were utilized by the enemy at henry and donelson and not less did they avail him at shiloh as has been elsewhere explained the condition of the south did not enable the confederacy to meet the enemy on the water except at great odds if it be asked why did not general johnston wait until the enemy marched on the river instead of attacking him at shiloh or pittsburgh landing the answer is that would have been to delay until the junction of the enemy's armies had been effected to fight them in detail it was necessary to attack the first where it lay backed by its gunboats that sound judgment and soldierly daring went hand in hand in this attack the sequel demonstrated meantime some active operations had taken place in that part of general johnston's command west of the mississippi river detached conflicts with the enemy had been fought by the small forces under generals price and mccullough but no definite result had followed general earl van dorn had been subsequently assigned to the command and assumed it on january twenty ninth eighteen sixty two general curtis was then in command of the enemy's forces numbering about twelve thousand men he had harassed general price on his retreat to fayetteville arkansas and then had fallen back to sugar creek where he proposed to make a stand van dorn immediately on his arrival at the confederate camps on boston mountain prepared to attack curtis his first movement however was to intercept general siegel then at bentonville with sixteen thousand men the want of cooperation in van dorn's forces enabled siegel to escape curtis thus concentrated his forces at sugar creek and instead of taking him in detail van dorn was obliged to meet his entire army by a circuitous route he led price's army against the enemy's rear moving mccullough against the right flank but his progress was so slow and embarrassed that the enemy heard of it in season to make his dispositions accordingly the battle of elkhorn or pea ridge was fought on the morning of march fifth van dorn reported his force to be fourteen thousand men and curtis puts his force at about ten thousand van dorn with price's division encountered carr's division which had already advanced but was driven back steadily and with heavy loss meanwhile mccullough's command met a division under osterhaus and after a sharp quick struggle swept it away pushing forward through the shrub oak his wide extended line met siegel's asbots and davis's divisions here on the ragged spurs of the hills ensued a fearful combat in the crisis of the struggle mccullough dashing forward to reconnoitre fell a victim to a sharpshooter almost at the same moment mackintosh his second in command fell while charging a battery of the enemy with a regiment of texas cavalry without direction or leader the shattered lines of our forces left the field to rally after a wide circuit on price's division when van dorn heard of this misfortune he urged his attack pressing back the enemy until night closed the bloody combat van dorn's headquarters were then at elkhorn tavern where the enemy's headquarters had been in the morning each army was now on its opponent's line of communication van dorn found his troops much disorganized and exhausted short of ammunition and without food 
and made his arrangements to retreat the wagon trains and all the men not effective for the coming battle were started by a circuitous route for van buren the effectives remained to cover the retreat the battle was renewed at seven a m and raged until ten a m the gallant general henry little had the covering line with his own and reeves's missouri brigades this stout rear guard holding off the whole army of the enemy the trains artillery and most of the army were by that time well on the road the order was given to the missourians to withdraw and the gallant fellows faced about with cheers retired steadily and encamped ten miles from the battlefield at three o'clock there was no real pursuit the attack had failed van dorn put his loss at six hundred killed and wounded and two hundred prisoners curtis reported his loss at two hundred and three killed nine hundred and seventy two wounded and a hundred and seventy six missing total thirteen hundred and fifty one the object of van dorn had been to effect a diversion in behalf of general johnston this failed but the enemy was badly crippled and soon fell back to missouri of which he still retained possession general van dorn was now ordered to join general johnston by the quickest route yet only one of his regiments arrived in time to be present at the battle of shiloh as has been already stated general beauregard left nashville on february fourteenth to take charge in west tennessee and made his headquarters at jackson tennessee on february seventeenth he was somewhat prostrated by sickness which partially disabled him through the campaign the two grand divisions of his army were commanded by the able generals bragg and polk on march twenty sixth he permanently removed to corinth under his orders the evacuation of columbus by general polk and the establishment of a new line resting on new madrid island number no. ten and humboldt was completed on march second brigadier general j p mccown an old army officer was assigned to the command of island number no. ten forty miles below columbus whither he removed his division a p stewart's brigade was sent to new madrid at these points some seven thousand troops were assembled and the remainder marched under general cheatham to union city general polk says quote, in five days we moved the accumulations of six months taking with us all our commissary and quartermaster stores an amount sufficient to supply my whole command for eight months all our powder and other ammunition and ordnance stores excepting a few shot and gun carriages and every heavy gun in the fort except two thirty-two pounders and three carronades in a remote outwork which had been rendered useless end quote. the movement of the enemy up the tennessee river commenced on march tenth general c f smith led the advance with a new division under general sherman on the thirteenth smith assembled four divisions at savannah on the west bank of the tennessee at the great bend the ultimate design was to mass the forces of grant and buell against our army at corinth buell was still in the occupation of nashville on the sixteenth sherman disembarked at pittsburgh landing and made a reconnaissance to monterey nearly halfway to corinth on the next day general grant took command two more divisions were added and he assembled his army near pittsburgh landing which was the most advantageous base for a movement against corinth here it lay inactive until the battle of shiloh the tennessee flows northwest for some distance until a little west of hamburg it takes its final bend to the north here two small streams owl and lick creeks flowing nearly parallel somewhat north of east from three to five miles apart empty into the tennessee owl creek forms the northern limit of the ridge which lick creek bounds on the south these streams rising some ten or twelve miles back toward corinth were bordered near their mouths by swamps filled with backwater from the tennessee and impassable except where the roads cross them the enclosed space is a rolling tableland about one hundred feet above the river level with its watershed lying near lick creek and either slope broken by deep and frequent ravines draining into two streams the acclivities were covered with forests and often thick-set with undergrowth pittsburgh landing containing three or four log cabins was situated about midway between the mouths of the creeks in the narrow morass that borders the tennessee it was three or four miles below hamburg six or seven above savannah the depot of the enemy on the right bank 
and twenty-two miles from Corinth. Thus the position of the enemy was naturally strong. With few and difficult approaches, guarded on either flank by impassable streams and morasses, protected by a succession of ravines and acclivities, commanded by eminences to the rear, it seemed safe against attack, and easy to defend. No defensive works were constructed. End of Section 3「Section 4 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 18. General Buell's March. Object of General Johnston. His Force. Advance from Corinth. Line of Battle. Telegram. The Time of the Battle of Shiloh. Results of the First Day's Battle. One Encampment Not Taken. Effects. Reports on this Failure. Death of General Johnston. Remarks. General Buell, who was to make a junction with General Grant, deemed it best that his army should march through by land, as it would facilitate the occupation of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad through North Alabama, where General Mitchell had been assigned. Accordingly, Buell commenced his march from Nashville on March 15th with a rapid movement of cavalry, followed by a division of infantry to seize the bridges. The bridge over Duck River being destroyed, it was the 31st before his army crossed. His advance arrived at Savannah on Saturday, April 5th, and our attack on Grant at Pittsburgh Landing was made on the next day, the 6th of April. The advance of General Buell anticipated his orders by two days, and likewise the calculations of our commanders. It had been the object of General Johnston since falling back from Nashville to concentrate his army at Corinth and fight the enemy in detail, Grant first and Buell afterward. The army of General Polk had been drawn back from Columbus. The War Department ordered General Bragg from Pensacola, with his well-disciplined army, to the aid of Johnston. A brigade was sent by General Lovell from Louisiana, and Chalmers and Walker were already on the line of the Memphis and Charleston Road with considerable commands. These forces collected at Corinth, and to them were added such new levies as the governors had in rendezvous, and a few regiments raised in response to General Beauregard's call. General Bragg, in a sketch of the Battle of Shiloh, thus speaks of General Johnston's army. Quote, in a period of four weeks, fragments of commands from Bowling Green, Kentucky, under Hardy, Columbus, Kentucky, under Polk, and Pensacola, Mobile, and New Orleans, under Bragg, with such new levies as could be hastily raised, all badly armed and equipped, were united at and near Corinth, and, for the first time, organized as an army. It was a heterogeneous mass, in which there was more enthusiasm than discipline, more capacity than knowledge, and more valor than instruction. Rifles, rifled and smooth-bore muskets, some of them originally percussion, others hastily altered from flintlocks by Yankee contractors, many with the old flint and steel, and shotguns of all sizes and patterns, held place in the same regiments. The task of organizing such a command in four weeks, and supplying it, especially with ammunition, suitable for action, was simply appalling. It was undertaken, however, with a cool, quiet self-control, calling to his aid the best knowledge and talent at his command, which not only inspired confidence, but soon yielded the natural fruits of system, order, and discipline." End quote. This force, about 40,000 of all arms, was divided into four corps, commanded respectively by Major Generals Polk, Bragg, and Hardy, and Brigadier General Breckinridge. General Beauregard was second in command under General Johnston. General Beauregard says, quote, A want of general officers needful for the proper organization of divisions and brigades of an army, brought thus suddenly together, and other difficulties in the way of effective organization, delayed the movements until the night of April 2nd." About one o'clock on the morning of April 3rd, 
preliminary orders were issued to hold the troops in readiness to move at a moment's notice, with five days' provisions and a hundred rounds of ammunition. The orders for march and battle were issued in the afternoon. At that time, General Hardy led the advance, the Third Corps from Corinth by the northernmost route, known as the Ridge Road. Bivouacking that night on the way, he arrived the next morning at Mickey's, a house about 18 miles from Corinth and four or five miles from Pittsburgh. The Second Corps, under Bragg, marched by the direct road to Pittsburgh through Monterey, which it reached about 11 a.m. on the 4th, and bivouacked that night near Mickey's in the rear of Hardy's Corps. The First Corps, under General Polk, consisted of two divisions under Cheatham and Clark. The latter was ordered to follow Hardy on the Ridge Road at an interval of half an hour, and to halt near Mickey's so as to allow Bragg's Corps to fall in behind Hardy, at a thousand yards interval, and form a second line of battle. Polk's Corps was to form the left wing of the third line of battle, and Breckinridge's reserve the right wing. The other division of Polk, under Cheatham, was on outpost duty at and near Bethel, on the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, about as far from Mickey's as Corinth was. He was ordered to assemble his forces at Purdy, and pursue the route to Monterey. He effected his junction on the afternoon of the 5th, and took position on the left wing of Polk's Corps. Breckinridge's Reserve Corps moved from Burnsville early on April 4th, by way of Farmington toward Monterey distant 14 miles. It did not affect its junction with the other corps until late on the afternoon of Saturday the 5th, being delayed by the rains on Friday and Saturday. At daylight on the 5th, Hardy moved, and by 7 o'clock was sufficiently out of the way to allow Bragg to advance. Before 10 o'clock, Hardy's corps had reached the outposts and developed the lines of the enemy. The corps was immediately deployed into line of battle, about a mile and a half west of Shiloh Church, where Lick Creek and Owl Creek approach most nearly, and are about three miles apart. Gladden's brigade, of Bragg's corps, was on the right of Hardy's corps, which was not sufficiently strong to occupy the whole front. This line extended from creek to creek. Before seven o'clock, Bragg's column was in motion, and the right wing of his line of battle formed about 800 yards in the rear of Hardy's line but the division on the left was nowhere to be seen. Even as late as half-past twelve, the missing column had not appeared, nor had any report from it been received. General Johnston, quote, looking first at his watch, then glancing at the position of the sun, exclaimed, This is not war. Let us have our horses. He rode to the rear until he found the missing column standing stock still, with its head some distance out in an open field. General Polk's reserves were ahead of it, with their wagons and artillery blocking up the road. General Johnston ordered them to clear the road, and the missing column to move forward. There was much chaffering among those implicated as to who should bear the blame. It was about four o'clock when the lines were completely formed. Too late, of course, to begin the battle then. End quote. The road was not clear until 2 p.m., General Polk got Clark's division of his corps into line of battle by four o'clock, and Cheatham, who had come up on the left, promptly followed. Breckinridge's line was then formed on Polk's right. Thus was the army arrayed in three lines of battle late Saturday afternoon. The purpose of General Johnston to attack promptly is evinced in the correspondence already introduced. It is further shown in his telegram of April 3rd, as follows. Quote, to the President... Richmond. General Buell in motion. 30,000 strong. Rapidly from Columbia by Clifton to Savannah. Mitchell behind him with 10,000. Confederate forces 40,000. Ordered forward to offer battle near Pittsburgh. Division from Bethel. Main body from Corinth. Reserve from Burnsville. Converging tomorrow near Monterey on Pittsburgh. Beauregard second in command. Polk the left. Bragg the center. Hardy, the right wing, Breckinridge, the reserve. Hope engagement before Buell can form junction. End quote. On the 6th of April, I sent a telegram as follows. Quote, General A.S. Johnston, your dispatch of yesterday received. I hope you will be able to close with the enemy before his two columns unite. End quote. 
though much inquiry has been made, I have not been able to recover that dispatch of yesterday, the 4th. It was anxiously sought because, in cipher, private between us, he explained distinctly his plan of battle, as the previous one had his proposed order of march. It was in every respect important to attack at the earliest moment after the advance of Buell's command became known. Every delay diminished the chances of surprising the enemy, and increased the probability of his being reinforced. Had the attack been made a day sooner, not only would Buell's army have been absent, but there would have been no prospect of their timely arrival, and who can measure the moral effect this would have produced? It would be useless to review the controversies as to who was responsible for the confusion and consequent detentions on the march, the evil of which might have been greater if the vigilance of the enemy had been equal to his self-sufficiency. War has been called a fickle goddess, and its results attributed to chance. The great soldier of our century said, quote, fortune favors the heavy battalions, end quote. But is it not rather exact calculation than chance which controls the events of war, and the just determination of the relation of time, space, and motion in the application of force, which decides the effective weight of battalions? Had the Battle of Shiloh opened a day sooner, it would have been better. Had it been postponed a day, to attack then would have been impracticable. Had the several columns moved on different roads, converging toward the field of battle, the movements of some could not have been obstructed by others, so that the troops would have been in position, and the battle have been commenced on Saturday morning. The program and purpose of General Johnston appear from his dispatch of the 3rd, and from the disappointment evinced by him at the failure of a portion of the command to be present on the field on the morning of the 5th, Saturday, as he expected. General Bragg, in a monograph on the Battle of Shiloh, says, quote, during the afternoon of the 5th, as the last of our troops were taking position, a casual and partly accidental meeting of general officers occurred just in rear of our second line, near the bivouac of General Bragg. The commander-in-chief, General Beauregard, General Polk, General Bragg, and General Breckinridge are remembered as present. In a discussion of the causes of the delay and its incidents, it was mentioned that some of the troops, now in their third day only, were entirely out of food, though having marched with five days' rations. General Beauregard, confident our movement had been discovered by the enemy, urged its abandonment, a return to our camps for supplies, and a general change of program. In this opinion, no other seemed fully to concur, and when it was suggested that the enemy's supplies were much nearer and could be had for the taking, General Johnston quietly remarked, Gentlemen, we shall attack at daylight tomorrow. The meeting then dispersed upon an invitation of the commanding general to meet at his tent that evening. At that meeting, a further discussion elicited the same views and the same firm, decided determination. The next morning, about dawn of day, the 6th, as troops were being put in motion, several generals again met at the campfire of the general-in-chief. The discussion was renewed, General Beauregard again expressing his dissent, when, rapid firing in the front indicating that the attack had commenced, General Johnston closed the discussion by remarking, The battle has opened, gentlemen. It is too late to change our dispositions. He prepared to move to the front, and his subordinates promptly joined their respective commands, inspired by his coolness, confidence, and determination. Few men have equaled him in the possession and display, at the proper time, of these great qualities of the soldier." End quote. The results of the first day of the famous battle thus began are very summarily presented in the following brief report of General Beauregard. Quote, At 5 a.m. on the 6th instant, a reconnoitering party of the enemy, having become engaged with our advanced pickets, the commander of the forces gave orders to begin the movement and attack as determined upon, except that Travu's brigade of Breckinridge's division was detached and advanced to support the left of Bragg's corps and line of battle, then menaced by the enemy, and the other two brigades were directed to advance by the road to Hamburg to support Bragg's right, and at the same time, Maney's regiment of Polk's corps was advanced by the same road to reinforce a regiment of cavalry and battery of four pieces, already thrown forward to watch and guard Greer's, Tanner's, and Borland's fords of Lick Creek. 
Thirty minutes after 5 a.m., our lines and columns were in motion, all animated evidently by a promising spirit. The front line was engaged at once, but advanced steadily, followed in due order with equal resolution and steadiness by the other lines, which were brought successively into action with rare skill, judgment, and gallantry by the several corps commanders, as the enemy made a stand with his masses rallied for the struggle for his encampments. Like an alpine avalanche, our troops moved forward, despite the determined resistance of the enemy, until after 6 p.m., when we were in possession of all his encampments between Owl and Lick Creeks but one. Nearly all of his field artillery, about 30 flags, colors, and standards, over 3,000 prisoners, including a division commander, General Prentice, and several brigade commanders, thousands of small arms, an immense supply of subsistence, forage, and munitions of war, and a large amount of means of transportation, all the substantial fruits of a complete victory, such indeed as rarely have followed the most successful battles, for never was an army so well provided as that of our enemy. The remnant of his army had been driven in utter disorder to the immediate vicinity of Pittsburgh, under the shelter of the heavy guns of his ironclad gunboats, and we remained undisputed masters of his well-selected, admirably provided cantonments. After our twelve hours of obstinate conflict with his forces, who had been beaten from them and the contiguous covert, but only by the sustained onset of all the men we could bring into action. End quote. There are two words in this report which, if they could have been truthfully omitted, it would have been worth to us the surrender of all quote, the substantial fruits of a complete victory. End quote. It says, quote, Our troops moved forward despite the determined resistance of the enemy, until after 6 p.m., when we were in possession of all his encampments between Owl and Lick Creeks, but one, end quote. It was that one encampment that furnished a foothold for all the subsequent reinforcements sent by Buell, and gave occasion for the final withdrawal of our forces. Whereas, if that had been captured and the waters of the Tennessee reached, as General Johnston designed, it was not too much to expect that Grant's army would have surrendered, that Buell's forces would not have crossed the Tennessee, but with a skillful commander like Johnston to lead our troops, the enemy would have sought safety on the north bank of the Ohio, that Tennessee, Kentucky, and Missouri would have been recovered, the northwest disaffected, and our armies filled with the men of the southwest, and perhaps of the northwest also. Let us turn to reports and authorities. The author of the life of General Albert Sidney Johnston says, quote, Of the two armies, one was now advancing, triumphant host, with arm uplifted to give the mortal blow. The other, a broken, mangled, demoralized mob, paralyzed and waiting for the stroke. While the other Confederate brigades, which had shared most actively in Prentice's capture, were sending back the prisoners and forming again for a final attack, two brigades, under Chalmers and Jackson, on the extreme right, had cleared away all in front of them, and, moving down the river bank, now came upon the last point where even a show of resistance was made. Being two very bold and active brigadiers, they at once closed with the enemy in their front, crossing a deep ravine and difficult ground to get at him. Here Colonel Webster, of Grant's staff, had gathered all the guns he could find from batteries, whether abandoned or still coherent, and with stout-hearted men, picked up at random, had prepared a resistance. Some infantry, similarly constituted, had been got together, and Ammon's brigade, the van of Nelson's division of Buell's corps, had landed and was pushing its way through the throng of pallid fugitives at the landing to take up the battle where it had fallen from the hands of Grant and Sherman. It got into position in time to do its part in checking the unsupported assaults of Chalmers and Jackson." End quote. General Chalmers, describing this final attack in his report, says, quote, It was then about four o'clock in the evening, and after distributing ammunition, we received orders from General Bragg to drive the enemy into the river. My brigade, together with that of Brigadier General Jackson, filed to the right and formed facing the river, and endeavored to press forward to the water's edge. But in attempting to mount the last ridge, we were met by a fire from a whole line of batteries, protected by infantry, and assisted by shells from the gunboats. End quote. In a subsequent memorandum, General Chalmers writes quote, One more resolute movement forward 
would have captured Grant and his whole army, and fulfilled to the letter the battle plan of the great Confederate general, who died in the belief that victory was ours. End quote. The Life of General Albert Sidney Johnston, page 637. Brigadier General Jackson, in his report, says, quote, My brigade was ordered to change direction again, face toward Pittsburgh, where the enemy appeared to have made his last stand, and to advance upon him, General Chalmers's brigade being again on my right, and extending to the swamp of the Tennessee River. Without ammunition, and with only their bayonets to rely on, steadily my men advanced under a heavy fire from light batteries, siege pieces, and gunboats. Passing through the ravine, they arrived near the crest of the opposite hill, upon which the enemy's batteries were, but could not be urged farther without support. Sheltering themselves against the precipitous sides of the ravine, they remained under this fire for some time. Finding an advance without support impracticable, remaining there under fire useless, and believing that any further forward movement should have been made simultaneously along our whole line, I proceeded to obtain orders from General Withers, but, after seeing him, was ordered by a staff officer to retire. This order was communicated to me as coming from General Beauregard. End quote. General Hardy, who commanded the first line, says in his report, quote, Upon the death of General Johnston, the command having devolved upon General Beauregard, the conflict was continued until near sunset, and the advanced divisions were within a few hundred yards of Pittsburgh, where the enemy were huddled in confusion, when the order to withdraw was received. The troops were ordered to bivouac on the field of battle. End quote. General Polk's report says, quote, We had one hour or more of daylight still left, were within 150 to 400 yards of the enemy's position, and nothing seemed wanting to complete the most brilliant victory of the war but to press forward and make a vigorous assault on the demoralized remnant of his forces. End quote. General Gilmer, the chief engineer of the Confederate States Army, in a letter to Colonel William Preston Johnston, dated September 17, 1872, writes as follows. Quote, it is my well-considered opinion that if your father had survived the day, he would have crushed and captured General Grant's army before the setting of the sun on the 6th. In fact, at the time your father received the mortal wound, advancing with General Breckinridge's command, the day was ours. The enemy, having lost all the strong positions on that memorable field, his troops fell back in great disorder on the banks of the Tennessee. To cover the confusion, rapid fires were opened from the gunboats the enemy had placed in the river. But the shots passed entirely over our devoted men, who were exultant and eager to be led forward to the final assault, which must have resulted in a complete victory, owing to the confusion and general disorganization of the Federal troops. I knew the condition of General Grant's army at the moment, as I had reached a high, projecting point on the bank of the river, about a mile above Pittsburgh Landing and could see the hurried movements to get the disordered troops across to the right bank. Several thousand had already passed, and a confused mass of men crowded to the landing to get on the boats that were employed in crossing. I rode rapidly to General Bragg's position to report what I had seen, and suggested that, if he would suspend the fire of his artillery and marshal his infantry for a general advance, the enemy must surrender. General Bragg decided to make the advance and authorized me and other officers to direct the commanders of the batteries to cease firing. In the midst of the preparations, orders reached General Bragg from General Beauregard, directing the troops to be withdrawn and placed in camp for the night, the intention being to resume the contest in the morning. This was fatal, as it enabled General Buell and General Wallace to arrive on the scene of action. That is, they came up in the course of the night. Had General Beauregard known the condition of the enemy as your father knew it when he received the fatal shot, the order for withdrawal would certainly not have been given, and without such order I know the enemy would have been crushed. End quote. To General Gilmer's opinion as a scientific engineer, a soldier of long experience, and a man of resolute will as well as calm judgment, the greatest respect will be accorded by those who knew him in the United States Army as well as his associates in the Confederate Army. General Bragg, in his official report, says, quote, As soon as our troops could be again put in motion, the order was given to move forward at all points and sweep the enemy from the field. Our troops, greatly exhausted by twelve hours' incessant fighting without food, 
mostly responded to the order with alacrity, and the movement commenced with every prospect of success, though a heavy battery in our front and the gunboats on our right seemed determined to dispute every inch of ground. Just at this time, an order was received from the commanding general to withdraw the forces beyond the enemy's fire. End quote. In addition to the statements and opinions cited above, I will introduce from a recent publication by Thomas Worthington, late colonel of the 46th Regiment of Ohio Volunteers, two statements showing the relative condition of the two armies in the afternoon of the day of battle. It may be proper to say that Colonel Worthington was regularly educated as a soldier and had seen service in Mexico. He quotes Colonel Geddes of the 8th Iowa Volunteers as follows, quote, About 3 p.m., all communications with the river landing ceased, and it became evident to me that the enemy was turning the right and left flanks of our army. About 2 p.m., the whole Union right, comprising the 46th Ohio, which had held that flank for two hours or more, was driven back in disorder, and the Confederate flanking force cut the center off from the landing, as stated by Colonel Geddes soon after General Johnston's fall. End quote. General Beauregard reports as follows. Quote, it was after 6 p.m. when the enemy's last position was carried, and his force finally broke and sought refuge behind a commanding eminence covering Pittsburgh Landing, not more than half a mile distant, and under the guns of the gunboats, which opened on our eager columns a fierce and annoying fire, with shot and shell of the heaviest description. Darkness was close at hand. Officers and men were exhausted by a combat of over twelve hours, without food, and jaded by the march of the preceding day through mud and water. It was, therefore, impossible to collect the rich and opportune spoils of war, scattered broadcast on the field left in our possession and impracticable to make any effective dispositions for their removal to the rear. I accordingly established my headquarters at the Church of Shiloh, in the enemy's encampment, with Major General Bragg, and directed our troops to sleep on their arms in such positions in advance and rear as corps commanders should determine, hoping, from news received by a special dispatch, that delays had been encountered by General Buell in his march from Columbia, and that his main forces, therefore, could not reach the field of battle in time to save General Grant's shattered fugitives from capture or destruction on the following day. End quote. Such are the representations of those having the best means of information relative to the immediate causes of the failure to drive the enemy from his last foothold and gain possession of it. Some of the more remote causes of this failure may be noticed. The first was the death of General Johnston, which is thus described by his son. Quote, General Johnston had passed through the ordeal, the charge upon the enemy seemingly unhurt. His noble horse was shot in four places. His clothes were pierced by missiles. His boot sole was cut and torn by a minier ball. But if he himself had received any severe wound, he did not know it. At this moment, Governor Harris rode up from the right, elated with his own success and with the vindication of his Tennesseans. After a few words, General Johnston sent him with an order to Colonel Statham, which, having delivered, he speedily returned. In the meantime, knots and groups of Federal soldiers kept up an angry discharge of firearms as they retreated upon their supports, and their last line, now yielding, delivered volley after volley as they retreated. By the chance of war, a minier ball from one of these did its fatal work. As General Johnston, on horseback, sat there, knowing that he had crushed in the arch which had so long resisted the pressure of his forces, and waiting until they could collect sufficiently to give the final stroke, he received a mortal wound. It came in the moment of victory and triumph from a flying foe. It smote him at the very instant when he felt the full conviction that the day was won. End quote. His wound consisted in the cutting of the artery that runs down through the thigh and divides at the knee, and passes along the separate bones of the lower part of the leg. The wound was just above the division or branch of the artery. It was fatal only because the flow of blood was not stopped by a tourniquet. The narrative continues. Quote, General Beauregard had told General Johnston that morning, as he rode off, that if it should be necessary to communicate with him or for him to do anything, he would be found in his ambulance in bed. Governor Harris, knowing this, and how feeble General Beauregard's health was, 
went first to his headquarters just in the rear of where the army had deployed into line the evening before beauregard and his staff were gone on horseback in the direction of shiloh church he found them there the governor told general beauregard that general johnston had been killed beauregard expressed regret and then remarked everything else seems to be going on well on the right governor harris assented then said beauregard the battle may as well go on the governor replied that he certainly thought it ought he offered his services to beauregard and they were courteously accepted general beauregard then remained where he was waiting the issue of events sydney johnston fell in sight of victory the hour he had waited for the event he had planned for had arrived his fame was vindicated but far dearer than this to his patriotic spirit was it with his dying eyes to behold his country's flag so lately drooping in disaster triumphantly advancing in his fall the great pillar of the southern confederacy was crushed and beneath its fragments the best hope of the southwest lay buried a highly educated and richly endowed soldier his varied experience embraced also civil affairs and his intimate knowledge of the country and people of the southwest so highly qualified him for that special command that it was not possible to fill the place made vacant by his death not for the first time did the fate of an army depend upon a single man and the fortunes of a country hang as in a balance on the achievements of a single army to take an example far from us in time and place when turenne had after months of successful manoeuvring finally forced his enemy into a position which gave assurance of victory and had marshalled his forces for a decisive battle he was when making a preliminary reconnaissance killed by a chance shot then his successor instead of attacking retreated and all which the one had gained for france the other lost to take another example not quite so conclusive it was epigrammatically said by lieutenant kingsbury when writing of the battle of buena vista that if the last shot fired at the close of the second day's conflict had killed general taylor the next morning sun would have risen upon the strange spectacle of two armies in full retreat from each other the field for which they had fought being in the possession of neither what material consequences would have flowed from the supposed event how the mexican people would have been inspired by the retreat of our army how far it would have brought out all their resources for war and to what extent results might have been thereby affected are speculative inquiries on a subject from which time and circumstance have taken the interest it once possessed the extracts which have been given sufficiently prove that when general johnston fell the confederate army was so fully victorious that had the attack been vigorously pressed general grant and his army would before the setting of the sun have been fugitives or prisoners as our troops drew near to the river the gunboats of the enemy became ineffective because to fire over the bank required such elevation of the guns that the shot and shell passed high over the heads of our men falling far away in the rear general polk described the troops in advance for that reason as quite safe from the fire of the gunboats though it might seem terrible to those far in the rear and expressed the surprise and regret he felt at the order to retire grant's army being beaten the next step of general johnston's program should have followed the defeat of buell's and mitchell's forces as they successively came up and a return by our victorious army through tennessee to kentucky the great embarrassment had been the want of good military weapons these would have been largely supplied by the conquest hoped for and in the light of what had occurred not unreasonably anticipated what great consequences would have ensued must be matter of conjecture but that the people of kentucky and missouri generously sympathized with the south was then commonly admitted our known want of preparation for war and numerical inferiority may well have caused many to doubt the wisdom of our effort for independence and to these a signal success would have been the make-weight deciding their course i believe that again in the history of war the fate of an army depended on one man and more that the fortunes of a country hung by the single thread of the life that was yielded on the field of shiloh so great was my confidence in his capacity for organization and administration that i felt when he was assigned to the department of the west that the undeveloped power of that region would be made sufficient not only for its own safety 
but to contribute support if need be to the more seriously threatened east there have been various suppositions as to the neglect of the wound which caused general johnston's death my own opinion founded upon the statements of those who were near him and upon my long acquaintance with him and close observation of him under trying circumstances is that his iron nerve and extraordinary concentration of mind made him regardless of his wound in the fixed purpose to dislodge the enemy from his last position and while thus struggling to complete the victory within his grasp he unheedingly allowed his life-blood to flow away it often happens that men do not properly value their richest gifts until taken away those who had erroneously and unjustly censured johnston convicted of their error by the grandeur of his revealed character joined in the general lamentation over his loss and malignity even was silenced by the devoted manner of his death my estimation of him was based on long and intimate acquaintance beginning in our youth it had grown with our growth without check or variation and when he first arrived in richmond was expressed to some friends yet living in the wish that i had the power by resigning to transfer to him the presidency of the confederate states end of section four Section 5 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 19. Retirement of the Army. Remnants of Grant's Army. Its Reinforcements strength of our army strength of grant's army reorganization corinth advance of general halleck siege of corinth evacuation retreat to tupelo general beauregard retires general bragg in command positions on the mississippi river occupied by the enemy new madrid island number ten fort pillow memphis attack at hatteras inlet Expedition of the enemy to Port Royal. Expeditions from Port Royal. System of coast defenses adopted by us. Fort Pulaski. At the ensuing nightfall, our victorious army retired from the front and abandoned its vantage ground on the bluffs, which had been won at such a cost of blood. The enemy thereby had room and opportunity to come out from their corner, reoccupy the strong positions from which they had been driven, and dispose their troops on much more favorable ground. Called off by staff officers who gave no specific instructions, our brigades, according to circumstances, bivouacked on the battlefield, marched to the rear, or made themselves comfortable on the profuse spoils of the enemy's encampments. General Buell says, quote, Of the army of not less than 50,000 effective men, which Grant had on the west bank of the Tennessee River, not more than five thousand were in ranks and available on the battlefield at nightfall on the sixth exclusive of lew wallace's division say eight thousand five hundred men that only came up during the night the rest were either killed wounded captured or scattered in inextricable and hopeless confusion for miles along the banks of the river End quote. in addition to the arrival of wallace's division the entire divisions of nelson and crittenden got across the river during the night and by daylight that of McCook began to arrive. All but the first named belonged to Buell's army. The work of reorganization of fragments of Grant's force also occupied the night. In the morning, the arrival of reinforcements to the enemy continued. On the morning of the 7th, the enemy advanced about 6 o'clock and opened a heavy fire of musketry and artillery, such as gave assurance that the reinforcements had arrived, to anticipate which the Battle of the 6th had been fought. A series of combats ensued, in which the Confederates showed their usual valor, but after the junction had been effected between Grant and Buell, which Johnston's movement was made to prevent, our force was unequal to resist the combined armies, and retreat was a necessity. The field return of the Army of Mississippi before and after the Battle of Shiloh was as follows. Infantry and artillery, effective before the battle, 35,953. Cavalry, 4,382. 
total 40,335. Infantry and artillery effective after the battle, 25,555. Cavalry, 4,081. Total, 29,636. Difference, 10,699. Casualties in battle, killed, 1,728. Wounded, 8,012. Missing, 959. The effective force of General Grant's army engaged in the battles of April 6th and 7th at Shiloh was 49,314. Reinforcements of General Buell, 21,579. Total, 70,893. The casualties in the battle of April 6th in Grant's force were as follows. Killed, 1,500. Wounded, 6,634. Missing, 3,086. Total, 11,220. Leaving for duty on the 7th, 59,673. On April 9th, Major General H. W. Halleck left St. Louis and proceeded to Pittsburgh Landing to assume command of the enemy's forces in the field. A reorganization was made in which General Grant's divisions formed the right wing, those of General Buell the center, and those of General Pope brought from the west side of the Mississippi the left wing, and an advance on Corinth was commenced. Corinth, the position from which our forces had advanced to Shiloh or Pittsburgh Landing, and to which they had now retired, was a small village in the northeast corner of the state of Mississippi. It was ninety miles east of Memphis, and twenty or twenty-two west of the Tennessee River. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad ran from west to east through it, and the Mobile and Ohio Road from south to north. The country between it and the Tennessee River was quite rugged, broken into ridges, and covered with a heavy forest. The position itself was flat, the water poor. Being the point at which two principal railroads crossed, it served admirably for the concentration of our forces. Corinth was a strategic point of importance, and it was intended to be held as long as circumstances would permit. But it was untenable in the face of a largely superior force, owing to the ease with which the railroad communications in the rear could be cut by the enemy's cavalry. The small streams and contiguous flats in its front formed some obstacles which were not passed by the enemy until after the retreat of our army. The defenses were slight, consisting of rifle pits and earthworks of little elevation or strength. The movement of General Halleck against this position commenced from Pittsburgh Landing on April 28th, with a force exceeding 85,000 effectives. On May 3rd, he had reached within eight miles of Corinth, and on the 21st, his batteries were within three miles. This slow progress was probably the result of a conviction that our force was very large, rather than of the bad state of the roads. So great were his precautions that every night his army lay in an entrenched camp, and by day it was assailed by skirmishers from our army in more or less force. General Sherman, in his report of May 30th, says, quote, My division has constructed seven distinct entrenched camps since leaving Shiloh, the men working cheerfully and well all the time, night and day. Hardly had we finished one camp before we were called on to move forward and build another. But I have been delighted at this feature in the character of my division, and take this method of making it known. Our entrenchments near Corinth and at Russell's, each built substantially in one night, are stronger works of art than the much boasted forts of the enemy at Corinth. End quote. The line of railroad on the north and east had been cut by the enemy, and an attempt made on the south. But so well was his apprehension of our strength maintained that he continued his entrenched approaches until within 1,000 yards of our main works. General Sherman says, quote, By 9 a.m. of the 29th, our works were substantially done, and our artillery in position, and at 4 p.m. the siege train was brought forward. So near was the enemy that we could hear the sound of his drums, and sometimes of voices in command, and the railroad cars arriving and departing at Corinth were easily distinguished. For some days and nights, cars have been arriving and departing very frequently, especially in the night. But last night, the 29th, more so than usual, and my suspicions were aroused. Before daybreak, I instructed the brigade commanders and the field officer of the day to feel forward as far as possible. But all reported the enemy's pickets still in force in the dense woods to our front. 
but about 6 a.m., a curious explosion, sounding like a volley of large siege pieces, followed by others, singly and in twos and threes, arrested our attention, and soon after a large smoke arose from the direction of Corinth, when I telegraphed to General Halleck to ascertain the cause. He answered that he could not explain it, but ordered me to advance my division and feel the enemy, if still in my front. I immediately put in motion two regiments of each brigade, by different roads, and soon after followed with the whole division, infantry, artillery, and cavalry. General M. L. Smith's brigade moved rapidly down the main road, entering the first redoubt of the enemy at 7 a.m. It was completely evacuated, and by 8 a.m. all my division was at Corinth and beyond." End quote. The force of General Beauregard was less than 45,000 effective men. He estimated that of the enemy to be between 85 and 90,000 men. All the troops of the enemy in reserve in Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, and Illinois were brought forward, except the force of Curtis in Arkansas, and placed in front of our position. No definite idea of their number was formed. In the opinion of Beauregard, a general attack was not to be hazarded. But on May 3rd, an advance was made to attack the corps of General Pope when only one of his divisions was in position, and that gave way so rapidly it could not be overtaken. Again, on May 9th, an advance was made, hoping to surprise the enemy. But a division, which should have been in position at three o'clock in the morning, or early dawn, was detained until three in the afternoon by the mistakes of the guide. The enemy thus became informed of the movement, and no surprise could be effected. General Beauregard commenced the removal of his sick, preparatory to an evacuation on may twenty sixth on the next day arrangements for falling back were made and the work completed on the twenty ninth so complete was the evacuation that not only was the army successfully withdrawn but also every piece of ordnance only a quantity of damaged ammunition being left behind the retreat was continued to tupelo without any serious conflict with the enemy but during the retreat seven locomotives were reported to be lost by the burning of a bridge, and a number of cars, most of which were loaded with stores, were ordered to be burned. On June 14th, orders were sent to General Bragg from Richmond to proceed to Jackson, Mississippi, and temporarily to assume command of the department, then under command of General Lovell. The order concluded as follows, quote, After General Magruder joins, your further services there may be dispensed with. The necessity is urgent and absolute. J. Davis. End quote. On application to General Beauregard for the necessary order, he replied, quote, You cannot possibly go. My health does not permit me to remain in charge alone here. This evening, my two physicians were insisting that I should go away for one or two weeks, furnishing me with another certificate for that purpose. And I had concluded to go, intending to see you tomorrow on the subject and leave you in command. End quote. The certificate of the physicians was as follows. Quote, Headquarters, Western Department, Tupelo, June 14th, 1862. We certify that, after attendance on General Beauregard for the past four months, and treatment of his case, in our professional opinion, he is incapacitated physically for the arduous duties of his present command, and we urgently recommend rest and recreation. R. L. Brody, surgeon, PACS, Sam Chopin, surgeon, PACS. End quote. These facts were telegraphed to me at once by General Bragg. Soon after, I sent a second dispatch to him, renewing the order, and expressing my surprise that he should have hesitated to obey when the original order stated, quote, The necessity is urgent and absolute. End quote. Before this second dispatch was received by General Bragg, General Beauregard had transferred the command to him and had departed for Bladen Springs. General Bragg thus describes the subsequent proceedings. Quote, Prepared to move, I telegraphed back to the President that the altered conditions induced me to await his further orders. In reply to this, I was immediately notified by telegraph of my assignment to the permanent command of the Army, and was directed to send General Van Dorn to execute my first instructions. End quote. From this statement, it appears, one, that General Beauregard was not, as has been alleged, harshly deprived of his command, but that he voluntarily surrendered it, after being furnished with medical certificates of his physical incapacity for its arduous duties. 2. That he did not even notify his government, 
still less asked permission to retire. 3. That the order assigning another to the command he had abandoned could not be sent through him when he had departed and gone to a place where there was no telegraph and rarely a mail. 4. That it is neither customary nor proper to send orders to the commander of an army through a general on sick leave, and in this case it would have been very objectionable, as a similar order had just been sent and disobeyed. Meanwhile, some other events had occurred in the Western Department which should be mentioned. The movement of the forces of the enemy up the Tennessee River, as has been stated, thus flanking some of our positions on the Mississippi River, was followed by his fitting out a naval fleet to move down that river. This fleet, consisting of seven ironclads and one gunboat, ten mortar boats, each carrying a thirteen-inch mortar, a coal barge, two ordnance steamers, and two transports with troops, left Cairo on March 14th, and arrived at Hickman that evening. A small force of our cavalry left upon its approach. Columbus, as has been stated, had previously been evacuated by our forces and occupied by the enemy. In the morning, the fleet continued down toward Island Number 10. This island is situated in that bend of the river which touches the border of Tennessee, a few miles further up the river than New Madrid, although nearly southeast of that point. In the latter part of February, a large force of the enemy under Major General Pope left Commerce, Missouri, and moved south about 50 miles to New Madrid, with the object of capturing that place. Aided by the gunboats of Commander Hollins, our small force repulsed the assaults of the enemy three times. But such was the disparity of numbers that it soon became manifest that our forces could not successfully hold the position, and it was evacuated on the night of March 13th. Its defenses consisted of two earthworks in which about 20 guns were mounted. These were spiked and rendered unfit for use. The bombardment of Island No. 10, above described, commenced on March 15th and was continued night and day. Up to April 1st, the enemy fired several thousand 13-inch and rifle shells. On March 17th, a general attack with five gunboats and four mortar boats was made and continued nine hours without any serious result. Finally, the forces of the enemy were greatly increased and began to occupy both banks of the river, and also the river above and below the island, when a portion of our force retired, and about April 7th the remainder surrendered. The fleet, on April 12th, proceeded next to Fort Pillow, about 180 miles below island number 10, and a bombardment was commenced on the next day. This was continued without effect until the night of June 4th, when both Forts Pillow and Randolph, the latter some 12 miles below the former, were evacuated, these positions having become untenable in consequence of the withdrawal of our forces from Corinth and the adjacent portion of Tennessee. Nothing now remained to oppose the enemy's fleet but our gunboats at Memphis, which were, say, 70 miles farther down the river. The gallantry and efficiency displayed by our improvised river navy at New Madrid and Island No. 10 gave rise to hopes scarcely justified by the number of our vessels or their armament. Our boats had fewer guns than those of the enemy, and they were less substantially constructed, but their officers and crews took counsel of their country's need rather than of their own strength. They manfully engaged the enemy and disabled one of his rams, but after an hour's conflict were compelled to retire. The possession of Memphis being no longer disputed, its occupation by the enemy promptly followed. At an early period of the war, the government of the United States organized some naval and military expeditions with a view to capture our harbors, to occupy an extensive tract of country in their vicinity, and especially to obtain possession of a portion of our cotton crop. The first movement of this kind was by a fleet of naval vessels and transports, which appeared off Hatteras Inlet on August 27, 1861. This inlet has a gap in the sandy barrier that lines the coast of North Carolina, about 18 miles southwest of Cape Hatteras. It was the principal entrance to Pamlico Sound, a large body of water lying between the sandy beach and the mainland. The channel of the entrance had about seven feet of water and was protected by two small forts constructed on the sand. Our forces were under the command of Captain Samuel Barron, an officer of distinction, formerly in the United States Navy. After a short bombardment, which developed the strength of the enemy and his own comparative weakness, he capitulated. 
a much larger fleet of naval vessels and transports, carrying 15,000 men, appeared off the harbor of Port Royal, South Carolina, on November 4, 1861. This harbor is situated midway between the cities of Charleston and Savannah. It is a broad estuary, into which flow some two or three streams, the interlacing of which with creeks forms a group of numerous islands. The parish, of which these are the greater part, constituted the richest agricultural district in the state, its staples being Sea Island cotton and rice. The principal defences were Fort Walker, a strong earthwork on Hilton Head, and Fort Beauregard on Phillips Island. The attack was made by the enemy on the 7th, by a fleet consisting of eight steamers and a sloop of war in tow. Some of the steamers were of the first class, as the Wabash and the Susquehanna. The conflict continued for four hours, when the forts, because untenable, were abandoned. In the early part of 1862, several reconnaissances were sent out from Port Royal, and subsequently an expedition visited Darien and Brunswick in Georgia, and Fernandina, Jacksonville, and St. Augustine in Florida. Its design was to take and keep under control this line of seacoast, especially in Georgia. Some small steamers and other vessels were captured, and some ports were occupied. The system of coast defenses, which was adopted, and the preparations which had been at that time made by the government to resist these aggressions of the enemy should be stated. By reference to the topography of our coast, it will be seen that, in the state of North Carolina, are Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds, penetrating far into the interior, then the Cape Fear River, connecting with the ocean by two channels, the southwest channel being defended by a small enclosed fort and a water battery. On the coast of South Carolina are Georgetown and Charleston harbors. A succession of islands extends along the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, separated from the mainland by a channel which is navigable for vessels of moderate draft from Charleston to Fernandina, Florida. There are fewer assailable points on the Gulf than on the Atlantic. Pensacola, Mobile, and the mouth of the Mississippi were defended by works that had hitherto been regarded as sufficiently strong to repulse any naval attack that might be made upon them. Immediately after the bombardment of Fort Sumter, the work of improving the seacoast defense was begun and carried forward as rapidly as the limited means of the government would permit. The work that was now done has been so summarily and satisfactorily described by General A. L. Long, Chief of Artillery, in a paper contributed to the Southern Historical Society, that I avail myself of a few extracts. Quote, Roanoke Island and other points on Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds were fortified. Batteries were established on the southeast entrance of Cape Fear River, and the works on the southwest entrance strengthened. Defenses were constructed at Georgetown and at all assailable points on the northeast coast of South Carolina. The works of Charleston Harbor were greatly strengthened by earthworks and floating batteries. The defenses from Charleston down the coast of South Carolina and Georgia were confined chiefly to the islands and salient points bearing upon the channels leading inland. Defensive works were erected at all important points along the coast. Many of the defenses, being injudiciously located, and hastily erected, offered but little resistance to the enemy when attacked. These defeats were not surprising when we take into consideration the inexperience of the engineers and the long line of seacoast to be defended. As soon as a sufficient naval force had been collected, an expedition under the command of General E. F. Butler was sent to the coast of North Carolina and captured several important points. A second expedition under Admiral Dupont and General Thomas W. Sherman was sent to make a descent on the coast of South Carolina. On the 7th of November, Dupont attacked the batteries that were designed to defend Port Royal Harbor, as stated above, and almost without resistance, carried them and gained possession of Port Royal. This is the best harbor in South Carolina, and is the strategic key to all the South Atlantic coast. Later, Burnside captured Roanoke Island, and established himself in eastern North Carolina without resistance. The rapid fall of Roanoke Island and Port Royal Harbor struck consternation into the hearts of the inhabitants along the entire coast. The capture of Port Royal gave to the Federals the entire possession of Beaufort Island, which afforded a secure place of rest for the army, while the harbor gave a safe anchorage for the fleet. 
Beaufort Island almost fills a deep indenture in the main shore, being separated the greater part of its extent by a narrow channel, which is navigable its entire circuit. Its northern extremity extends to within a few miles of the Charleston and Savannah Railroad. The main road from Port Royal to Pocotelago crosses the channel at this point. The evacuation of Hilton Head, on the southwestern extremity of Beaufort Island, followed the capture of Port Royal. This exposed Savannah, only about 25 miles distant, to an attack from that direction. At the same time, the Federals having command of Helena Bay, Charleston was liable to be assailed from North Edisto or Stono Inlet, and the railroad could have been reached without opposition by the route from Port Royal to Pocotelago. Such was the state of affairs when General Lee reached Charleston about December 1, 1861, to assume the command of the Department of North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. His vigorous mind at once comprehended the situation, and with his accustomed energy he met the difficulties that presented themselves. Directing fortifications to be constructed on the Stono and the Edisto and the Cumby, he fixed his headquarters at Coosahatchee, the point most threatened, and directed defenses to be erected opposite Hilton Head and on the Broad and Sockahatchee to cover Savannah. These were the points requiring immediate attention. He superintended in person the works overlooking the approach to the railroad from Port Royal, and soon infused into his troops a part of his own energy. The works he had planned rose with magical rapidity. A few days after his arrival at Coosahatchee, Dupont and Sherman sent their first reconnaissance in that direction, which was met and repulsed by shots from the newly erected batteries, and now, whether the Federals advanced toward the railroad or turned in the direction of Charleston or Savannah, they were arrested by our batteries. The people, seeing the Federals repulsed at every point, regained their confidence, and with it their energy. The most important points being now secured against immediate attack, the general proceeded to organize a system of seacoast defense different from that which had been previously adopted. He withdrew the troops and material from those works which had been established on the islands, and salient points which he could not defend to a strong interior line, where the effect of the Federal naval force would be neutralized. After a careful reconnaissance of the coast, he designated such points as he considered it necessary to fortify. The most important positions on this extensive line were Georgetown, Charleston, Pocotelago, Coosahatchee, and Savannah. Coosahatchee, being central, could communicate with either Charleston or Savannah in two or three hours by railroad, and in case of an attack, they could support each other. The positions between Coosahatchee and Savannah, and those between the former and Charleston, could be reinforced from the positions contiguous to them. There was thus a defensive relation throughout the entire line, extending from Winyaw Bay to the mouth of St. Mary's River in Georgia, a distance of about 200 miles. These detached and supporting works covered a most important agricultural country, and sufficed to defend it from the smaller expeditions made against that region. About March 1st, the gunboats of the enemy entered the Savannah River by way of the channel leading from Hilton Head. Our naval force was too weak to dispute the possession with them, and they thus cut off the communication of Fort Pulaski with the city. Soon after, the enemy landed a force under General Gilmore on the opposite side of the fort. By April 1st, they had powerful batteries in position, and on that day opened fire on the fort. Having no hope of succor, Fort Pulaski, after striking a blow for honor, surrendered with about 500 men. End, quote. end of Section 5. Section 6 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 20. Advance of General McClellan toward Centerville, his report. Our forces ordered to the peninsula. Situation at Yorktown. Siege by General McClellan. General Johnston assigned to command. His recommendation. Attack on General Magruder at Yorktown. Movements of McClellan. The Virginia. General Johnston retires. Delay at Norfolk. Before Williamsburg. Remark of Hancock. 
Retreat up the peninsula. Subterra shells used. Evacuation of Norfolk. Its occupation by the enemy. In a previous chapter, the retreat of our army from Centerville has been described, and reference has been made to the anticipation of the commanding general, J. E. Johnston, that the enemy would soon advance to attack that position. Since the close of the war, we have gained information, not at that time to us attainable, which shows that, as early as the 31st of January, 1862, the commanding general of the enemy's forces presented to his president an argument against that line of operations, setting forth the advantages of a movement by water transports down the Chesapeake into the Rappahannock, and that in the following February, by the direction of President Lincoln, General McClellan held a council with 12 of the generals of that army who decided in favor of the movement by way of Annapolis, and thence to the Rappahannock, to which their president gave his assent. When General McClellan, then in the city of Washington, heard that our army had retired, he ordered a general movement of his troops toward the position we had lately occupied. A detachment was sent to make reconnaissance as far as the line of the Rappahannock, by which it was ascertained that our troops had passed beyond that river. His account of this movement was given in the following report. Quote, Fairfax Courthouse, March 11, 1862, 8.30 p.m. I have just returned from a ride of more than 40 miles, have examined Centerville, Union Mills, Blackburn's Ford, etc. The rebels have left all their positions, and from the information obtained during our ride today, I am satisfied that they have fallen behind the Rapidan, holding Fredericksburg and Gordonsville. Their movement from here was very sudden. They left many wagons, some caissons, clothing, ammunition, personal baggage, etc. Their winter quarters were admirably constructed, many not yet quite finished. The works at Centerville are formidable, more so than at Manassas. Except the turnpike, the roads are horrible, the country entirely stripped of forage and provisions. Having fully consulted with General McDowell, I propose occupying Manassas with a portion of Banks's command, and then at once throwing all forces I can concentrate upon the line agreed upon last week. The monitor justifies this course. I telegraphed this morning to have the transports brought to Washington to start from there. I presume you will approve this course. Circumstances may keep me out here some little time longer. G. B. McClellan, Major General. Honorable E. M. Stanton, Secretary of War. End quote. The reference to the monitor is to be explained by the condition previously made in connection with the proposition of going to Fortress Monroe that the Merrimack, our Virginia, should first be neutralized. The order to bring the transports to Washington was due to the fact that they had not dared to run by our batteries on the Potomac, and intended to avoid them by going to Annapolis for embarkation. The withdrawal of our batteries from the banks of the Potomac had removed the objection to going down that river, and the withdrawal of our forces across the Rappahannock was fatal to the program of landing on that river and marching to Richmond before our forces could be in position to resist an attack on the capital. Notwithstanding the assurance given that the destruction of railroads and bridges proved that our army could not intend to advance, apprehension was still entertained of an attack upon Washington. As soon as we ascertained that the enemy was concentrating his forces at Fortress Monroe to advance upon our capital by that line of approach, all our disposable force was ordered to the peninsula between the James and York Rivers to the support of General John B. Magruder, who, with a force of seven to 8,000 men, had, by availing himself of the Warwick River, a small stream which runs through a low, marshy country from near Yorktown to the James River, constructed an entrenched line across the peninsula, and with equal skill and intrepidity, had thus far successfully checked every attempt to break it, though the enemy was vastly superior in numbers to the troops under General Magruder's command. Having a force entirely inadequate to occupy and defend the whole line, over thirteen miles long, he built dams in the Warwick River, so as to form pools, across which the enemy, without bridges, could not pass and posted detachments at each dam to prevent the use of them by attacking columns of the enemy. To defend the left of his line, where the stream became too small to present a serious obstacle to the passage of troops, redoubts were constructed, with curtains connecting them. Between Yorktown and Gloucester Point, on the opposite shore, 
the york river is contracted to less than a mile in width and general magruder had constructed batteries at both places which by their crossfire presented a formidable obstacle to the ascent of ordinary vessels the fortifications at norfolk and the navy yard together with batteries at sewell's point and craney island in conjunction with the navy offered means of defense against any attempt to land troops on the south side of james river after the first trial of strength with our virginia there had been an evident disinclination on the part of the enemy's vessels to encounter her so that as long as she floated the deep water of the roads and mouth of james river was not likely to be invaded by ships of war as a second line of defense a system of detached works had been constructed by general magruder near to williamsburg where the width of the peninsula available for the passage of troops was only three or four miles the advantage thus secured to his forces if they should be compelled to retreat will be readily appreciated i am not aware that torpedoes had been placed in york river to prevent the entrance of the enemy's vessels indeed at that time but little progress had been made in the development of that means of harbor and river defense general rains as will be seen hereafter had matured his invention of sensitive fuse primers for subterra shells and proposed their use for floating torpedoes subsequently he did much to advance knowledge in regard to making torpedoes efficient against the enemy's vessels such was the condition of the virginia peninsula between the york and james rivers when general mcclellan embarked the mass of the army he commanded in northern virginia and proceeded to fortress monroe and when the greater part of our army under the command of general j e johnston was directed to move for the purpose of counteracting this new plan of the enemy early in april general mcclellan had landed about one hundred thousand men at or near fortress monroe at this time general magruder occupied the lower peninsula with his force of seven or eight thousand men marshes creeks and dense wood gave to that position such advantage that in his report made at a subsequent period he expressed the belief that with twenty or twenty five thousand men he could have held it against any supposable attack when mcclellan advanced with his immense army magruder fell back to the line of warwick river which has been imperfectly described and there checked the enemy and the vast army of invasion repulsed in several assaults by the most heroic conduct of our troops commenced a siege by regular approaches after the first advance of the enemy general magruder was reinforced by some troops from the south side of james river and general wilcox's brigade which had been previously detached from the army under general johnston on the ninth of april general magruder's command thus reinforced amounted to about twelve thousand on that day general early joined with his division from the army of northern virginia it had gone by rail to richmond and thence down the york and james rivers in vessels towed by tugs except the trains and artillery which moved by land this division had about eight thousand officers and men for duty general magruder's force was thus increased to about twenty thousand this was the first detachment from the army of northern virginia which arrived on the peninsula general mcclellan in a cipher dispatch of the seventh of april two days previous informed secretary stanton that prisoners stated that general j e wharton no doubt johnston had the day before arrived in yorktown with strong reinforcements and adds quote, it seems clear that i shall have the whole force of the enemy on my hands probably not less than one hundred thousand men and possibly more when my present command all joins i shall have about eighty five thousand men for duty from which a large force must be taken for guards escort etc after some remarks about the strength of our entrenchments and his conviction that the great battle which would decide the existing contest would be fought there he urges as necessary for his success that there should be an attack on the rear of gloucester point and adds quote, my present strength will not admit of a detachment for this purpose without materially impairing the efficiency of this column commodore goldsborough thinks the work too strong for his available vessels unless i can turn gloucester End quote. in the cipher dispatch of the seventh of april to president lincoln general mcclellan acknowledges a telegram of the previous day and adds quote, in reply i have the honor to state that my entire force for duty only amounts to about eighty five thousand men End quote. 
he then mentions the fact that general wool's command is not under his orders etc subsequent correspondence clearly shows that general mcclellan would not risk making a detachment from his army to turn the position at gloucester point and that the navy would not attempt to operate against the battery at that place he therefore urgently pressed for reinforcements to act on the north side of york river general magruder had up to and after the time of receiving the reinforcements before mentioned worked day and night in constructing and strengthening his defenses his small force had been assisted in this work by a considerable body of negro laborers and an active participant and competent judge general early thus wrote of his conduct quote, the assuming and maintaining this line by magruder with his small force in the face of such overwhelming odds was one of the boldest exploits ever performed by a military commander and he had so maneuvered his troops by displaying them rapidly at different points as to produce the impression on his opponent that he had a large army end quote. as soon as it was definitely ascertained that general mcclellan with his main army was on the peninsula general j e johnston was assigned to the command of the department of the peninsula and norfolk and directed to proceed thither to examine the condition of affairs there after spending a day on general magruder's defensive line he returned to richmond and recommended the abandonment of the peninsula and that we should take a defensive position nearer to richmond the question was postponed and an appointment made for its discussion to which i proposed to invite the secretary of war general randolph and general lee then stationed in richmond and in general charge of army operations general johnston asked that he might invite general longstreet and general g w smith to be present to which i assented at this meeting general johnston announced his plan to be the withdrawal of general magruder's troops from the peninsula and of general huger's from norfolk to be united with the main body of the army of northern virginia and the withdrawal of the troops from south carolina and georgia his belief being that general magruder's line was indefensible with the forces we could concentrate there that the batteries at gloucester point could not be maintained that the enemy would turn the position at yorktown by ascending the york river if the defensive line there should possibly be maintained to this plan the secretary of war objected because the navy yard at norfolk offered our best if not our only opportunity to construct in any short time gunboats for coastwise and harbor defense general lee always bold in his views and unusually sagacious in penetrating the designs of the enemy insisted that the peninsula offered great advantages to a smaller force in resisting a numerically superior assailant and in the comprehensive view which he usually took of the necessities of other places than the one where he chanced to be objected to withdrawing the troops from south carolina and georgia as involving the probable capture of charleston and savannah by recent service in that section he was well informed as to the condition of those important ports general g w smith as well as i remember was in full accord with general johnston and general longstreet partially so after hearing fully the views of the several officers named i decided to resist the enemy on the peninsula and with the aid of the navy to hold norfolk and keep the command of the james river as long as possible arrangements were made with such force as our means permitted to occupy the country north of richmond and the shenandoah valley and with the rest of general johnston's command to make a junction with general magruder to resist the enemy's forces on the peninsula though general j e johnston did not agree with this decision he did not ask to be relieved and i had no wish to separate him from the troops with whom he was so intimately acquainted and whose confidence i believed he deservedly possessed to recur to general magruder soon after the landing of the enemy skirmishes commenced with our forces and the first vigorous attempt was made to break the line at lee's mills where there were some newly constructed defenses the enemy was so signally repulsed that he described them as very strong works and thereafter commenced the construction of parallels and regular approaches having an exaggerated idea as well of the number of our troops as of the strength of our works at that time general magruder in his report notices a serious attempt to break his line of the warwick at dam number one about the centre of the line and its weakest point opening with a heavy bombardment at nine in the morning which continued until three p m heavy masses of infantry then commenced to deploy 
and with musketry fire were thrown forward to storm our six-pounder battery which had been effectively used and was the only artillery we had there in position a portion of the column charged across the dam but brigadier general howell cobb met the attack with great firmness the enemy was driven with a bayonet from some of our rifle pits of which he had gained possession and the assaulting column recoiled with loss from the steady fire of our troops the enemy's skirmishers pressed closely in front of the redoubts on the left of our line and with their long-range rifles had a decided advantage over our men armed with smoothbore muskets in addition to the rifle pits they dug they were covered by a dwelling house and a large peach orchard which extended to within a few hundred yards of our works on the eleventh of april general magruder ordered sorties to be made from all the main points of his line general wilcox sent out a detachment from wind's mill which encountered the advance of the enemy in his front and drove it back to the main line later in the day general early sent out from redoubt number five colonel ward's florida regiment and the second mississippi battalion under colonel taylor they drove the sharpshooters from their rifle pits and pursued them to the main road from warwick courthouse encountered a battery posted at an earthwork and compelled it precipitately to retire on the approach of a large force of the enemy's infantry colonel ward returned to our works after having set fire to the dwelling house above mentioned these affairs developed the fact that the enemy was in strong force both in front of wind's mill and redoubts numbers four and five on the next night general early sent out colonel terry's virginia regiment to cut down the peach orchard and burn the rest of the houses which had afforded shelter to the assailants and on the succeeding night colonel mcrae with his north carolina regiment went farther to the front and felled the cedars along the main road which partially hid the enemy's movements and subsequently our men were not annoyed by the sharpshooters about the middle of april a further reinforcement of two divisions from the army of northern virginia was added to our forces on the peninsula which amounted when general johnston assumed command to something over fifty thousand the work of strengthening the defences was still continued on the sixteenth of april an assault was made on our line to the right of yorktown which was repulsed with heavy loss to the enemy and such serious discomfiture that henceforward his plan seemed to be to rely upon bombardment for which numerous batteries were prepared the views of the enemy as revealed by the testimony before the committee on the conduct of the war were that he could gain possession of gloucester point only by reinforcements operating on the north side of york river or by the previous reduction of yorktown in addition to the answer given by general mcclellan i quote from the testimony of general keyes he said Quote, the possession of gloucester point by the enemy retarded the taking of yorktown and it also enabled the enemy to close the river at that point end quote, and added quote, gloucester must have fallen upon our getting possession of yorktown and the york river would then have been open end quote. with the knowledge possessed by us general mcclellan certainly might have sent a detachment from his army which after crossing the york river could have turned the position at gloucester point and have overcome our small garrison at that place but this is but one of the frequent examples of war in which the immunity of one army is derived from the mistakes of the other an opinion has existed among some of our best informed officers that franklin's division was kept on transports for the purpose of landing on the north side of york river to capture our battery at gloucester point and thus open the way to turn our position by ascending the york river upon the authority of swinton the fairest and most careful of the northern writers on the war it appears that franklin's division had disembarked before the evacuation of yorktown and upon the authority of the prince de joinville serving on the staff of general mcclellan it appears that his commanding general was not willing to entrust that service to a single division and plaintively describes the effect produced by the refusal of president lincoln to send mcdowell's corps to reinforce mcclellan he writes thus Quote, the news was received by the federal army with dissatisfaction although the majority could not then foresee the deplorable consequences of an act performed it must be supposed with no evil intention but with inconceivable recklessness it was the mainspring removed from a great work already begun it deranged everything among the divisions of the corps of mcdowell there was one that of franklin which was regretted more than all the rest he the commander-in-chief 
held it in great esteem, and earnestly demanded its restoration. It was sent back to him without any explanation, in the same manner as it had been withheld. This splendid division, 11,000 strong, arrived, and for a moment the commander thought of entrusting to it alone the storming of Gloucester, but the idea was abandoned. End quote. On the 28th of April, General J. E. Johnston wrote to Flag Officer Tatnall, commanding the naval forces in the James River, requesting him, if practicable, to proceed with the Virginia to York River for the purpose of destroying the enemy's transports, to which Commodore Tatnall replied that it could only be done in daylight, when he would be exposed to the fire of the forts and have to contend with the squadron of men of war stationed below them, and that, if this should be safely done, according to the information derived from the pilots, it would not be possible for the Virginia to reach the enemy's transports at Pocosin, while the withdrawal of the Virginia would be to abandon the defense of Norfolk, and to remove the obstacles she opposed to, quote, the enemy's operations in the James River, end quote. Meanwhile, the brilliant movements of the intrepid Jackson created such apprehension of an attack upon Washington City by the army of the Shenandoah, that President Lincoln refused the repeated requests of General McClellan to send him McDowell's Corps to operate on the north side of the York River against our battery at Gloucester Point. On the 28th of the following June, Mr. Lincoln, noticing what he regarded as ungenerous complaint, wrote to General McClellan, quote, If you have had a drawn battle or a repulse, it is the price we pay for the enemy not being in Washington. We protected Washington and the enemy concentrated on you." End quote. The month of April was cold and rainy, and our men poorly provided with shelter, and with only the plainest rations. Yet under all these discomforts they steadily labored to perfect the defenses, and, when they were not on the front line, were constantly employed in making traverses and impalments in the rear. Whether General McClellan, under the pressure from Washington, would have made an early assault, footnote, on April 6, 1862, President Lincoln wrote to General McClellan as follows, quote, You now have over 100,000 troops with you, independent of General Wool's command. I think you had better break the enemy's line from Yorktown to Warwick River at once. They will probably use time as advantageously as you can. End quote. Report on the Conduct of the War, pages 319 and 320. End of footnote or have adhered to the policy of regular approaches, and relying on his superiority in artillery, have waited to batter our earthworks in breach, and whether all which had been done, or which it was practicable under the circumstances to do, to strengthen the main line, would have made it sufficiently strong to resist the threatened bombardment, is questionable, and how soon that bombardment would have commenced is now indeterminate. A telegram from President Lincoln to General McClellan is suggestive on this point, it reads thus, quote, Washington, May 1st, 1862. Your call for parrot guns from Washington alarms me, chiefly because it argues indefinite procrastination. Is anything to be done? End quote. By the following telegram, sent by me to General J. E. Johnston, commanding at Yorktown, the contents of that which I had received from him, and of which I am not now possessed, will be readily inferred. Quote, Richmond, Virginia, May 1st, 1862. General J. E. Johnston, Yorktown, Virginia. Accepting your conclusion that you must soon retire, arrangements are commenced for the abandonment of the Navy Yard and removal of public property, both from Norfolk and Peninsula. Your announcement today that you would withdraw tomorrow night takes us by surprise and must involve enormous losses, including unfinished gunboats. Will the safety of your army allow more time? Jefferson Davis, end quote. My next step was to request the Secretary of War, General Randolph, and the Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Mallory, to proceed to Yorktown and Norfolk to see whether the evacuation could not be postponed, and to make all practicable arrangements to remove the machinery, material, ordnance, and supplies for future use. At the suggestion of the Secretary of War, I agreed that he should first go with the Secretary of the Navy to Norfolk and thence pass over to Yorktown. On the next morning they left for Norfolk. General Randolph, in his testimony before a joint special committee of the Confederate Congress, said, quote, A few hours after we arrived in Norfolk, an officer from General Johnston's army made his appearance, 
with an order for General Huger to evacuate Norfolk immediately. As that would have involved heavy losses in stores, munitions, and arms, I took the responsibility of giving General Huger a written order to delay the evacuation until he could remove such stores, munitions, and arms as could be carried off. Mr. Mallory was with me, and gave similar instructions to the Commandant of the Navy Yard. The evacuation was delayed for about a week. When the Council of War met, the conference with the President heretofore referred to, it was supposed that, if the enemy assaulted our army at the Warwick River line, we should defeat them, but that, if instead of assaulting they made regular approaches to either flank of the line, and took advantage of their great superiority of heavy artillery, the probability would be that one flank or both of the army would be uncovered, and thus the enemy, ascending the York and James Rivers in transports, could turn the flank of the army and compel it to retreat. They made regular approaches, mounted the largest size guns, such as we could not compete with, and made the position of Yorktown untenable. Nearly all of our heavy rifled guns burst during the siege. The remainder of the heavy guns were in the water batteries, end quote, etc. The permanent occupation of Norfolk, after our army withdrew from the lower peninsula and the enemy possessed it, was so obviously impossible as not to require explanation. But, while the enemy was engaged in the pursuit of our retreating columns, it was deemed justifiable to delay the evacuation of Norfolk for the purposes indicated in the above answer of the Secretary of War. The result justified the decision. The order for the withdrawal of the army from the line of the Warwick River on the night of the 2nd of April was delayed until the next night, because, as I have been informed, some of the troops were not ready to move. Heavy cannonading, both on the night of the 2nd and 3rd, concealed the fact of the purpose to withdraw, and the evacuation was made so successfully, as appears by the testimony before the United States Congressional Committee on the conduct of the war, that the enemy was surprised the next morning to find the lines unoccupied. The loss of public property, as was anticipated, was great. The steamboats expected for its transportation not having arrived before the evacuation was made. From a narrative by General Early, I make the following extract. Quote, a very valuable part of the property so lost, and which we stood much in need of, consisted of a very large number of picks and spades, many of them entirely new. All of our heavy guns, including some recently arrived and not mounted, together with a good deal of ammunition, piled up on the wharf, had to be left behind. End quote. The land transportation was quite deficient. General Magruder's troops had scarcely any, and others of the more recent organizations were in a like condition. As no supplies had been accumulated at Williamsburg, this want of transportation would necessarily involve want of rations in the event of delays on the retreat. At Williamsburg, about 12 miles from Yorktown, General Magruder, as has been mentioned, had constructed a line of detached works. The largest of these, Fort Magruder, was constructed at a point a short distance beyond where the Lees Mill and Yorktown roads united, and where the enemy, in his pursuit, first encountered our retiring forces, and were promptly repulsed. General Magruder, whose arduous service and long exposure on the peninsula has been noticed, was compelled by illness to leave his division. His absence at this moment was the more to be regretted, as it appears that the positions of the redoubts he had constructed were not all known to the commanding general and some of them being unoccupied were seized by the enemy, and held subsequently to our disadvantage. General McClellan, in his official report from, quote, Bivouac in front of Williamsburg, May 5, 1862, end quote, says, quote, General Hancock has taken two redoubts and repulsed Early's rebel brigade by a real charge of the bayonet, taking one colonel and 150 other prisoners, end quote, etc., as this is selected for the brilliant event in the affair before Williamsburg, I will extract fully from General Early's report. Quote, Lynchburg, June 9, 1862. In accordance with orders received the evening before, my brigade was in readiness to take up the line of march from its camp west of Williamsburg toward Richmond on the 5th of May. I was directed by Major General D. H. Hill not to move my infantry, and in a short time I was ordered by him to march back and report with my regiments to Major General Longstreet at Williamsburg. Between 3 and 4 o'clock p.m., 
I was ordered by General Longstreet to move to the support of Brigadier General Anderson of his division, at or near Fort Magruder. Before my command had proceeded far toward its destination, I received an order from General Longstreet to send him two regiments. With the remainder of my command being my brigade proper, I proceeded, as near as practicable, to the position designated by General Longstreet on the left and rear of Fort Magruder. In a short time, Major General Hill arrived, and, having ascertained that the enemy had a battery in front of us, he informed me that he wished me to attack and capture the battery with my brigade, but before doing so, he must see General Longstreet on the subject. General Hill being on the right and accompanying the brigade, I placed myself on the left with the 24th Virginia Regiment for the purpose of directing its movements, as I was satisfied from the sound of the enemy's guns that this regiment would come directly on the battery. In an open field, in view of Fort Magruder, at the end farthest from the fort, the enemy had taken position with a battery of six pieces, supported by a brigade of infantry under the command of Brigadier General Hancock. In this field were two or three redoubts, previously built by our troops, of one, at least, of which the enemy had possession, his artillery being posted in front of it, near some farmhouses, and supported by a body of infantry, the balance of the infantry being in the redoubt, and in the edge of the woods close by. The 24th Virginia Regiment, as I had anticipated, came directly upon the battery. This regiment, without pausing or wavering, charged upon the enemy under a heavy fire, and drove back his guns, and the infantry supporting them, to the cover of the redoubt. I sent orders to the other regiments to advance. These orders were anticipated by Colonel McRae of the 5th North Carolina Regiment, who was on the extreme right of my brigade, and marched down to the support of the 24th, traversing the whole front that should have been occupied by the other two regiments." End quote. General Early, having received a severe wound, soon after the 24th Virginia Regiment charged the battery, was compelled by exhaustion from loss of blood and intense pain to leave the field, just as the 5th North Carolina Regiment, led by its gallant colonel, charged on the enemy's artillery and infantry. Of that charge, General Early writes, quote, This North Carolina Regiment, in conjunction with the 24th Virginia Regiment, made an attack upon the vastly superior forces of the enemy, which, for its gallantry, is unsurpassed in the annals of warfare. Their conduct was such as to elicit from the enemy himself the highest praise. End quote. This refers to the chivalric remark made by General Hancock to Dr. Cullen, left in charge of our wounded, viz. Quote, the 5th North Carolina and 24th Virginia deserve to have the word immortal inscribed on their banners. End quote. Colonel McRae, who succeeded to the command after General Early retired, states in his report that he sent to General Hill for reinforcements in order to advance, and in reply received an order to retire, that his men were holding the enemy to his shelter in such way that they were not at all suffering. But when he commenced retiring, the enemy rose and fired upon his men, doing the greatest damage that was done. Some of them obliqued too far to the right in going back, and met a regiment of the enemy concealed in the woods, and were thus captured. General Early writes, quote, the two regiments that united in the assault were not repulsed at all. They drove the enemy to the cover of the redoubt and the shelter of the woods near it, where he was held at bay by my two regiments, which had suffered comparatively little at that time. End quote. He confidently expresses the opinion that, had his attack been supported promptly and vigorously, the enemy's force there engaged must have been captured, as it had crossed over to that point on a narrow mill dam and had only that way to escape. The claim of the enemy to have achieved a victory at Williamsburg is refuted by the fact that our troops remained in possession of the field during the night, and retired the next morning to follow up the retreat, which was only interrupted by the necessity of checking the enemy until our trains could proceed far enough to be out of danger. The fact of our wounded being left at Williamsburg was only due to our want of ambulances in which to remove them. Though General McClellan at this time estimated our force as probably greater a good deal than his own, the fact is, it was numerically less than half the number he had for duty. Severe exposure and fatigue must, by sickness, have diminished our force more than it was increased by absentees returning to duty after the middle of April, so that at the end of the month the number was probably less than 50,000 present for duty. 
General McClellan's report on the 30th of April, 1862, as shown by the certified statement, gives the aggregate present for duty at 112,392. When the Confederates evacuated Yorktown, General Franklin's division had just been disembarked from the transports. It was re-embarked and started on the morning of the 6th up the York River. After the Battle of Williamsburg, our army continued its retreat up the peninsula. Here, for the first time, sub-terra shells were employed to check a marching column. The event is thus described by General Rains, the inventor. Quote, on the day we left Williamsburg after the battle, we worked hard to get our artillery and some we had captured over the sloughs about four miles distant. On account of the tortuous course of the road, we could not bring a single gun to bear upon the enemy who were pursuing us and shelling the road as they advanced. Fortunately, we found in a mud hole a broken down ammunition wagon containing five loaded shells. Four of these, armed with a sensitive fuse primer, were planted in our rear, near some trees cut down as obstructions to the road. A body of the enemy's cavalry came upon these subterra shells, and they exploded with terrific effect. The force behind halted for three days, and finally turned off from the road, doubtless under the apprehension that it was mined throughout. Thus our rear was relieved of the enemy. No soldier will march over mined land, and a corps of sappers, each man having two ten-inch shells, two primers, and a mule to carry them, could stop any army. End quote. Accounts, contemporaneously published at the North, represent the terror inspired by these shells, extravagantly describe the number of them, and speak of the necessity of leaving the road to avoid them. The next morning, after the Battle of the Fifth at Williamsburg, Longstreet's and D. H. Hill's divisions, being those there engaged, followed in the line of retreat, Stuart's cavalry moving after them. They marched that day about twelve miles. In the meantime, Franklin's division had gone up the York River and landed a short distance below West Point, on the south side of York River, and moved into a thick wood in the direction of the New Kent Road, thus threatening the flank of our line of march. Two brigades of General G. W. Smith's division, Hampton's and Hood's, were detached under the command of General Whiting, to dislodge the enemy, which they did after a short conflict, driving him through the wood to the protection of his gunboats in York River. On the next morning, the rear divisions joined those in advance at Barhamsville, and the retreat of the whole army was resumed, Smith's and Magruder's divisions moving by the New Kent Courthouse to the Baltimore Crossroads, and Longstreet's and Hills to the Long Bridge, where the whole army remained in line, facing to the east for five days the retreat had been successfully conducted. In the principal action, that at Williamsburg, our forces, after General Hill's division had been brought back to the support of General Longstreet, did not exceed, probably was not equal to, one half that of the enemy. Yet, as has been seen, the position was held as long as was necessary for the removal of our trains, and our troops slept upon the field of battle. The loss of the enemy greatly exceeded our own, which was about 1,200 while General Hooker, commanding one division of the Federal Army, in his testimony stated the loss in his division to have been 1,700. Among the gallant and much regretted of those lost by us was Colonel Ward of Florida, whose conduct at Yorktown has been previously noticed, and of whom General Early, in his report of the Battle of Williamsburg, says, quote, On the list of the killed in the 2nd Florida Regiment is found the name of its colonel, George T. Ward, as true a gentleman and as gallant a soldier as has drawn a sword in this war, and whose conduct under fire it was my fortune to witness on another occasion. His loss to his regiment, to his state, and to the Confederacy cannot be easily compensated. End quote. Colonel Ward, with his regiment, had been detached from General Early's command in the early part of the action. I regret that I have not access to the report of General Longstreet, where, no doubt, may also be found due notice of Colonel Christopher Mott, whom I knew personally. In his youth he served in the regiment commanded by me during the war with Mexico. He was brave, cheerful, prompt, and equal to every trial to which he was subjected, giving early promise of high soldierly capacity. He afterward held various places of honor and trust in civil life, and there were many in Mississippi who, like myself, deeply lamented his death in the height of his usefulness. General Huger, 
commanding at Norfolk, and Captain Lee, commanding the Navy Yard, by the authority of the Secretaries of War and Navy, delayed the evacuation of both, as stated by General Randolph, Secretary of War, for about a week after General Johnston sent orders to General Huge to leave immediately. While he was employed in removing the valuable stores and machinery, as we learn from the work of the Comte de Paris, President Lincoln and his Secretary of War arrived at Fortress Monroe, and on the 8th of May, an expedition against Norfolk by the troops under General Wool was contemplated. He writes, quote, Being apprised by the columns of smoke which rose on the horizon that the propitious moment had arrived, Wool proposed to the President to undertake an expedition against Norfolk. Max Weber's brigade was speedily embarked, and to protect his descent, Commodore Goldsboro's fleet was ordered to escort it. But the Confederate batteries, not yet having been abandoned, fired a few shots in reply, while the Virginia, which, since the wounding of the brave Buchanan, had been commanded by Commodore Tatnall, showed her formidable shell, and the expedition was countermanded. Two more days were consumed in waiting. Finally, on the morning of the 10th, Weber disembarked east of Sewell's Point. This time the enemy's artillery was silent. There was found an entrenched camp, mounting a few guns, but absolutely deserted. General Wool reached the city of Norfolk, which had been given up to its peaceful inhabitants the day previous, and hastened to place a military governor there. End quote. Reposing on these cheaply won laurels, the expedition returned to Fortress Monroe, leaving Brigadier General Veeley with some troops brought from the north side of the river to hold the place. The navy yard and workshops had been set on fire before our troops withdrew, so as to leave little to the enemy save the glory of capturing an undefended town. The troops at Fortress Monroe were numerically superior to the command of General Huge, and could have been readily combined with the forces at and about Roanoke Island for a forward movement on the south side of the James River. In view of this probability, General Huge, with the main part of his force, was halted for a time at Petersburg. But, as soon as it was ascertained that no preparations were being made by the enemy for that campaign, so palpably advantageous to him, General Huge's troops were moved to the north side of the James River to make a junction with the army of General Johnston. Previously, detachments had been sent from the force withdrawn from Norfolk to strengthen the command of Brigadier General J.B. Anderson, who was placed in observation before General McDowell, then at Fredericksburg, threatening to advance with a force four or five times as great as that under General Anderson, and another detachment had been sent to the aid of Brigadier General Branch, who, with his brigade, had recently been brought up from North Carolina and sent forward to Gordonsville for the like purpose as that for which General Anderson was placed near Fredericksburg. End of section 6. Section 7 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 21. A new phase to our military problem. General Johnston's position. Defenses of James River. Attack on Fort Drury. Johnston crosses the Chickahominy. Position of McClellan. Position of McDowell. Strength of opposing forces. Jackson's expedition down the Shenandoah Valley. Panic at Washington and the North. Movements to intercept Jackson. His rapid movements. Repulses Fremont. Advance of Shields. Fall of Ashby. Port Republic, Battle of. Results of this campaign. The withdrawal of our army to the Chickahominy, the abandonment of Norfolk, the destruction of the Virginia, and opening of the Lower James River, together with the fact that McClellan's army, by changing his base to the head of York River, was in a position to cover the approach to Washington, and thus to remove the objections which had been made to sending the large force retained for the defense of that city to make a junction with McClellan, all combined to give a new phase to our military problem. Soon after, General Johnston took position on the north side of the Chickahominy. Accompanied by General Lee, 
I rode out to his headquarters in the field, in order that, by conversation with him, we might better understand his plans and expectations. He came in after we arrived, saying that he had been riding around his lines to see how his position could be improved. A long conversation followed, which was so inconclusive that it lasted until late in the night, so late that we remained until the next morning. As we rode back to Richmond, reference was naturally made to the conversation of the previous evening and night, when General Lee confessed himself, as I was, unable to draw from it any more definite purpose than that the policy was to improve his position as far as practicable and wait for the enemy to leave his gunboats, so that an opportunity might be offered to meet him on the land. In consequence of the opening of the James River to the enemy's fleet, the attempts to utilize this channel for transportation so as to approach directly to Richmond soon followed. We had then no defenses on the James River below Drury's Bluff, about seven miles distant from Richmond. There an earthwork had been constructed and provided with an armament of four guns. Rifle pits had been made in front of the fort, and obstructions had been placed in the river by driving piles and sinking some vessels. The crew of the Virginia, after her destruction, had been sent to this fort, which was then in charge of Commander Farrand, Confederate States Navy. On the 15th of April, the enemy's fleet of five ships of war, among the number their much vaunted monitor, took position and opened fire upon the fort between seven and eight o'clock. Our small vessel, the Patrick Henry, was lying above the obstruction, and cooperated with the fort in its defense. The monitor and ironclad Galena steamed up to about six hundred yards distance. The others, wooden vessels, were kept at long range. The armor of the flagship Galena was badly injured, and many of the crew killed or wounded. The monitor was struck repeatedly, but the shot only bent her plates. At about eleven o'clock, the fleet abandoned the attack, returning discomfited whence they came. The commander of the monitor, Lieutenant Jeffers, in his report, says that, quote, the action was most gallantly fought against great odds, and with the usual effect against earthworks, end quote. He adds, quote, it was impossible to reduce such works except with the aid of a land force, end quote. The enemy, in their reports, recognized the efficiency of our fire by both artillery and riflemen, the sincerity of which was made manifest in the failure to renew the attempt. The small garrison at Fort Drury, only adequate to the service it had performed, that of repelling an attempt by the fleet to pass up James River, was quite insufficient to prevent the enemy from landing below the fort, or to resist an attack by infantry. To guard against its sudden capture by such means, the garrison was increased by the addition of Bryan's regiment of Georgia rifles. After the repulse of the enemy's gunboats at Drury's Bluff, I wrote to General Johnston a letter to be handed to him by my aide, Colonel G. W. C. Lee, an officer of the highest intelligence and reputation, referring to him for full information in regard to the affair at Drury's Bluff, as well as to the positions and strength of our forces on the south side of the James River. After some speculations on the probable course of the enemy and expressions of confidence, I informed the general that my aide would communicate freely to him and bring back to me any information with which he might be entrusted. Not receiving any definite reply, I soon thereafter rode out to visit General Johnston at his headquarters and was surprised in the suburbs of Richmond, viz. on the other side of Gillis's Creek, to meet a portion of light artillery and to learn that the whole army had crossed the Chickahominy. General Johnston's explanation to this, to me, unexpected movement was that he thought the water of the Chickahominy unhealthy, and had directed the troops to cross and halt at the first good water on the southern side, which he supposed would be found near to the river. He also adverted to the advantage of having the river in front rather than in the rear of him, an advantage certainly obvious enough if the line was to be near to it on either of its banks. The considerations which induced General McClellan to make his base on the York River had at least partly ceased to exist. From the corps for which he had so persistently applied, he had received the division which he most valued, and the destruction of the Virginia had left the James River open to his fleet and transports as far up as Drury's Bluff, and the withdrawal of General Johnston across the Chickahominy made it quite practicable for him to transfer his army to the James River the south side of which had then but weak defences, and thus by a short march to gain more than all the advantages which, at a later period of the war, General Grant obtained 
at the sacrifice of a hecatomb of soldiers referring again to the work of the comte de paris who may be better authority in regard to what occurred in the army of the enemy than when he writes about confederate affairs it appears that this change of base was considered and not adopted because of general mcclellan's continued desire to have mcdowell's corps with him the count states quote, the james river which had been closed until then by the presence of the virginia as york river had been by the cannon of yorktown was opened by the destruction of that ship just as york river had been by the evacuation of the confederate fortress but it was only open as far as drury's bluff in order to overcome this last obstacle interposed between richmond and the federal gunboats the support of the land forces was necessary on the nineteenth of may commodore goldsborough had a conference with general mcclellan regarding the means to be employed for removing that obstacle general mcclellan as we have stated above might have continued to follow the railway line and preserved his depots at white house on the pamunkey but he could also now go to re-establish his base of operations on james river which the virginia had hitherto prevented him from doing by crossing the chickahominy at bottoms bridge and some other fords situated lower down could have reached the borders of the james in two or three days this flank march effected at a sufficient distance from the enemy and covered by a few demonstrations along the upper chickahominy offered him great advantages without involving any risk if mcclellan could have foreseen how deceptive were the promises of reinforcement made to him at the time he would undoubtedly have declined the uncertain support of mcdowell to carry out the plan of campaign which offered the best chances of success with the troops which were absolutely at his disposal end quote. without feeling under any obligations for kind intentions on the part of the government of the north it was fortunate for us that it did as its friend the comte de paris represents deceive general mcclellan and prevent him from moving to the south side of the james river so as not only to secure the cooperation of his gunboats in an attack upon richmond but to make his assault on the side least prepared for resistance and where it would have been quite possible to cut our line of communication with the more southern states on which we chiefly depended for supplies and reinforcements it is hardly just to treat the failure to fulfill the assurance given by president lincoln about reinforcements as deceptive promises for as will be seen the operations in the valley by general jackson who there exhibited a rapidity of movement equal to the unyielding tenacity which had in the first great battle won for him the familiar name stonewall had created such an alarm in washington as if it had been better founded would have justified the refusal to diminish the force held for the protection of their capital indeed our cavalry in observation near fredericksburg reported that on the twenty fourth mcdowell's troops started southward but general stuart found that night that they were returning this indicated that the anticipated junction was not to be made and of this the prince of joinville writes quote, it needed only an effort of the will the two armies were united and in the possession of richmond certain alas this effort was not made i cannot recall those fatal moments without a real sinking of the heart End quote. general mcclellan in his testimony december tenth eighteen sixty two before the court-martial in the case of general mcdowell said quote, i have no doubt for it has ever been my opinion that the army of the potomac would have taken richmond had not the corps of general mcdowell been separated from it it is also my opinion that had the command of general mcdowell joined the army of the potomac in the month of may by the way of hanover courthouse from fredericksburg we would have had richmond within a week after the junction end quote let us first inquire what was the size of this army so crippled for want of reinforcement and then what the strength of that to which it was opposed on the thirtieth of april eighteen sixty two the official report of mcclellan's army gives the aggregate present for duty as one hundred twelve thousand three hundred ninety two that of the twentieth of june omitting the army corps of general dix then as previously stationed at fortress monroe and including general mccall's division which had recently joined the strength of which was reported to be nine thousand five hundred fourteen gives the aggregate present for duty as one hundred five thousand eight hundred twenty five and the total present and absent as one hundred fifty six thousand eight hundred thirty eight two statements of the strength of our army under general j e johnston during the month of may 
in which General McClellan testified that he was greatly in need of McDowell's Corps, give the following results. First, the official return, 21st May, 1862, total effective of all arms, 53,688. Subsequently, five brigades were added, and the effective strength of the army under General Johnston, on May 31st, 1862, was 62,696. I now proceed to inquire what caused the panic at Washington. On May 23rd, General Jackson, with whose force that of General Ewell had united, moved with such rapidity as to surprise the enemy, and Ewell, who was in advance, captured most of the troops at Front Royal, and pressed directly on to Winchester, while Jackson, turning across to the road from Strasburg, struck the main column of the enemy in flank, and drove it routed back to Strasburg. The pursuit was continued to Winchester, and the enemy, under their commander-in-chief, General Banks, fled across the Potomac into Maryland. Two thousand prisoners were taken in the pursuit. General Banks, in his report, says, quote, There never were more grateful hearts in the same number of men than when, at midday on the 26th, we stood on the opposite shore, end quote. When the news of the attack on Front Royal on May 23rd reached General Geary, charged with the protection of the Manassas Gap Railroad, he immediately moved to Manassas Junction. At the same time, his troops, hearing the most extravagant stories, burned their tents and destroyed a quantity of arms. General Duryea, at Catlett Station, becoming alarmed on hearing of the withdrawal of Geary, took his three New York regiments, leaving a Pennsylvania one behind, hastened back to Centerville, and telegraphed to Washington for aid. He left behind a large quantity of army stores. The alarm spread to Washington, and the Secretary of War, Stanton, issued a call to the governors of the loyal states for militia to defend that city. The following is the dispatch sent to the governor of Massachusetts. Quote, Washington, Sunday, May 25th, 1862. To the governor of Massachusetts. Intelligence from various quarters leaves no doubt that the enemy in great force are marching on Washington. You will please organize and forward immediately all the militia and volunteer force in your state. Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War. End quote. This alarm at Washington and the call for more troops for its defense produced a most indescribable panic in the cities of the northern states on Sunday the 25th and two or three days afterward. The governor of New York on Sunday night telegraphed to Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and other cities as follows, quote, Orders from Washington render it necessary to send to that city all the available militia force. What can you do? E.D. Morgan, end quote. Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania issued the following order, quote, General Order No. 23, Headquarters of Pennsylvania Militia, Harrisburg, May 26, 1862. On pressing requisition of the President of the United States in the present emergency, it is ordered that the several major generals, brigadier generals, and colonels of regiments throughout the Commonwealth muster without delay all military organizations within their respective divisions or under their control, together with all persons willing to join their commands, and proceed forthwith to the city of Washington, or such other points as may be designated by future orders. By order, A.G. Curtin, Governor and Commander-in-Chief, end quote. The Governor of Massachusetts issued the following proclamation, quote, Men of Massachusetts, the wily and barbarous horde of traitors to the people, to the government, to our country, and to liberty, menace again the national capital. They have attacked and routed Major General Banks, are advancing on Harper's Ferry, and are marching on Washington. The President calls on Massachusetts to rise once more for its rescue and defense. The whole active militia will be summoned by a general order, issued from the office of the Adjutant General, to report on Boston Common tomorrow. They will march to relieve and avenge their brethren and friends, and to oppose, with fierce zeal and courageous patriotism, the progress of the foe. May God encourage their hearts and strengthen their arms, and may he inspire the government and all the people. Given at headquarters, Boston, 11 o'clock this Sunday evening, May 25th, 1862. John A. Andrew. End quote. The governor of Ohio issued the following proclamation. Quote, Columbus, Ohio, 
May 26, 1862. To the gallant men of Ohio, I have the astounding intelligence that the seat of our beloved government is threatened with invasion, and am called upon by the Secretary of War for troops to repel and overwhelm the ruthless invaders. Rally, then, men of Ohio, and respond to this call as becomes those who appreciate our glorious government. The number wanted from each county has been indicated by special dispatches to the several military committees. David Todd, Governor. End quote. At the same time, the Secretary of War at Washington caused the following order to be issued. Quote, Washington, Sunday, May 25th, 1862. Ordered, by virtue of the authority vested by an act of Congress, the President takes military possession of all the railroads in the United States from and after this date, and directs that the respective railroad companies, their officers and servants, shall hold themselves in readiness for the transportation of troops and munitions of war, as may be ordered by the military authorities, to the exclusion of all other business. By order of the Secretary of War, M. C. Meggs, Quartermaster General. End quote. At the first moment of the alarm, the President of the United States issued the following order. Quote, Washington, May 24, 1862. Major General McDowell. General Fremont has been ordered by telegraph to move to Franklin and Harrisonburg to relieve General Banks and capture or destroy Jackson's and Ewell's forces. You are instructed, laying aside for the present the movement on Richmond, to put 20,000 men in motion at once for the Shenandoah moving on the line or in advance of the line of the Manassas Gap Railroad. Your object will be to capture the forces of Jackson and Ewell, either in cooperation with General Fremont or, in case want of supplies or transportation has interfered with his movement, it is believed that the force which you move will be sufficient to accomplish the object alone. The information thus far received here makes it probable that, if the enemy operates actively against General Banks, you will not be able to count upon much assistance from him, but may have even to release him. Reports received this morning are that Banks is fighting with Ewell, eight miles from Harper's Ferry. Abraham Lincoln, end quote. When the panic thus indicated in the headquarters of the enemy had disseminated itself through the military and social ramifications of northern society, the excitement was tumultuous. Meanwhile, General Jackson, little conceiving the alarm his movements had caused in the departments at Washington and in the offices of the governors of states, in addition to the diversion of McDowell from cooperation in the attack upon Richmond, after driving the enemy out of Winchester, pressed eagerly on, not pausing to accept the congratulations of the overjoyed people at the sight of their own friends again among them. For he learned that the enemy had garrisons at Charlestown and Harper's Ferry, and he was resolved they should not rest on Virginia soil. General Winder's brigade, in the advance, found the enemy drawn up in line of battle at Charlestown. Without waiting for reinforcements, he engaged them, and after a short conflict drove them in disorder toward the Potomac. The main column then moved on, near to Harper's Ferry, where General Jackson received information that Fremont was moving from the west, and the whole or a part of General McDowell's corps from the east, to make a junction in his rear, and thus cut off his retreat. At this time, General Jackson's effective force was about 15,000 men, much less than either of the two armies which were understood to be marching to form a junction against him. We now know that General McDowell had been ordered to send to the relief of General Banks in the valley twenty to 30,000 men. The estimated force of General Fremont, when at Harrisonburg, was 20,000. General Jackson had captured in his campaign down the valley a very large amount of valuable stores, over 9,000 small arms, two pieces of artillery, many horses, and, besides the wounded and sick who had been released on parole, was said to have 2,300 prisoners. To secure these, as well as to save his army, it was necessary to retreat beyond the point where his enemies could readily unite. The amount of captured stores and other property which he was anxious to preserve were said to require a wagon train 12 miles long. This, under the care of a regiment, was sent forward in advance of the army, which promptly retired up the valley. On his retreat, General Jackson received information confirmatory of the report of the movements of the enemy, and of the defeat of a small force he had left at Front Royal in charge of some prisoners and captured stores. The latter, however, the garrison, before retreating, had destroyed. 
Strasburg being General Jackson's objective point, he had farther to march to reach that position than either of the columns operating against him. The rapidity of movement which marked General Jackson's operations had given to his command the appellation of foot cavalry, and never had they more need to show themselves entitled to the name of Stonewall. On the night of the 31st of May, by a forced march, General Jackson arrived with the head of his column at Strasburg, and learned that General Fremont's advance was in the immediate vicinity. To gain time for the rest of his army to arrive, General Jackson decided to check Fremont's march by an attack in the morning. This movement was assigned to General Ewell, General Jackson personally giving his attention to preserving his immense trains filled with captured stores. The repulse of Fremont's advance was so easy that General Taylor describes it as offering a temptation to go beyond General Jackson's orders and make a serious attack upon Fremont's army, but recognizes the justice of the restraint imposed by the order, quote, as we could not waste time chasing Fremont, end quote, for it was reported that General Shields was at Front Royal with troops of a different character from those of Fremont's army, who had been encountered near Strasburg. It est, the Corps, quote, commanded by General O. O. Howard, and called by both sides the Flying Dutchmen, end quote. This more formidable command of General Shields, therefore, required immediate attention. Leaving Strasburg on the evening of June 1st, always intent to prevent a junction of the two armies of the enemy, Jackson continued his march up the valley. Fremont followed in pursuit, while Shields moved slowly up the valley via Luray for the purpose of reaching New Market in advance of Jackson. On the morning of the 5th, Jackson reached Harrisonburg, and, passing beyond that town, turned toward the east in the direction of Port Republic. General Ashby had destroyed all the bridges between Front Royal and Port Republic to prevent Shields from crossing the Shenandoah to join Fremont. The troops were now permitted to make shorter marches, and were allowed some halts to refresh them after their forced marches and frequent combats. Early on the 6th of June, Fremont's reinforced cavalry attacked our cavalry rear guard under General Ashby. A sharp conflict ensued, which resulted in the repulse of the enemy and the capture of Colonel Percy Wyndham, commanding the brigade, and 63 others. General Ashby was in position between Harrisonburg and Port Republic, and after the cavalry combat just described, there were indications of a more serious attack. Ashby sent a message to Ewell, informing him that cavalry supported by infantry was advancing upon his position. The 58th Virginia and the 1st Maryland regiments were sent to his support. Ashby led the 58th Virginia to attack the enemy, who were under cover of a fence. General Ewell, in the meantime, had arrived, and, seeing the advantage the enemy had of position, directed Colonel Johnson to move with his regiment so as to approach the flank instead of the front of the enemy, and he was now driven from the field with heavy loss. Our loss was 17 killed, 50 wounded, and 3 missing. Here fell the stainless, fearless cavalier, General Turner Ashby, of whom General Jackson, in his report, thus forcibly speaks, quote, As a partisan officer, I never knew his superior. His daring was proverbial, his power of endurance almost incredible, his tone of character heroic, and his sagacity almost intuitive in divining the purposes and movements of the enemy, end quote. The main body of General Jackson's command had now reached Port Republic, a village situated in the angle formed by the junction of the North and South Rivers, tributaries of the South Fork of the Shenandoah. Over the North River was a wooden bridge connecting the town with Harrisonburg. Over the South River there was a ford. Jackson's immediate command was encamped on the high ground north of the village and about a mile from the river. Ewell was some four miles distant near the road leading from Harrisonburg to Port Republic. General Fremont had arrived with his forces in the vicinity of Harrisonburg, and General Shields was moving up the east side of the Shenandoah, and had reached Conrad's store. Each was about 15 miles distant from Jackson's position. To prevent a junction, the bridge over the river near Shields's position had been destroyed. As the advance of General Shields approached on the 8th, the brigades of Tolliver and Winder were ordered to occupy positions immediately north of the bridge. The enemy's cavalry, accompanied by artillery, then appeared, and, after directing a few shots toward the bridge, crossed South River, and, dashing into the village, planted one of their pieces at the southern entrance of the bridge. Meantime, our batteries were placed in position, 
and Tolliver's brigade, having approached the bridge, was ordered to dash across, capture the piece, and occupy the town. This was gallantly done, and the enemy's cavalry dispersed and driven back, abandoning another gun. A considerable body of infantry was now seen advancing, when our batteries opened with marked effect, and, in a short time, the infantry followed the cavalry, falling back three miles. They were pursued about a mile by our batteries on the opposite bank, when they disappeared in a wood. This attack of Shields had scarcely been repulsed when Ewell became seriously engaged with Fremont, moving on the opposite side of the river. The enemy pushed forward, driving in the pickets, which, by gallant resistance, checked their advance until Ewell had time to select his position on a commanding ridge, with a rivulet and open ground in front, woods on both flanks, and the road to Port Republic intersecting his line. Trimble's brigade was posted on the right, the batteries of Courtney, Lusk, Brockenbrough, and Rains in the center, Stewart's brigade on the left, and Elsie's in rear of the center. Both wings were in the woods. About ten o'clock, the enemy posted his artillery opposite our batteries, and a fire was kept up for several hours, with great spirit on both sides. Meantime, a brigade of the enemy advanced, under cover, upon General Trimble, who reserved his fire until they reached short range when he poured forth a deadly volley, under which they fell back. Trimble, supported by two regiments of Elsie's reserve, now advanced, with spirited skirmishing, more than a mile from his original line, driving the opposing force back to its former position. Ewell, finding no attack on his left was designed by the enemy, advanced and drove in their skirmishers, and at night was in position on ground previously occupied by the foe. This engagement has generally been known as the Battle of Cross Keys. As General Shields made no movement to renew the action of the 8th, General Jackson determined to attack him on the 9th. Accordingly, Ewell's forces were moved at an early hour toward Port Republic, and General Trimble was left to hold Fremont in check, or, if hard-pressed, to retire across the river and burn the bridge, which subsequently was done under orders to concentrate against Shields. Meanwhile, the enemy had taken position about two miles from Port Republic, their right on the river bank, their left on the slope of the mountain, which here threw out a spur, between which and the river was a smooth plain of about a thousand yards wide. On an elevated plateau of the mountain was placed a battery of long-range guns to sweep the plain over which our forces must pass to attack. In front of that plateau was a deep gorge, through which flowed a small stream, trending to the southern side of the promontory so as to leave its northern point in advance of the southern. The mountainside was covered with dense wood. Such was the position which Jackson must assail, or lose the opportunity to fight his foe in detail, the object for which his forced marches had been made, and on which his best hopes depended. General Winder's brigade moved down the river to attack, when the enemy's battery upon the plateau opened, and it was found to rake the plain over which we must approach for a considerable distance in front of Shields's position. Our guns were brought forward, and an attempt made to dislodge the battery of the enemy, but our fire proved unequal to theirs, whereupon General Winder, having been reinforced, attempted by a rapid charge to capture it, but encountered such a heavy fire of artillery and small arms as to compel his command, composed of his own and another brigade with a light battery, to fall back in disorder. The enemy advanced steadily and in such numbers as to drive back our infantry supports and render it necessary to withdraw our guns. Ewell was hurrying his men over the bridge, and there was no fear, if human effort would avail, that he would come too late. But the condition was truly critical. General Taylor describes his chief at that moment thus, quote, Jackson was on the road, a little in advance of his line, where the fire was hottest, with reins on his horse's neck, seemingly in prayer. Attracted by my approach, he said, in his usual voice, delightful excitement, end quote. He then briefly gave Taylor instructions to move against the battery on the plateau, and sent a young officer from his staff as a guide. The advance of the enemy was checked by an attack on his flank by two of our regiments, under Colonel Scott. But this was only a temporary relief, for this small command was soon afterward driven back to the woods with severe loss. Our batteries, during the check, were all safely withdrawn except one six-pounder gun. In this critical condition of Winder's command, 
General Taylor made a successful attack on the left and rear of the enemy, which diverted attention from the front, and led to a concentration of his force upon him. Moving to the right, along the mountain acclivity, he was unseen before he emerged from the wood, just as the loud cheers of the enemy proclaimed their success in front. Although opposed by a superior force in front and flank, and with their guns in position, with a rush and shout the gorge was passed. Impetuously the charge was made, and the battery of six guns fell into our hands. Three times was this battery lost and won in the desperate and determined efforts to capture and recover it, and the enemy finally succeeded in carrying off one of the guns, leaving both Cason and Limber. Thus occupied with Taylor, the enemy halted in his advance, and formed a line facing to the mountain. Winder succeeded in rallying his command, and our batteries were replaced in their former positions. At the same time, reinforcements were brought by General Ewell to Taylor, who pushed forward with them, assisted by the well-directed fire of our artillery. Of this period in the battle, than which there has seldom been one of greater peril, or where danger was more gallantly met, I copy a description from the work of General Taylor. Quote, the fighting in and around the battery was hand to hand, and many fell from bayonet wounds. Even the artillerymen used their rammers in a way not laid down in the manual, and died at their guns. I called for Hayes, but he, the promptest of men, and his splendid regiment could not be found. Something unexpected had occurred, but there was no time for speculation. With a desperate rally, in which I believe the drummer boys shared, we carried the battery for the third time, and held it. Infantry and riflemen had been driven off, and we began to feel a little comfortable, when the enemy, arrested in his advance by our attack, appeared. He had countermarched, and, with left near the river, came into full view of our situation. Wheeling to the right, with colors advanced, like a solid wall, he marched straight upon us. There seemed nothing left but to set our back to the mountain and die hard. At the instant, crashing through the underwood, came Ewell, outriding staff and escort. He produced the effect of a reinforcement, and was welcomed with cheers. The line before us halted, and threw forward skirmishers. A moment later, a shell came shrieking along it. Loud Confederate cheers reached our delighted ears, and Jackson, freed from his toils, rushed up like a whirlwind. End quote. The enemy, in his advance, had gone in front of the plateau where his battery was placed, the elevation being sufficient to enable the guns without hazard to be fired over the advancing line. So, when he commenced retreating, he had to pass by the position of this battery, and the captured guns were effectively used against him. That dashing old soldier, Ewell, serving as a gunner. Mention was made of the inability to find Hayes when his regiment was wanted. It is due to that true patriot, who has been gathered to his fathers, to add Taylor's explanation. Quote, Ere long, my lost 7th Regiment, sadly cut up, rejoined. This regiment was in rear of the column when we left Jackson to gain the path in the woods, and before it filed out of the road, his thin line was so pressed that Jackson ordered Hayes to stop the enemy's rush. This was done, for the 7th would have stopped a herd of elephants, but at a fearful cost. End quote. The retreat of the enemy though it was so precipitate as to cause him to leave his killed and wounded on the field, was never converted into a rout. Quote, Shields's brave boys preserved their organization to the last, and, had Shields himself, with his whole command, been on the field, we should have had tough work indeed. End quote. The pursuit was continued some five miles beyond the battlefield, during which we captured 450 prisoners, some wagons, one piece of abandoned artillery, and about 800 muskets. Some 275 wounded were paroled in the hospitals near Port Republic. On the next day, Fremont withdrew his forces and retreated down the valley. The rapid movements of Jackson, the eagle-like stoop with which he had descended upon each army of the enemy, and the terror which his name had come to inspire, created a great alarm at Washington, where it was believed he must have an immense army and that he was about to come down like an avalanche upon the capital. Milroy, Banks, Fremont, and Shields were all moved in that direction, and peace again reigned in the patriotic and once happy Valley of the Shenandoah. The material results of this very remarkable campaign 
are thus summarily stated by one who had special means of information quote, in three months jackson had marched six hundred miles fought four pitched battles seven minor engagements and daily skirmishes had defeated four armies captured seven pieces of artillery ten thousand stand of arms four thousand prisoners and a very great amount of stores inflicting upon his adversaries a known loss of two thousand men with a loss upon his own part comparatively small end quote. the general effect upon the affairs of the confederacy was even more important and the motives which influenced jackson present him in a grander light than any military success could have done thus on the twentieth of march eighteen sixty two he learned that the large force of the enemy before which he had retired was returning down the valley and divining the object to be to send forces to the east side of the mountain to cooperate in the attack upon richmond general jackson with his small force of about three thousand infantry and two hundred and ninety cavalry moved with his usual celerity in pursuit he overtook the rear of the column at kernstown attacked a very superior force he found there and fought with such desperation as to impress the enemy with the idea that he had a large army therefore the detachments which had already started for manassas were recalled and additional forces were also sent into the valley nor was this all mcdowell's corps under orders to join mcclellan was detained for the defense of the federal capital jackson's bold strategy had effected the object for which his movement was designed and he slowly retreated to the south bank of the shenandoah where he remained undisturbed by the enemy and had time to recruit his forces which by the twenty eighth of april amounted to six or seven thousand men general banks had advanced and occupied harrisonburg about fifteen miles from jackson's position fremont with a force estimated at fifteen thousand men was reported to be preparing to join banks's command the alarm at washington had caused mcdowell's corps to be withdrawn from the upper rappahannock to fredericksburg jackson anxious to take advantage of the then divided condition of the enemy sent to richmond for reinforcements but our condition there did not enable us to furnish any except the division of ewell which had been left near gordonsville in observation of mcdowell now by his withdrawal made disposable and the brigade of edward johnson which confronted shank and milroy near to stanton jackson who when he could not get what he wanted did the best he could with what he had called ewell to his aid left him to hold banks in check and marched to unite with johnson the combined forces attacked milroy and shank who after a severe conflict retreated in the night to join fremont jackson then returned toward harrisonburg having ordered ewell to join him for an attack on banks who in the meantime had retreated toward winchester where jackson attacked and defeated him inflicting great loss drove him across the potomac and as has been represented filled the authorities at washington with such dread of its capture as to disturb the previously devised plans against richmond and led to the operations which have already been described and brought into full play jackson's military genius in all these operations there conspicuously appears the self-abnegation of a devoted patriot he was not seeking by great victories to acquire fame for himself but always alive to the necessities and dangers elsewhere he heroically strove to do what was possible for the general benefit of the cause he maintained his whole heart was his country's and his whole country's heart was his end of section seven section eight of the rise and fall of the confederate government volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rise and fall of the confederate government volume two by jefferson davis part four chapter twenty two condition of affairs plan of general johnston the field of battle at seven pines the battle general johnston wounded advance of general sumner conflict on the right delay of general Huger. reports of the enemy losses strength of forces 
General Lee in command. Our army, having retreated from the peninsula and withdrawn from the north side of the Chickahominy to the immediate vicinity of Richmond, I rode out occasionally to the lines and visited the headquarters of the commanding general. There were no visible preparations for defense, and my brief conversations with the general afforded no satisfactory information as to his plans and purposes. We had, under the supervision of General Lee, perfected as far as we could the detached works before the city but these were rather designed to protect it against a sudden attack than to resist approaches by a great army. They were also so near to the city that it might have been effectually bombarded by guns exterior to them. Anxious for the defense of the ancient capital of Virginia, now the capital of the Confederate States, and remembering a remark of General Johnston that the Spaniards were the only people who now undertook to hold fortified towns, I had written to him that he knew the defense of Richmond must be made at a distance from it. Seeing no preparation to keep the enemy at a distance, and kept in ignorance of any plan for such purpose, I sent for General B. E. Lee, then at Richmond, in general charge of army operations, and told him why and how I was dissatisfied with the condition of affairs. He asked me what I thought it was proper to do. Recurring to a conversation held about the time we had together visited General Johnston, I answered that McClellan should be attacked on the other side of the Chickahominy, before he matured his preparations for a siege of Richmond. To this he promptly assented, as I anticipated he would, for I knew it had been his own opinion. He then said, quote, General Johnston should of course advise you of what he expects or proposes to do. Let me go and see him, and defer this discussion until I return, end quote. It may be proper here to say that I had not doubted that General Johnston was fully in accord with me as to the purpose of defending Richmond, but I was not content with his course for that end. It had not occurred to me that he meditated a retreat which would uncover the capital, nor was it ever suspected until, in reading General Hood's book, published in 1880, the evidence was found that General Johnston, when retreating from Yorktown, told his volunteer aide, Mr. McFarland, that, quote, he, Johnston expected or intended to give up Richmond. End quote. When General Lee came back, he told me that General Johnston proposed, on the next Thursday, to move against the enemy as follows General A. P. Hill was to move down on the right flank and rear of the enemy. General G. W. Smith, as soon as Hill's guns opened, was to cross the Chickahominy at the Meadow Bridge, attack the enemy in flank, and by the conjunction of the two, it was expected to double him up then Longstreet was to cross on the Mechanicsville Bridge and attack him in front. From this plan, the best results were hoped by both of us. On the morning of the day proposed, I hastily dispatched my office business and rode out toward the Meadow Bridge to see the action commence. On the road I found Smith's division halted and the men dispersed in the woods. Looking for someone from whom I could get information, I finally saw General Hood and asked him the meaning of what I saw. He told me he did not know anything more than that they had been halted. I asked him where General Smith was. He said he believed he had gone to a farmhouse in the rear, adding that he thought he was ill. Riding on to the bluff which overlooks the Meadow Bridge, I asked Colonel Anderson, posted there in observation, whether he had seen anything of the enemy in his front. He said that he had seen only two mounted men across the bridge and a small party of infantry on the other side of the river, some distance below both of whom, he said, he could show me if I would go with him into the garden back of the house. There, by the use of a powerful glass, were distinctly visible two cavalry vedettes at the further end of the bridge, and a squad of infantry lower down the river, who had covered themselves with a screen of green boughs. The colonel informed me that he had not heard Hill's guns. It was therefore supposed he had not advanced. I then rode down the bank of the river, followed by a cavalcade of sightseers, who, I supposed, had been attracted by the expectation of a battle. The little squad of infantry, about fifteen in number, as we approached, fled over the ridge, and were lost to sight. Near to the Mechanicsville Bridge, I found General Howell Cobb, commanding the support of a battery of artillery. He pointed out to me, on the opposite side of the river, the only enemy he had seen, and which was evidently a light battery. Riding on to the main road, which led to the Mechanicsville Bridge, I found General Longstreet, walking to and fro in an impatient, it might be said fretful, manner. Before speaking to him, he said his division had been under arms all day, waiting for orders to advance. 
and that the day was now so far spent that he did not know what was the matter. I afterward learned from General Smith that he had received information from a citizen that the Beaver Dam Creek presented an impassable barrier, and that he had thus, fortunately, been saved from a disaster. Thus ended the offensive-defensive program, from which Lee expected much, and of which I was hopeful. In the meanwhile, the enemy moved up, and, finding the crossing at Bottoms Bridge unobstructed, threw a brigade of the Fourth Corps across the Chickahominy as early as the 20th of May, and on the 23rd sent over the rest of the Fourth Corps. On the 25th he sent over another corps, and commenced fortifying a line near to Seven Pines. In the forenoon of the 31st of May, riding out on the New Bridge Road, I heard firing in the direction of Seven Pines. As I drew nearer, I saw General Whiting, with part of General Smith's division, file into the road in front of me. At the same time, I saw General Johnston ride across the field from a house before which General Lee's horse was standing. I turned down to the house and asked General Lee what the musketry firing meant. He replied by asking whether I had heard it, and was answered in the affirmative. He said he had been under that impression himself, but General Johnston had assured him that it could be nothing more than an artillery duel. It is scarcely necessary to add that neither of us had been advised of a design to attack the enemy that day. We then walked out to the rear of the house to listen, and were satisfied that an action, or at least a severe skirmish, must be going on. General Johnston states in his report that the condition of the air was peculiarly unfavorable to the transmission of sound. General Lee and myself then rode to the field of battle, which may be briefly described as follows. The Chickahominy, flowing in front, is a deep, sluggish, and narrow river, bordered by marshes and covered with tangled wood. The line of battle extended along the nine-mile road, across the York River Railroad and Williamsburg Stage Road. The enemy had constructed redoubts, with long lines of rifle pits covered by abatis, from below Bottoms Bridge to within less than two miles of New Bridge, and had constructed bridges to connect his forces on the north and south sides of the Chickahominy. The left of his forces on the south side was thrown forward from the river. The right was on its bank and covered by its slope. Our main force was on the right flank of our position, extending on both sides of the Williamsburg Road, near to its intersection with the Nine Mile Road. This wing consisted of Hills, Huger's, and Longstreet's divisions, with light batteries and a small force of cavalry. The division of General G. W. Smith, Les Hood's brigade ordered to the right, formed the left wing and its position was on the Nine Mile Road. There were small tracts of cleared land, but most of the ground was wooded, and much of it so covered with water as to seriously embarrass the movements of troops. When General Lee and I, riding down the Nine Mile Road, reached the left of our line, we found the troops hotly engaged. Our men had driven the enemy from his advanced encampment, and he had fallen back behind an open field to the bank of the river, where, in a dense wood, was concealed an infantry line with artillery in position. Soon after our arrival, General Johnston, who had gone farther to the right, where the conflict was expected, and whither reinforcement from the left was marching, was brought back severely wounded, and as soon as an ambulance could be obtained, was removed from the field. Our troops on the left made vigorous assaults under most disadvantageous circumstances. They made several gallant attempts to carry the enemy's position, but were, each time, repulsed with heavy loss. After a personal reconnaissance on the left of the open in our front, I sent one, then another, and another courier to General Magruder, directing him to send a force down by the wooded path, just under the bluff, to attack the enemy in flank and reverse. Impatient of delay, I had started to see General Magruder when I met the third courier, who said he had not found General Magruder, but had delivered the message to Brigadier General Griffith, who was moving by the path designated to make the attack. On returning to the field, I found that the attack in front had ceased. It was, therefore, too late for a single brigade to effect anything against the large force of the enemy, and messengers were sent through the woods to direct General Griffith to go back. The heavy rain during the night of the 30th had swollen the Chickahominy. It was rising when the Battle of Seven Pines was fought, but had not reached such height as to prevent the enemy from using his bridges. Consequently, General Sumner, during the engagement, brought over his corps as a reinforcement. He was on the north side of the river, had built two bridges to connect with the south side, 
and though their coverings were loosened by the upward pressure of the rising water they were not yet quite impassable with the true instinct of the soldier to march upon fire when the sound of the battle reached him he formed his corps and stood under arms waiting for an order to advance he came too soon for us and but for his forethought and promptitude he would have arrived too late for his friends it may be granted that his presence saved the left wing of the federal army from defeat as we had permitted the enemy to fortify before our attack it would have been better to have waited another day until the bridges should have been rendered impassable by the rise of the river general lee at nightfall gave instructions to general smith the senior officer on that part of the battlefield and left with me to return to richmond thus far i have only attempted to describe events on the extreme left of the battlefield being that part of which i had personal observation but the larger force and consequently the more serious conflict were upon the right of the line to these i will now refer our force there consisted of the divisions of major generals d h hill Huger, and longstreet the latter in chief command in his report first published in the southern historical society papers volume three pages two hundred seventy seven two hundred seventy eight he writes quote, agreeably to verbal instructions from the commanding general the division of major general d h hill was on the morning of the thirty first ultimo formed at an early hour on the williamsburg road as a column of attack upon the enemy's front on that road the division of major general Huger was intended to make a strong flank movement around the left of the enemy's position and attack him in rear of that flank after waiting some six hours for these troops to get into position i determined to move forward without regard to them and gave orders to that effect to major general d h hill the forward movement began about two o'clock and our skirmishers soon became engaged with those of the enemy the entire division of general hill became engaged about three o'clock and drove the enemy steadily back gaining possession of his abatis and part of his entrenched camp general rhodes by a movement to the right driving in the enemy's left the only reinforcements on the field in hand were my own brigades of which anderson's wilcox's and kemper's were put in by the front on the williamsburg road and colston's and pryor's by my right flank at the same time the decided and gallant attack made by the other brigades gained entire possession of the enemy's position with his artillery camp equipage etc anderson's brigade under colonel jenkins pressing forward rapidly continued to drive the enemy till nightfall the conduct of the attack was left entirely to major general hill the entire success of the affair is sufficient evidence of his ability courage and skill end quote. this tribute to general hill was no more than has been accorded to him by others who knew of his services on that day and was in keeping with the determined courage vigilance and daring exhibited by him on other fields the reference made without qualification in general longstreet's report to the failure of general Huger to make the attack expected of him and the freedom with which others have criticized him renders it proper that some explanation should be given of an apparent dilatoriness on the part of that veteran soldier who after long and faithful service now fills an honored grave it will be remembered that general Huger was to move by the charles city road so as to turn the left of the enemy and attack him in flank the extraordinary rain of the previous night had swollen every rivulet to the dimensions of a stream and the route prescribed to general Huger was one especially affected by that heavy rain as it led to the head of the white oak swamp the bridge over the stream flowing into that swamp had been carried away and the alternatives presented to him was to rebuild the bridge or leave his artillery he chose the former which involved the delay that has subjected him to criticism if any should think an excuse necessary to justify this decision they are remanded to the accepted military maxim that the march must never be so hurried as to arrive unfit for service and also they may be reminded that Huger's specialty was artillery he being the officer who commanded the siege guns with which general scott marched from vera cruz to the city of mexico to show that the obstacles encountered were not of such slight character as energy would readily overcome i refer to the report of an officer commanding a brigade on that occasion brigadier general r e rhodes whose great merit and dashing gallantry caused him to be admired throughout the army of the confederacy he said quote, on the morning of the thirty first the brigade was stationed on the charles city road 
three and a half miles from the point on the Williamsburg Road from which it had been determined to start the columns of attack. I received a verbal order from General Hill to conduct my command at once to the point at which the attack was to be made. The progress of the brigade was considerably delayed by the washing away of a bridge near the head of White Oak Swamp, by reason of which the men had to wade in water waist-deep, and a large number were entirely submerged. At this point, the character of the crossing was such that it was absolutely necessary to proceed with great caution to prevent the loss of both ammunition and life. In consequence of this delay, and notwithstanding that the men were carried at double-quick time over very heavy ground for a considerable distance to make up for it, when the signal for attack was given, only my line of skirmishers, the 6th Alabama and the 12th Mississippi regiments, was in position. The ground over which we were to move, being covered with thick undergrowth, and the soil being marshy, so marshy that it was with great difficulty that either horses or men could get over it, and being guided only by the fire in front, I emerged from the woods from the Williamsburg Road under a heavy fire of both artillery and musketry, with only five companies of the 5th Alabama. End quote. General Huger's line of march was farther to the right, therefore nearer to White Oak Swamp, and the impediments consequently greater than where General Rhodes found the route so difficult as to be dangerous even to infantry. On the next day, the 1st of June, General Longstreet states that a serious attack was made on our position, and that it was repulsed. This refers to the works which Hill's division had captured the day before, and which the enemy endeavored to retake. From the final report of General Longstreet, already cited, it appears that he was ordered to attack on the morning of the 31st, and he explains why it was postponed for six hours. Then he states that it was commenced by the division of General D. H. Hill, which drove the enemy steadily back, pressing forward until nightfall. The movement of Rhodes's brigade on the right flank is credited with having contributed much to the dislodgement of the enemy from their abatis and first entrenchments. As just stated, General Longstreet reports a delay of some six hours in making this attack because he was waiting for General Huger, and then made it successfully with Hill's division and some brigades from his own. These questions must naturally arise in the mind of the reader. Why did not our troops on the left, during this long delay, as well as during the period occupied by Hill's assault, cooperate in the attack? And why, the battle having been preconceived, were they so far removed as not to hear the first guns? The officers of the Federal Army, when called before a committee appointed by their Congress to inquiry into the conduct of the war, have by their testimony made it quite plain that the divided condition of their troops, and the length of time required for their concentration after the battle commenced, rendered it practicable for our forces, if united, as taking the initiative they well might have been, to have crushed or put to flight first Keyes's and then Heinzelman's corps, before Sumner crossed the Chickahominy, between five and six o'clock in the evening. By the official reports, our aggregate loss was killed, wounded, and missing, 6,084 of which 4,851 were in Longstreet's command on the right and 1,233 in Smith's command on the left. The enemy reported his aggregate loss at 5,739. It may have been less than ours, for we stormed his successive defenses. Our success upon the right was proved by our possession of the enemy's works, as well as by the capture of ten pieces of artillery, four flags, a large amount of camp equipage, and more than 1,000 prisoners. Our aggregate of both wings was about 40,500. The force of the enemy confronting us may be approximated by taking his returns for the 20th of June, and adding thereto his casualties on the 31st of May and 1st of June, because between the last-named date and the 20th of June no action had occurred to create any material change in the number present. From these data, viz. the strength of Heinzelman's Corps, 18,810, and of Keyes's Corps, 14,610, on June 20th, by adding their casualties on the 31st of May and 1st of June, 4,516, we deduce the strength of these two corps on the 31st of May to have been 37,936, as the aggregate present for duty. It thus appears that, at the commencement of the action on the 31st of May, we had a numerical superiority of about 2,500. Adopting the same method to calculate the strength of Sumner's Corps, we find it to have been 18,724, 
which would give the enemy in round numbers a force of sixteen thousand in excess of ours after general sumner crossed the chickahominy both combatants claimed the victory i have presented the evidence in support of our claim the withdrawal of the confederate forces on the day after the battle from the ground on which it was fought certainly gives color to the claim of the enemy though that was really the result of a policy much broader than the occupation of the field of seven pines on the morning of june first i rode out toward the position where general smith had been left on the previous night and where i learned from general lee that he would remain after turning into the nine mile road and before reaching that position i was hailed by general whiting who saw me at a distance and ran toward the road to stop me he told me i was riding into the position of the enemy who had advanced on the withdrawal of our troops and there pointing he said quote, is a battery which i am surprised has not fired on yon end quote. i asked where our troops were he said his was the advance and the others behind him he also told me that general smith was at the house which had been his whiting's headquarters and i rode there to see him to relieve both him and general lee from any embarrassment I preferred to make the announcement of General Lee's assignment to command previous to his arrival. After General Lee arrived, I took leave, and being subsequently joined by him, we rode together to the Williamsburg Road, where we found General Longstreet, his command being in front, and then engaged with the enemy on the field of the previous day's combat. The operations of that day were neither extensive nor important, save in the collection of the arms acquired in the previous day's battle general r e lee was now in immediate command and thenceforward directed the movements of the army in front of richmond laborious and exact in details as he was vigilant and comprehensive in grand strategy a power with which the public had not credited him soon became manifest in all that makes an army a rapid accurate compact machine with responsive motion in all its parts i extract the following sentence from a letter from the late colonel r h chilton adjutant and inspector general of the army of the confederacy because of his special knowledge of the subject quote, i consider general lee's exhibition of grand administrative talents and indomitable energy in bringing up that army in so short a time to that state of discipline which maintained aggregation through those terrible seven days fights around richmond as probably his grandest achievement End of section eight Section 9 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 23 the enemy's position his intention the plan of operations movements of general jackson daring and fortitude of lee offensive defensive policy general stuart's movement order of attack critical position of mcclellan order of mr lincoln creating the army of virginia Arrival of Jackson Position of the enemy Diversion of General Longstreet The enemy forced back south of the Chickahominy Abandonment of the railroad When riding from the field of battle with General Robert E. Lee on the previous day, I informed him that he would be assigned to the command of the army, Vice General Johnston wounded and that he could make his preparations as soon as he reached his quarters, as I should send the order to him as soon as arrived at mine. On the next morning, as above stated, he proceeded to the field and took command of the troops. During the night, our forces on the left had fallen back from their position at the close of the previous day's battle, but those on the right remained in the one they had gained, and some combats occurred there between the opposing forces. The enemy proceeded further to fortify his position on the Chickahominy, covering his communication with his base of supplies on York River. 
His left was on the south side of the Chickahominy, between White Oak Swamp and New Bridge, and was covered by a strong entrenchment, with heavy guns, and with a bodice in front. His right wing was north of the Chickahominy, extending to Mechanicsville, and the approaches defended by strong works. Our army was in line in front of Richmond, but without entrenchments. General Lee immediately commenced the construction of an earthwork for a battery on our left flank, and a line of entrenchment to the right, necessarily feeble because of our deficiency in tools. It seemed to be the intention of the enemy to assail Richmond by regular approaches, which our numerical inferiority and want of engineer troops, as well as the deficiency of proper utensils, made it improbable that we should be able to resist. The day after General Lee assumed command, I was riding out to the army, when I saw at a house on my left a number of horses, and among them one I recognized as belonging to him. I dismounted and entered the house, where I found him in consultation with a number of his general officers. The tone of the conversation was quite despondent, and one, especially, pointed out the inevitable consequence of the enemy's advance by throwing out Boyeau and constructing successive parallels. I expressed, in marked terms, my disappointment at hearing such views, and General Lee remarked that he had, before I came in, said very much the same thing. I then withdrew and rode to the front, where, after a short time, General Lee joined me, and entered into conversation as to what, under the circumstances, I thought it most advisable to do. I then said to him, substantially, that I knew of nothing better than the plan he had previously explained to me, which was to have been executed by General Johnston, but which was not carried out, that the change of circumstances would make one modification necessary, that instead, as then proposed, of bringing General A. P. Hill with his division on the rear flank of the enemy, it would, because of the preparation for defense made in the meantime, now be necessary to bring the stronger force of General T. J. Jackson from the valley of the Shenandoah. So far as we were then informed, General Jackson was hotly engaged with a force superior to his own, and before he could be withdrawn it was necessary that the enemy should be driven out of the valley. For this purpose, as well as to mask the design of bringing Jackson's forces to make a junction with those of Lee, a strong division under General Whiting was detached to go by rail to the valley to join General Jackson, and by a vigorous assault to drive the enemy across the Potomac. As soon as he commenced a retreat, which unmistakably showed that his flight would not stop within the limits of Virginia, General Jackson was instructed, with his whole force, to move rapidly on the right flank of the enemy, north of the Chickahominy. The manner in which the division was detached to reinforce General Jackson was so open that it was not doubted General McClellan would soon be apprised of it, and would probably attribute it to any other than the real motive, and would confirm him in his exaggerated estimate of our strength. By the rapidity of movement and skill with which General Jackson handled his troops, he, after several severe engagements, finally routed the enemy before the reinforcement of Whiting arrived, and he then, on the 17th of June, proceeded, with that celerity which gave to his infantry its wonderful fame and efficiency, to execute the orders which General Lee had sent to him. As evidence of the daring and unfaltering fortitude of General Lee, I will here recite an impressive conversation which occurred between us in regard to this movement. His plan was to throw forward his left across the meadow bridge, drive back the enemy's right flank, and then, crossing by the Mechanicsville Bridge with another column, to attack in front, hoping by his combined forces to be victorious on the north side of the Chickahominy, while the small force on the entrenched line south of the Chickahominy should hold the left of the enemy in check. I pointed out to him that our force and entrenched line between that left flank and Richmond was too weak for a protracted resistance, and if McClellan was the man I took him for when I nominated him for promotion in a new regiment of cavalry, 
and subsequently selected him for one of the military commissions sent to Europe during the War of the Crimea, as soon as he found that the bulk of our army was on the north side of the Chickahominy, he would not stop to try conclusions with it there, and would immediately move upon his objective point, the city of Richmond. If, on the other hand, he should behave like an engineer officer, and deem it his first duty to protect his line of communication, I thought the plan proposed was not only the best, but would be a success. Something of his old esprit de corps manifested itself in General Lee's first response, that he did not know engineer officers were more likely than others to make such mistakes, but immediately passing to the main subject, he added, if you will hold him as long as you can at the entrenchment, and then fall back on the detached works around the city, I will be upon the enemy's heels before he gets here. Thus was inaugurated the offensive-defensive campaign which resulted so gloriously to our arms, and turned from the capital of the Confederacy a danger so momentous that, looking at it retrospectively, it is not seen how a policy less daring or less firmly pursued could have saved the capital from capture. To resume the connected thread of our narrative. Preparatory to this campaign, a light entrenchment for infantry cover, with some works for field guns, was constructed on the south side of the Chickahominy, and General Whiting, with two brigades, as before stated, was sent to reinforce General Jackson in the valley so as to hasten the expulsion of the enemy, after which Jackson was to move rapidly from the valley, so as to arrive in the vicinity of Ashland by the 24th of June, and by striking the enemy on his right flank, to aid in the proposed attack. The better to ensure the success of this movement, General Lawton, who was coming with a brigade from Georgia to join General Lee, was directed to change his line of march and unite with General Jackson in the valley. As General Whiting went by railroad, it was expected that the enemy would be cognizant of the fact, but not probably assigned to it the real motive, and that such was the case is shown by an unsuccessful attack on the 26th, made on the Williamsburg Road, with the apparent intention of advancing by that route to Richmond. To observe the enemy, as well as to prevent him from learning of the approach of General Jackson, General J. E. B. Stuart was sent with a cavalry force on June 8th to cover the route by which the former was to march, and to ascertain whether the enemy had any defensive works or troops in position to interfere with the advance of those forces. He reported favorably on both these points, as well as to the natural features of the country. On the 26th of June, General Stuart received confidential instructions from General Lee, the execution of which is so interwoven with the seven days' battles as to be more appropriately noticed in connection with them, of which it is proposed now to give a brief account. Our order of battle directed General Jackson to march from Ashland on the 25th toward Slash Church, encamping for the night west of the Central Railroad to advance at 3 a.m. on the 26th, and to turn Beaver Dam Creek. General A.P. Hill was to cross the Chickahominy at Meadow Bridge when Jackson advanced beyond that point, and to move directly upon Mechanicsville. As soon as the bridge there should be uncovered, Longstreet and D.H. Hill were to cross, the former to proceed to the support of A.P. Hill, and the latter to that of Jackson. The four commands were directed to sweep down the north side of the Chickahominy, toward the York River Railroad, Jackson on the left and in advance, Longstreet nearest to the river and in the rear. Huger, McClaws, and Magruder, remaining on the south side of the Chickahominy, were ordered to hold their positions as long as possible against any assault of the enemy, to observe his movements, and to follow him closely if he should retreat. General Stuart, with the cavalry, was thrown out on Jackson's left to guard his flank and give notice of the enemy's movements. Brigadier General Pendleton was directed to employ the reserve artillery so as to resist any advance toward Richmond, to superintend that portion of it posted to aid in the operations on the north bank, and hold the remainder for use where needed. 
the whole of jackson's command did not arrive in time to reach the point designated on the twenty fifth he had therefore more distance to move on the twenty sixth and he was retarded by the enemy not until three p m did a p hill begin to move then he crossed the river and advanced upon mechanicsville after a sharp conflict he drove the enemy from his entrenchments and forced him to take refuge in his works on the left bank of beaver dam about a mile distant this position was naturally strong the banks of the creek in front being high and almost perpendicular and the approach to it was over open fields commanded by the fire of artillery and infantry under cover on the opposite side the difficulty of crossing the stream had been increased by felling the fringe of woods on its banks and destroying the bridges jackson was expected to pass beaver dam above and turn the enemy's right so general hill made no direct attack longstreet and d h hill crossed the mechanicsville bridge as soon as it was uncovered and could be repaired but it was late before they reached the north bank of the chickahominy an effort was made by two brigades one of a p hill and the other ripley's of d h hill to turn the enemy's left but the troops were unable in the growing darkness to overcome the obstructions and were withdrawn the engagement ceased about nine p m our troops retained the ground from which the foe had been driven according to the published reports general mcclellan's position was regarded at this time as extremely critical if he concentrated on the left bank of the chickahominy he abandoned the attempt to capture richmond and risked a retreat upon the white house and yorktown where he had no reserves or reason to expect further support if he moved to the right bank of the river he risked the loss of his communications with the white house whence his supplies were drawn by railroad he would then have to attempt the capture of richmond by assault or be forced to open new communications by the james river and move at once in that direction there he would receive the support of the enemy's navy this latter movement had it appears been thought of previously and transports had been sent to the james river during the night after the close of the contest last mentioned the whole of porter's baggage was sent over to the right bank of the river and united with the train that set out on the evening of the twenty seventh for the james river it would almost seem as if the government of the united states anticipated at this period the failure of mcclellan's expedition on june twenty seventh president lincoln issued an order creating the army of virginia to consist of the forces of fremont in their mountain department of banks in their shenandoah department and of mcdowell at fredericksburg the command of this army was assigned to major general john pope this cut off all reinforcements from mcdowell to mcclellan in expectation of jackson's arrival on the enemy's right the battle was renewed at dawn and continued with animation about two hours during which the passage of the creek was attempted and our troops forced their way to its banks where their progress was arrested by the nature of the stream and the resistance encountered they maintained their position while preparations were being made to cross at another point nearer the chickahominy before these were completed jackson crossed beaver dam above and the enemy abandoned his entrenchments and retired rapidly down the river destroying a great deal of property but leaving much in his deserted camps after repairing the bridges over beaver dam the several columns resumed their advance as nearly as possible as prescribed in the order jackson with whom d h hill had united bore to the left in order to cut off reinforcements to the enemy or intercept his retreat in that direction longstreet and a p hill moved nearer the chickahominy many prisoners were taken in their progress and the conflagration of wagons and stores marked the course of the retreating army longstreet and hill reached the vicinity of new bridge about noon it was ascertained that the enemy had taken a position behind po white creek prepared to dispute our progress 
he occupied a range of hills with his right resting in the vicinity of mcgee's house and his left near that of dr gaines on a wooded bluff which rose abruptly from a deep ravine the ravine was filled with sharpshooters to whom its banks gave protection a second line of infantry was stationed on the side of the hill overlooking the first and protected by a breastwork of logs a third occupied the crest strengthened with rifle trenches and crowned with artillery the approach to this position was over an open plain about a quarter of a mile wide commanded by a triple line of fire and swept by the heavy batteries south of the chickahominy in front of his center and right the ground was generally open bounded on the side of our approach by a wood with dense and tangled undergrowth and traversed by a sluggish stream which converted the soil into a deep morass the woods on the further side of the swamp were occupied by sharpshooters and trees had been felled to increase the difficulty of its passage and detain our advancing columns under the fire of infantry massed on the slopes of the opposite hills and of the batteries on their crests pressing on toward the york river railroad a p hill who was in advance reached the vicinity of new cold harbor about two p m where he encountered the foe he immediately formed his line nearly parallel to the road leading from that place toward mcgee's house and soon became hotly engaged the arrival of jackson on our left was momentarily expected and it was supposed that his approach would cause the extension of the opposing line in that direction under this impression longstreet was held back until this movement should commence the principal part of the enemy's army was now on the north side of the chickahominy hill's single division met this large force with the impetuous courage for which that officer and his troops were distinguished they drove it back and assailed it in its strong position on the ridge the battle raged fiercely and with varying fortune more than two hours three regiments pierced the enemy's line and forced their way to the crest of the hill on his left but were compelled to fall back before overwhelming numbers this superior force assisted by the fire of the batteries south of the chickahominy which played incessantly on our columns as they pressed through the difficulties that obstructed their way caused them to recoil though most of the men had never been under fire until the day before they were rallied and in turn repelled the advance of our assailant some brigades were broken others stubbornly maintained their positions but it became apparent that the enemy was gradually gaining ground the attack on our left being delayed by the length of jackson's march and the obstacles he encountered longstreet was ordered to make a diversion in hill's favor by a feint on the enemy's left in making this demonstration the great strength of the position already described was discovered and general longstreet perceived that to render the diversion effectual the feint must be converted into an attack he resolved with his characteristic determination to carry the heights by assault his column was quickly formed near the open ground and as his preparations were completed jackson arrived and his right division that of whiting took position on the left of longstreet at the same time d h hill formed on our extreme left and after a short but bloody conflict forced his way through the morass and obstructions and drove the foe from the woods on the opposite side ewell advanced on hill's right and became hotly engaged the first and fourth brigades of jackson's own division filled the interval between ewell and a p hill the second and third were sent to the right the arrival of these fresh troops enabled a p hill to withdraw some of his brigades wearied and reduced by their long and arduous conflict the lines being now complete a general advance from right to left was ordered on the right the troops moved forward with steadiness unchecked by the terrible fire from the triple lines of infantry on the hill and the cannon on both sides of the river which burst upon them as they emerged upon the plain the dead and wounded marked the line of their intrepid advance the brave texans leading 
closely followed by their no less daring comrades. The enemy were driven from the ravine to the first line of breastworks, over which our impetuous column dashed up to the entrenchments on the crest. These were quickly stormed, fourteen pieces of artillery captured, and the foe driven into the field beyond. Fresh troops came to his support, and he endeavored repeatedly to rally, but in vain. He was forced back with great slaughter until he reached the woods on the banks of the Chickahominy, and night put an end to the pursuit. Long lines of dead and wounded marked each stand made by the enemy in his stubborn resistance, and the field over which he retreated was strewed with the slain. On the left the attack was no less vigorous and successful. D. H. Hill charged across the open ground in front, one of his regiments having first bravely carried a battery whose fire enfiladed his advance, gallantly supported by the troops on his right, who pressed forward with unfaltering resolution, he reached the crest of the ridge, and after a sanguinary struggle, broke the enemy's line, captured several of his batteries, and drove him in confusion toward the Chickahominy, until darkness rendered further pursuit impossible. Our troops remained in undisturbed possession of the field, covered with the dead and wounded of our opponent, and his broken forces fled to the river or wandered through the woods. Owing to the nature of the country, the cavalry was unable to participate in the general engagement. It, however, rendered valuable service in guarding Jackson's flank and took a large number of prisoners. On the morning of the 28th, it was ascertained that none of the enemy remained in our front north of the Chickahominy. As he might yet intend to give battle to preserve his communications, the Ninth Cavalry, supported by Ewell's division, was ordered to seize the York River Railroad, and General Stuart with his main body to cooperate. When the cavalry reached dispatch station, the enemy retreated to the south bank of the Chickahominy, and burned the railroad bridge. During the forenoon, columns of dust south of the river showed that he was in motion. The abandonment of the railroad and destruction of the bridge proved that no further attempt would be made to hold that line. But from the position the enemy occupied, the roads which led toward the James River would also enable him to reach the lower bridges over the Chickahominy and retreat down the peninsula. In the latter event, it was necessary that our troops should continue on the north bank of the river, and until the intention of General McClellan was discovered, it was deemed injudicious to change their disposition. Ewell was therefore ordered to proceed to Bottoms Bridge to guard that point, and the cavalry to watch the bridges below. No certain indications of a retreat to the James River were discovered by our forces on the south side of the Chickahominy and late in the afternoon the enemy's works were reported to be fully manned. The strength of these fortifications prevented Generals Huger and Magruder from discovering what was passing in their front. Below the enemy's works the country was densely wooded and intersected by swamps, concealing his movements and precluding reconnaissance except by the regular roads, all of which were strongly guarded. The bridges over the Chickahominy in rear of the enemy were destroyed, and their reconstruction by us was impracticable in the presence of his whole army and powerful batteries. We were therefore compelled to wait until his purpose should be developed. Generals Huger and Magruder were again directed to use the utmost vigilance and to pursue the foe vigorously should they discover that he was retreating. During the afternoon of the 28th, the signs were suggestive of a general movement, and no indications of his approach to the lower bridges of the Chickahominy having been discovered by the pickets and the observation at those points. It became inferable that General McClellan was about to retreat to the James River. End of Section 9《 Section 10 of the Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis. Part 4, Chapter 24. Retreat of the Enemy. Pursuit and Battle. Night. Further Retreat of the Enemy. Progress of General Jackson. The Enemy at Fraser's Farm. Position of General Holmes. Advance of General Longstreet. Remarkable Features of the Battle. Malvern Hill. Our Position. The Attack. Expedition of General Stuart. Destruction of the Enemy's Stores. Assaults on the Enemy. Retreat to Westover on the James. Siege of Richmond Raised. Number of Prisoners Taken. Strength of Our Forces. Strength of Our Forces at Seven Pines and After. Strength of the Enemy. During the night I visited the several commands along the entrenchment on the south side of the Chickahominy. General Huger's was on the right, General McClaw's in the center, and General Magruder's on the left. The night was quite dark, especially so in the woods in front of our line, and in expressing my opinion to the officers that the enemy would commence a retreat before morning, I gave special instructions as to the precautions necessary in order certainly to hear when the movement commenced. In the confusion of such a movement with narrow roads and heavy trains, a favorable opportunity was offered for attack. It fell out, however, that the enemy did move before morning, and that the fact of the works having been evacuated was first learned by an officer on the north side of the river, who the next morning, the twenty-ninth, about sunrise, was examining their works by the aid of a field glass. Generals Longstreet and A.P. Hill were promptly ordered to recross the Chickahominy at New Bridge and move by the Darbytown and Longbridge roads. General Lee, having sent his engineer, Captain Meade, to examine the condition of the abandoned works, came to the south side of the Chickahominy to unite his command and direct its movements. Magruder and Huger found the whole line of works deserted and large quantities of military stores of every description abandoned or destroyed. They were immediately ordered in pursuit, the former by the Charles City Road, so as to take the enemy's army in flank, and the latter by the Williamsburg Road, to attack his rear. Jackson was directed to cross the Grapevine Bridge and move down the south side of the Chickahominy. Magruder reached the vicinity of Savage Station, where he came upon the rear guard of the retreating army. Being informed that it was advancing, he halted and sent for reinforcements. Two brigades of Huger's division were ordered to his support, but were subsequently withdrawn, it having been ascertained that the force in Magruder's front was merely covering the retreat of the main body. Jackson's route led to the flank and rear of Savage Station but he was delayed by the necessity of reconstructing the Grapevine Bridge. Late in the afternoon, Magruder attacked the enemy with one of his divisions and two regiments of another. A severe action ensued and continued about two hours when night put an end to the conflict. The troops displayed great gallantry and inflicted heavy loss, but owing to the lateness of the hour and the small force engaged, the result was not decisive, and the enemy continued to retreat under cover of night, leaving several hundred prisoners, with his dead and wounded, in our hands. Our loss was small in numbers, but great in value. Among others who could ill be spared, here fell the gallant soldier, the useful citizen, the true friend and Christian gentleman, Brigadier General Richard Griffith. He had served with distinction in foreign war, and when the South was invaded, was among the first to take up arms in defense of our rights. At Savage Station were found about 2,500 men in hospital and a large amount of property. Stores of much value had been destroyed, including the necessary medical supplies for the sick and wounded. The night was so dark that before the battle ended it was only by challenging that on several occasions it was determined whether the troops in front were friends or foes. It was therefore deemed unadvisable to attempt immediate pursuit. Our troops slept on their arms, and in the morning it was found that the enemy had retreated during the night, 
and by the time thus gained, he was enabled to cross the White Oak Creek and destroy the bridge. Early on the 30th, Jackson reached Savage Station. He was directed to pursue the enemy on the road he had taken, and Magruder to follow Longstreet by the Darbytown Road. As Jackson advanced, he captured so many prisoners and collected so large a number of arms that two regiments had to be detached for their security. His progress at White Oak Swamp was checked by the enemy, who occupied the opposite side, and obstinately resisted the rebuilding of the bridge. Longstreet and A.P. Hill, continuing their advance, on the 30th came upon the foe strongly posted near the intersection of the Long Bridge and Charles City Roads, at the place known in the military reports as Fraser's Farm. Huger's route led to the right of this position, Jackson's to the rear, and the arrival of their commands was awaited to begin the attack. On the 29th, General Holmes had crossed from the south side of the James River, and on the 30th was reinforced by a detachment of General Wise's brigade. He moved down the river road, with a view to gain, near to Malvern Hill, a position which would command the supposed route of the retreating army. It is an extraordinary fact that, though the capital had been threatened by an attack from the seabird on the right, though our army had retreated from Yorktown up to the Chickahominy, and after encamping there for a time had crossed the river and moved up to Richmond, yet when at the close of the battles around Richmond McClellan retreated and was pursued toward the James River, we had no maps of the country in which we were operating. Our generals were ignorant of the roads, and their guides knew little more than the way from their homes to Richmond. It was this fatal defect in preparation and the erroneous answers of the guides that caused General Lee first to post Holmes and Wise when they came down the river road at New Market where, he was told, was the route that McClellan must pursue in his retreat to the James. Subsequently learning that there was another road, by the Willis Church, which would better serve the purpose of the retreating foe, Holmes's command was moved up to a position on that road where, at the foot of a hill which concealed from view the enemy's line, he remained under fire of the enemy's gunboats, the huge shrieking shells from which dispersed a portion of his cavalry and artillery, though the faithful old soldier remained with the rest of his command, waiting, according to his orders, for the enemy with his trains to pass. But taking neither of the roads pointed out to General Lee, he retreated by the shorter and better route, which led by Dr. Poindexter's house to Harrison's Landing. It has been alleged that General Holmes was tardy in getting into position, and failed to use his artillery as he had been ordered. Both statements are incorrect. He first took position when and where he was directed, and soon after he moved to the last position to which he was assigned. The dust of his advancing column caused a heavy fire from the gunboats to be opened upon him, and in men who had never before seen the huge shells then fired, they inspired a degree of terror not justified by their effectiveness. The enemy, instead of being a straggling mass moving toward the James River, as had been reported, were found halted between West's house and Malvern Hill, on ground commanding Holmes's position with an open field between them. General Holmes ordered his chief of artillery to commence firing upon the enemy's infantry, which immediately gave way. But a heavy fire of twenty-five or thirty guns promptly replied to our battery, and formed with the gunboats a crossfire upon General Holmes's command. The numerical superiority of the opposing force, both in infantry and artillery, would have made it worse than useless to an attempt an assault unless previously reinforced, and as no reinforcements arrived, Holmes, about an hour after nightfall, withdrew to a point somewhat in advance of the one he had held in the morning. Though the enemy continued their cannonade until after dark, and most of the troops were near levies, General Holmes reported that they behaved well under the trying circumstances to which they were exposed, except a portion of his artillery and cavalry, which gave way in disorder, probably from the effect of the ten-inch shells, which were to them a novel implement of war. For when I met them, say, half a mile from the point they had left, and succeeded in stopping them, another shell fell, and exploded near us in the top of a wide-spreading tree giving a shower of metal and limbs, which soon after caused them to resume their flight, in a manner that plainly showed no moral power could stop them within the range of those shells. 
It was after a personal and hazardous reconnaissance that General Lee assigned General Holmes to his last position. And when I remonstrated with General Lee, whom I met returning from his reconnaissance, on account of the exposure to which he had subjected himself, he said he could not get the required information otherwise, and therefore had gone himself. After the close of the Battle of Malvern Hill, General Holmes found that a deep ravine led up to the rear of the left flank of the enemy's line, and expressed his regret that it had not been known, and that he had not been ordered, when the attack was made in front, to move up that ravine and simultaneously assail in flank and reverse. It was not until after he had explained with regret the lost but unknown opportunity that he was criticized as having failed to do his whole duty in the Battle of Malvern Hill. He has passed beyond the reach of censure or of praise after serving his country on many levels wisely and well. I, who knew him from our schoolboy days, who served with him in garrison and in the field, and with pride watched him as he gallantly led a storming party up a rocky height at Monterey, and was intimately acquainted with his whole career during our sectional war, bear willing testimony to the purity, self-abnegation, generosity, fidelity, and gallantry which characterized him as a man and a soldier. General Huger reported that his progress was delayed by trees which his opponent had felled across the Williamsburg Road. In the afternoon, after passing the obstructions and driving off the men who were still cutting down trees, they came upon an open field, P. Williams's, where they were assailed by a battery of rifled guns. The artillery was brought up and replied to the fire. In the meantime, a column of infantry was moved to the right, so as to turn the battery, and the combat was ended. The report of this firing was heard at Fraser's farm, and erroneously supposed to indicate the near approach of Huger's column and, it has been frequently stated, induced General Longstreet to open fire with some of his batteries, as noticed to General Huger where our troops were, and that thus the engagement was brought on. General A. P. Hill, who was in front and had made the disposition of our troops while hopefully waiting for the arrival of Jackson and Huger, states that the fighting commenced by fire from the enemy's artillery, which swept down the road, etc., this not only concurs with my recollection of the event, but is more in keeping with the design to wait for the expected reinforcements. The detention of Huger, as above stated, and the failure of Jackson to force a passage on the White Oak Swamp, left Longstreet and Hill without the expected support to maintain the unequal conflict as best they might. The superiority in numbers and advantage of position were on the side of the enemy. The battle raged furiously until 9 p.m., by that time the enemy had been driven with great slaughter from every position but one, which he maintained until he was enabled to withdraw under cover of darkness. At the close of the struggle nearly the entire field remained in our possession, covered with the enemy's dead and wounded. Many prisoners, including a general of division, were captured, and several batteries with some thousands of small arms were taken. After this engagement, Magruder, who had been ordered to go to the support of Holmes, was recalled to relieve the troops of Longstreet and Hill. He arrived during the night with the troops of his command much fatigued by the long hot march. In the Battle of Fraser's Farm the troops of Longstreet and Hill, though disappointed in the expectation of support, and contending against superior numbers advantageously posted, made their attack successful by the most heroic courage and unfaltering determination. Nothing could surpass the bearing of General Hill on that occasion and I often recur with admiration to the manner in which Longstreet, when Hill's command seemed about to be overborne, steadily led his reserve to the rescue, as he might have marched on a parade. The mutual confidence between himself and his men was manifested by the calm manner in which they went into the desperate struggle, the skill and courage which made that corps illustrious on former as well as future fields were never more needed or better exemplified than on this. The current of the battle which was then setting against us was reversed, and the results which have been stated were gained. That more important consequences would have followed had Huger and Jackson, or either of them, arrived in time to take part in the conflict, is unquestionable, and there is little hazard in saying that the army of McClellan would have been riven in twain, beaten in detail, and could never, as an organized body, have reached the James River. Our troops slept on the battlefield they had that day won, and couriers were sent in the night with instructions to hasten the march of the troops who had been expected during the day. 
valor less true or devotion to their cause less sincere than that which pervaded our army and sustained its commanders would in this hour of thinned ranks and physical exhaustion have thought of the expedient of retreat but so far as i remember no such resort was contemplated to bring up reinforcements and attack again was alike the expectation and the wish during the night humanity the crowning grace of the knightly soldier secured for the wounded such care as was possible not only to those of our own army but also to those of the enemy who had been left upon the field the battle was in many respects one of the most remarkable of the war here occurred on several occasions the capture of batteries by the impetuous charge of our infantry defying the canister and grape which ploughed through their ranks and many hand-to-hand -hand conflicts where bayonet wounds were freely given and received and men fought with clubbed muskets in the life-and-death encounter the estimated strength of the enemy was double our own and he had the advantage of being in position from both causes it necessarily resulted that our loss was very heavy to the official reports and the minute accounts of others the want of space compels me to refer the reader for a detailed statement of the deeds of those who in our day served their country so bravely and so well during the night those who fought us at fraser's farm fell back to the stronger position of malvern hill and by a night march the force which had detained jackson at white oak swamp effected a junction with the other portion of the enemy early on the first of july jackson reached the battlefield of the previous day having forced the passage of white oak swamp where he captured some artillery and a number of prisoners he was directed to follow the route of the enemy's retreat but soon found him in position on a high ridge in front of malvern hill here on a line of great natural strength he had posted his powerful artillery supported by his large force of infantry covered by hastily constructed entrenchments his left rested near crew's house and his right near benford's immediately on his front the ground was open varying in width from a quarter to half a mile and sloping gradually from the crest was completely swept by the fire of his infantry and artillery to reach this open ground our troops had to advance through a broken and thickly wooded country traversed nearly throughout its whole extent by a swamp passable at only a few places and difficult at these the whole was within range of the batteries of the heights and the gunboats in the river under whose incessant fire our movements had to be executed jackson formed his line with whiting's division on his left and d h hill's on his right one of ewell's brigades occupying the interval the rest of ewell's and jackson's own division were held in reserve magruder was directed to take position on jackson's right but before his arrival two of huger's brigades came up and were placed next to hill magruder subsequently formed on the right of these brigades which with a third of huger's were placed under his command longstreet and a p hill were held in reserve and took no part in the engagement owing to ignorance of the country the dense forests impeding necessary communications and the extreme difficulty of the ground the whole line was not formed until a late hour in the afternoon the obstacles presented by the woods and the swamp made it impracticable to bring up a sufficient amount of artillery to oppose successfully the extraordinary force of that arm employed by the enemy while the field itself afforded us few positions favorable for its use and none for its proper concentration general w n pendleton in whom were happily combined the highest characteristics of the soldier the patriot and the christian was in chief command of the artillery and energetically strove to bring his long-range guns and reserve artillery into a position where they might be effectively used against the enemy but the difficulties before mentioned were found insuperable orders were issued for a general advance at a given signal but the causes referred to prevented a proper concert of action among the troops d h hill pressed forward across the open field and engaged the enemy gallantly breaking and driving back his first line but a simultaneous advance of the other troops not taking place he found himself unable to maintain the ground he had gained against the overwhelming numbers and numerous batteries opposed to him jackson sent to his support his own division and that part of ewell's which was in reserve but owing to the increasing darkness and intricacy of the forest and swamp they did not arrive in time to render the desired assistance hill was therefore compelled to abandon part of the ground he had gained after suffering severe loss and inflicting heavy damage on the right the attack was gallantly made by huger's and magruder's commands 
Two brigades of the former commenced the action. The other two were subsequently sent to the support of Magruder and Hill. Several determined efforts were made to storm the hill at Cruz House. The brigade advanced bravely across the open field, raked by the fire of a hundred cannon and the musketry of large bodies of infantry. Some were broken and gave way. Others approached close to the guns, driving back the infantry, compelling the advance batteries to retire to escape capture, and mingling their dead with those of the enemy. For want of cooperation by the attacking columns, their assaults were too weak to break the enemy's line and after struggling gallantly, sustaining and inflicting great loss, they were compelled successively to retire. Night was approaching when the attack began, and it soon became difficult to distinguish friend from foe. The firing continued until after 9 p.m., but no decided result was gained. Part of our troops were withdrawn to their original positions, others remained in the open field, and some rested within a hundred yards of the batteries that had been so bravely but vainly assailed. The lateness of the hour at which the attack necessarily began gave the foe the full advantage of his superior position, and augmented the natural difficulties of our own. At the cessation of firing, several fragments of different commands were lying down and holding the ground within a short distance of the enemy's line, and as soon as the fighting ceased, an informal truce was established by common consent. Numerous parties from both armies, with lanterns and litters, wandered over the field seeking for the wounded, whose groans and calls on all sides could not fail to move with pity the hearts of friend and foe. The morning dawned with heavy rain, and the enemy's position was seen to have been entirely deserted. The ground was covered with his dead and wounded, and his route exhibited evidence of a precipitate retreat. To the fatigue of hard marches and successive battles, enough to have disqualified our troops for rapid pursuit, was added the discomfort of being thoroughly wet and chilled by rain. I set out to the neighboring houses to buy, if it could be had, at any price, enough whiskey to give to each of the men a single gill, but it could not be found. The foe had silently withdrawn in the night by a route which had been unknown to us, but which was the most direct route to Harrison's Landing and he had so many hours the start that, among the general officers who expressed to me their opinion, there was but one who thought it was possible to pursue effectively. That was General T. J. Jackson, who quietly said, They have not all got away if we go immediately after them. During the pursuit, which has just been described, the cavalry of our army had been absent, having been detached on a service which was reported as follows. After seizing the York River Railroad on June 28th and driving the enemy across the Chickahominy, the force under General Stuart proceeded down the railroad to ascertain if there was any movement of the enemy in that direction. He encountered but little opposition and reached the vicinity of the White House on the 29th. On his approach, the enemy destroyed the greater part of the immense stores accumulated at that depot and retreated toward Fortress Monroe. With one gun and some dismounted men, General Stuart drove off a gunboat which lay near the White House, and rescued a large amount of property, including more than 10,000 stand of small arms, partially burned. General Stuart describes his march down the enemy's line of communication with the York River as one in which he was but feebly resisted. He says, We advanced until, coming in view of the White House, a former plantation residence of General George Washington, at a distance of a quarter of a mile, a large gunboat was discovered lying in the landing. I was convinced that a few bold sharpshooters could compel the gunboat to leave. I accordingly ordered down about seventy-five, partly of the 1st and 4th Virginia Cavalry, and partly of the Jeff Davis Legion, armed with the rifled carbines. They advanced on this monster so terrible to our fancy, and a body of sharpshooters was sent ashore from the boat to meet them. To save time, I ordered up the howitzer, a few shells from which, fired with great accuracy and bursting directly over her decks, caused an instantaneous withdrawal from the sharpshooters, and a precipitous flight under headway of steam down the river. An opportunity was here offered for observing the deceitfulness of the enemy's pretended reverence for everything associated with the name of Washington, for the dwelling-house was burned to the ground, not a vestige left except what told of desolation and vandalism. Nine large barges, laden with stores, were on fire as we approached. 
immense numbers of tents, wagons, and cars and long trains loaded, and five locomotives, a number of forges, quantities of every species of quartermaster's stores and property, making a total of many millions of dollars, all more or less destroyed. I replied to a note from the commanding general that there was no evidence of a retreat of the main body down the Williamsburg Road, and I had no doubt that the enemy, since his defeat, was endeavoring to reach the James as a new base, being compelled to surrender his connection with the York. If the Federal people can be convinced that this was a part of McClellan's plan, that it was in his original design for Jackson to turn his right flank, and our generals to force him from his stronghold, they certainly never can forgive him for the millions of public treasure that his superb strategy cost. Leaving one squadron at the White House, he returned to guard the lower bridges of the Chickahominy. On the 30th, he was directed to recross and cooperate with Jackson. After a long march, he reached the rear of the enemy at Malvern Hill on the night of July 1st, at the close of the engagement. On the 2nd of July, the pursuit was commenced, the cavalry under General Stuart in advance. The knowledge acquired since the event renders it more than probable that, could our infantry, with a fair amount of artillery, during that day and the following night, have been in position on the ridge which overlooked the plain where the retreating army was encamped on the bank of the James River, a large part of his army must have been dispersed, and the residue would have been captured. It appears from the testimony taken before the United States Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War that it was not until July 3rd that the heights which overlooked the encampment of the retreating army were occupied, and from the manuscript notes on the war by General J. E. B. Stuart, we learn that he easily gained and took possession of the heights, and with his light howitzer opened fire upon the enemy's camp, producing great commotion. This was described by the veteran soldier General Casey of the United States Army as thus. The enemy had come down with some artillery upon our army massed together on the river, the heights commanding the position not being in our possession. Had the enemy come down and taken possession of those heights with a force of twenty or thirty thousand men, they would, in my opinion, have taken the whole of our army except the small portion of it that might have got off on the transports. General Lee was not a man of hesitation, and they have mistaken his character who supposed caution was his vice. He was prone to attack, and not slow to press an advantage when he gained it. Longstreet and Jackson were ordered to advance, but a violent storm which prevailed throughout the day greatly retarded their progress. The enemy, harassed and closely followed by the cavalry, succeeded in gaining Westover on the James River and the protection of his gunboats. His position was one of great natural and artificial strength, after the heights were occupied and entrenched. It was flanked on each side by a creek, and the approach in front was commanded by the heavy guns of his shipping, as well as by those mounted in his entrenchments. Under these circumstances it was deemed inexpedient to attack him, and in view of the condition of our troops, who had been marching and fighting almost incessantly for seven days, under the most trying circumstances, it was determined to withdraw in order to afford them the repose of which they stood so much in need. Several days were spent in collecting arms and other property abandoned by the enemy, and in the meantime some artillery and cavalry were sent below Westover to annoy his transports. On July 8th our army returned to the vicinity of Richmond. Under ordinary circumstances the army of the enemy should have been destroyed. Its escape was due to the causes already stated. Prominent among these was the want of correct and timely information. This fact, together with the character of the country, enabled General McClellan skillfully to conceal his retreat, and to add much to the obstructions with which nature had beset the way of our pursuing columns. We had, however, effected our main purpose. The siege of Richmond was raised, and the object of a campaign which had been prosecuted after months of preparation, at an enormous expenditure of men and money, was completely frustrated. More than 10,000 prisoners, including officers of rank, 52 pieces of artillery, and upward of 35,000 stand of small arms were captured. The stores and supplies of every description which fell into our hands were great in amount and value, but small in comparison with those destroyed by the enemy. His losses in battle exceeded our own, as attested by the thousands of dead and wounded left on every field while his subsequent inaction shows in what condition the survivors reached the protection of the gunboats. 
In the archive office of the War Department in Washington, there are on file some of the field and monthly returns of the strength of the Army of Northern Virginia. These are the original papers which were taken from Richmond. They furnish an accurate statement of the number of men in that army at the periods named. They were not made public at the time, as I did not think it would be judicious to inform the enemy of the numerical weakness of our forces. The following statements have been taken from those papers by Major Walter H. Taylor, of the staff of General Lee, who supervised for several years the preparation of the original returns. A statement of the strength of the troops under General Johnston shows that on May 21, 1862, he had present for duty as follows. Smith's division, consisting of the brigades of Whiting, Hood, Hampton, Hatton, and Pettigrew, 10,592. Longstreet's division, consisting of the brigades of A.P. Hill, Pickett, R. H. Anderson, Wilson, Colston, and Pryor, 13,816. Magruder's division, consisting of the brigades of McLaws, Kershaw, Griffith, Cobb, Toombs, and D. R. Jones, 15,680. D. H. Hill's division, consisting of the brigades of Early, Rhodes, Rains, Featherston, and the commands of Colonels Ward and Crump, 11,151. Cavalry Brigade, 1,289. Reserve Artillery, 1,160. Total effective men, 53,688. Statement of the strength of the Army commanded by General R. E. Lee on July 20, 1862. Department of Northern Virginia and North Carolina. Present for duty. Department of North Carolina, 722 officers, 11,509 enlisted men. Longstreet's Division, 557 officers, 7,929 enlisted men. D. H. Hill's Division, 550 officers, 8,998 enlisted men. McLaws Division, 514 officers, 7,188 enlisted men. A. P. Hill's Division, 519 officers, 10,104 enlisted men. Anderson's Division, 357 officers, 5,760 enlisted men. D. R. Jones's Division, 213 officers, 3,500 enlisted men. Whiting's Division, 252 officers, 3,600 enlisted men. Stewart's Cavalry, 295 officers, 3,740 enlisted men. Pendleton's Artillery, 103 officers, 1,716 enlisted men. Rhett's Artillery, 78 officers, 1,355 enlisted men. Total, including Department of North Carolina, 4,160 officers, 65,399 enlisted men. Army of Northern Virginia, September 22, 1862. Present for duty. Longstreet's Command, 1,410 officers, 19,001 enlisted men. Jackson's Command, D. H. Hill's Division, 310 officers, 4,739 enlisted men. A. P. Hill's Division, 318 officers, 4,435 enlisted men. Ewell's Division, 280 officers, 3,144 enlisted men. Jackson's Division, 183 officers, 2,367 enlisted men. Total, 2,501 officers, 33,686 enlisted men. Army of Northern Virginia, September 30th, 1862. Present for duty. Longstreet's Command, 1,927 officers, 26,489 enlisted men. Jackson's Command, 1,629 officers, 21,728 enlisted men. Reserve Artillery, 50 officers, 716 enlisted men. Total. 3,606 officers, 48,933 enlisted men. Major Taylor, in his work, states, In addition to the troops above enumerated as the strength of General Johnston on May 21, 1862, there were two brigades subject to his orders, then stationed in the vicinity of Hanover Junction, one under the command of General Branch. 
they were subsequently incorporated into the division of general a p hill and participated in the battles around richmond he has no official data by which to determine their numbers but from careful estimates and conference with general anderson he estimates the strength of the two at four thousand effective subsequent to the date of the return of the army around richmond heretofore given but previous to the battle of seven pines general johnston was reinforced by general huger's division of three brigades the total strength of these three brigades according to the reports of the operations of the army of northern virginia was five thousand and eight effectives taylor says if the strength of these five be added to the return of may twenty first we shall have sixty two thousand six hundred and ninety six as the effective strength of the army under general johnston on may thirty first eighteen sixty two deduct the losses sustained in the battle of seven pines as shown by the official reports of casualties say six thousand eighty four and we have fifty six thousand six hundred twelve as the effective strength of the army when general lee assumed command there have been various attempts made to point out the advantage which might have been obtained if general lee in succeeding to the command had renewed on the first of june the unfinished battle of the thirty first of may and the representation that he commenced his campaign known as the seven days battles only after he had collected a great army instead of moving with a force not greatly superior to that which his predecessor had has led to the full exposition of all the facts bearing upon the case in the southern historical society papers june eighteen seventy six is published an extract from an address of colonel charles marshall secretary and aide-de-camp to general r e lee before the virginia division of the army of northern virginia in it colonel marshall quotes general j e johnston as saying general lee did not attack the enemy until the twenty sixth of june because he was employed from the first until then in forming a great army by bringing to that which i had commanded fifteen thousand men from north carolina under major general holmes twenty two thousand men from south carolina and georgia and above sixteen thousand men from the valley in the divisions of jackson and ewell etc these numbers added together make fifty three thousand colonel marshall then proceeds from official reports to show that all these numbers were exaggerated and that one brigade spoken of as seven thousand strong that of general drayton was not known to be in the army of virginia until after the seven days and that another brigade of which general johnston admitted he did not know the strength colonel marshall thought it safer to refer to as the unknown brigade which he suggests may have been a small command under general evans of south carolina who did not join the army until after it moved from richmond general holmes's report made july fifteenth eighteen sixty two states that on the twenty ninth of june he brought his command to the north side of the james river and was joined by general wise's brigade with this addition his force amounted to six thousand infantry and six batteries of artillery general ransom's brigade had been transferred from the division of general holmes to that of general huger a short time before general holmes was ordered to join general lee the brigade of general branch had been detached at an earlier period it was on duty near to hanover junction and under the command of general j e johnston before the battle of seven pines these facts are mentioned to account for the small size of general holmes's division which had been reduced to two brigades ripley's brigade on the twenty sixth of june was reported to have an aggregate force of two thousand three hundred sixty six including pioneers and the ambulance corps general lawton's brigade when moving up from georgia to richmond was ordered to change direction and join general jackson in the valley he subsequently came down with general jackson and reports the force which he led into the battle of cold harbor on the twenty seventh of june eighteen sixty two as three thousand five hundred men general lee after the battle of seven pines had sent two large brigades under general whiting to cooperate with general jackson in the valley and to return with him according to instructions furnished these brigades were in the battle of seven pines and were counted in the force of the army when general lee took command of it lawton's georgia brigade as has been stated was diverted from its destination for a like temporary service and is accounted for as reinforcements brought from the south these three brigades though coming with jackson and ewell were not a part of their divisions and if their numbers are made to swell the force which jackson brought they should be elsewhere subtracted 
general j a early in the same number of the historical society papers in a letter addressed to general j e johnston february fourth eighteen seventy five makes an exhaustive examination of official reports and applies various methods of computation to the question at issue among other facts he states drayton's brigade did not come to virginia until after the battles around richmond it was composed of the fifteenth south carolina and the fiftieth and fifty first georgia regiments and the third south carolina battalion a part if not all of it was engaged in the fight at secessionville south carolina on the sixteenth of june eighteen sixty two its first engagement in virginia was on the rappahannock twenty fifth of august eighteen sixty two after sharpsburg it was so small that it was distributed among some other brigades in longstreet's corps after minute inquiry general early concludes that the whole command that came from the valley including the artillery the regiment of cavalry and the maryland regiment and a battery then known as the maryland line could not have exceeded eight thousand men in this general early does not include either lawton's brigade or the two brigades of whiting and reaches the conclusion that the whole force received by general lee was about twenty three thousand about thirty thousand less than your estimate taking the number given by general early as the entire reinforcement received by general lee after the battle of seven pines and before the commencement of the seven days battles which those who know his extreme accuracy and minuteness of inquiry will be quite ready to do and deducing from the twenty three thousand the casualties in the battle of seven pines six thousand and eighty four we have sixteen thousand nine hundred sixteen if to this be added whatever number of absentees may have joined the army in anticipation of active operations a number which i have no means of ascertaining the result will be the whole increment to the army with which general lee took the offensive against mcclellan it appears from the official returns of the army of the potomac that on june twentieth general mcclellan had present for duty one hundred fifteen thousand one hundred two men it is stated that mcclellan reached the james river with between eighty five thousand and ninety thousand men and that his loss in the seven days battles was fifteen thousand two hundred forty nine this would make the army one hundred five thousand strong at the commencement of the battles probably general dix's corps of nine thousand two hundred seventy seven men stationed at fortress monroe is not included in this last statement end of section ten Section 11 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 25. Forced Emancipation. Purposes of the United States Government at the Commencement of 1862. Subjugation or Extermination. The Willing Aid of United States Congress. Attempt to legislate the subversion of our social institutions. Could adopt any measure self-defense would justify. Slavery, the cause of all troubles, therefore must be removed. Statements of President Lincoln's inaugural. Declaration of Sumner. Abolition legislation. The power based on necessity its formula, the system of legislation devised, confiscation, how permitted by the law of nations, views of Wheaton, of J.Q. Adams, of Secretary Marcy, of Chief Justice Marshall, nature of confiscation and proceedings, compared with the acts of the United States Congress, provisions of the acts, 5,000 millions of property involved, another feature of the act, confiscates property within reach, Procedure against persons. Held us as enemies and traitors. Attacked us with the instruments of war and penalties of municipal law. Emancipation to be secured. Remarks of President Lincoln on signing the bill. Remarks of Mr. Adams compared. Another alarming usurpation of Congress. Argument for it. No limit to the war power of Congress. How maintained. The act to emancipate slaves in the District of Columbia. Compensation promised. Remarks of President Lincoln. The right of property violated. Words of the Constitution. The act to prohibit slavery in the territories. 
the act making an additional article of war all officers forbidden to return fugitives words of the constitution the powers of the constitution unchanged in peace or war the discharge of fugitives commanded in the confiscation act words of the constitution at the commencement of the year eighteen sixty two it was the purpose of the united states government to assail us in every manner and at every point and with every engine of destruction which could be devised the usual methods of civilized warfare consist in the destruction of an enemy's military power and the capture of his capital these however formed only a small portion of the purposes of our enemy if peace with fraternity and equality in the union under the constitution as interpreted by its framers had been his aim this was attainable without war but seeking supremacy at the cost of a revolution in the entire political structure involving a subversion of the constitution the subjection of the states the submission of the people and the establishment of a union under the sword his efforts were all directed to subjugation or extermination thus while the executive was preparing immense armies ironclad fleets and huge instruments of war with which to invade our territory and destroy our citizens the willing aid of an impatient enraged congress was invoked to usurp new powers to legislate the subversion of our social institutions and to give the form of legality to the plunder of a frenzied soldiery that body had no sooner assembled than it brought forward the doctrine that the government of the united states was engaged in a struggle for its existence and could therefore resort to any measure which a case of self-defense would justify it pretended not to know that the only self-defense authorized in the constitution for the government created by it was by the peaceful method of the ballot box and that so long as the government fulfilled the objects of its creation see preamble of the constitution and exercised its delegated powers within their prescribed limits its surest and strongest defense was to be found in that ballot box the congress next declared that our institution of slavery was the cause of all the troubles of the country and therefore the whole power of the government must be so directed as to remove it if this had really been the cause of the troubles how easily wise and patriotic statesmen might have furnished a relief nearly all the slaveholding states had withdrawn from the union therefore those who had been suffering vicariously might have welcomed their departure as the removal of the cause which disturbed the union and have tried the experiment of separation should the trial have brought more wisdom and a spirit of conciliation to either or both there might have arisen as a result of the experiment a reconstructed fraternal union such as our fathers designed the people of the seceded states had loved the union shoulder to shoulder with the people of the other states they had bled for its liberties and its honor their sacrifices in peace had not been less than those in war and their attachment had not diminished by what they had given nor were they less ready to give in the future the concessions they had made for many years and the propositions which followed secession proved their desire to preserve the peace the authors of the aggressions which had disturbed the harmony of the union had lately acquired power on a sectional basis and were eager for the spoil of their sectional victory to conceal their real motive and artfully to appeal to the prejudice of foreigners they declared that slavery was the cause of the troubles of the country and of the rebellion which they were engaged in suppressing in his inaugural address in march eighteen sixty one president lincoln said quote, i have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists i believe i have no lawful right to do so and i have no inclination to do so End quote. the leader sumner of the abolition party in congress on february twenty fifth eighteen sixty one said in the senate quote, i take this occasion to declare most explicitly that i do not think that congress has any right to interfere with slavery in a state End quote. the principle thus announced had regulated all the legislation of congress from the beginning of its first session in seventeen eighty nine down to the first session of the thirty seventh congress commencing july fourth eighteen sixty one a few months after the inaugural address above cited and the announcement of the fact above quoted were made congress commenced to legislate for the abolition of slavery if it had the power now to do what it before had not whence was it derived there had been no addition in the interval to the grants in the constitution not a word or letter of that instrument had been changed since the possession of the power was disclaimed yet after july fourth eighteen sixty one it was asserted by the majority in congress 
that the government had power to interfere with slavery in the states whence came the change the answer is it was wrought by the same process and on the same plea that tyranny has ever employed against liberty and justice the time-worn excuse of usurpers necessity an excuse which is ever assumed as valid because the usurper claims to be the sole judge of his necessity the formula under which it was asserted was as follows quote, whereas the laws of the united states have been for some time past and now are opposed and the execution thereof obstructed etc by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings quote, etc therefore says the plea of necessity a new power is this day found under the constitution of the united states this means that certain circumstances had transpired in a distant portion of the union and the powers of the constitution had thereby become enlarged the inference follows with equal reason that when the circumstances cease to exist the powers of the constitution will be contracted again to their normal state that is the powers of the constitution of the united states are enlarged or contracted according to circumstances mankind cannot be surprised at seeing a government administered on such an interpretation of powers blunder into a civil war and approach the throes of dissolution nevertheless these views were adopted by the thirty-seventh congress of the united states and a system of legislation was devised which embraced the following usurpations universal emancipation in the confederate states through confiscation of private property of all kinds prohibition of the extension of slavery to the territories emancipation of slavery in all places under the exclusive control of the government of the united states emancipation with compensation in the border states and in the district of columbia practical emancipation to follow the progress of the armies all restraints to be removed from the slaves so that they could go free wherever they pleased and be fed and clothed when destitute at the expense of the united states literally to become a quote, ward of the government end quote. the emancipation of slaves through confiscation in states where the united states government had under the constitution no authority to interfere with slavery was a problem which the usurpers found it difficult legally or logically to solve but these obstacles were less regarded than the practical difficulty in states where the government had no physical power to enforce its edicts the limited powers granted in the constitution to the government of the united states were not at all applicable to such designs or commensurate with their execution now let us see the little possibility there was for constitutional liberties and rights to survive when entrusted to such unscrupulous hands in article one section eight the constitution says quote, the congress shall have power to declare war grant letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning captures on land and water to raise and support armies to provide and maintain a navy to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces end quote, etc this is the grant of power under which the government of the united states makes war upon a foreign nation if it had not been given in the constitution there would not have been any power under which to conduct a foreign war such as that of eighteen twelve against great britain or that of eighteen forty six against mexico in such conflicts the nations engaged recognize each other as separate sovereignties and as public enemies and use against each other all the powers granted by the law of nations one of these powers is the confiscation of the property of the enemy under the law of nations of modern days this confiscation is limited in extent made under a certain form and for a defined object for the modern laws of war one must look to the usages of civilized states and to the publicists who have explained and enforced them these usages constitute themselves the laws of war in relation to the capture and confiscation of private property on land in addition to what has been said in previous pages it may be added that the whole matter has never been better stated than by our great american publicist mr wheaton in these words quote, by the modern usages of nations which have now acquired the force of law temples of religion public edifices devoted to civil purposes only monuments of art and repositories of science are exempted from the general operations of war private property on land is also exempt from confiscation with the exception of such as may become booty in special cases when taken from enemies in the field or in besieged towns 
and of military contributions levied upon the inhabitants of the hostile territory. This exemption extends even to the case of an absolute and unqualified conquest of the enemy's country. End quote. Elements of International Law, page 421. Mr. John Quincy Adams, in a letter to the Secretary of State, dated August 22, 1815, says, quote, Our object is the restoration of all the property, including slaves, which, by the usages of war among civilized nations, ought not to have been taken. All private property on shore was of that description. It was entitled by the laws of war to exemption from capture. End quote. For American State Papers, 116, etc. Again, Mr. William L. Marcy, Secretary of State, in a letter to the Count de Sartige, dated July 28, 1856, says, quote, the prevalence of Christianity and the progress of civilization have greatly mitigated the severity of the ancient mode of prosecuting hostilities. It is a generally received rule of modern warfare, so far at least as operations upon land are concerned, that the persons and effects of non-combatants are to be respected. The wanton pillage or uncompensated appropriation of individual property by an army, even in possession of an enemy's country, is against the usage of modern times. Such a proceeding at this day would be condemned by the enlightened judgment of the world, unless warranted by particular circumstances. End quote. The words of the late Chief Justice Marshall on the capture and confiscation of private property should not be omitted. Quote, it may not be unworthy of remark that it is very unusual, even in cases of conquest, for the conqueror to do more than displace the sovereign and assume dominion over the country. The modern usage of nations which has become law, would be violated. That sense of justice and of right, which is acknowledged and felt by the whole civilized world, would be outraged if private property should be generally confiscated and private rights annulled. The people change their allegiance. Their relation to their ancient sovereign is dissolved, but their relations to each other and their rights of property remain undisturbed. End quote. United States versus Perchman, 7 Peters, 51. The government of the United States recognized us as under the law of nations by attempting to use against us one of the powers of that law. Yet, if we were subject to this power, we were most certainly entitled to its protection. This was refused. That government exercised against us all the severities of the law and outraged that sense of justice and of right which is acknowledged and felt by the whole civilized world by rejecting the observance of its ameliorations. The act of confiscation is a power exercised under the laws of war for the purpose of indemnifying the captor for his expense and losses, and it is upon this basis that it is recognized. At the same time, there is a mode of procedure attached to its exercise, by which it is reserved from the domain of plunder and devastation. As has been already shown, there are, under the law, exemptions of certain classes of property, it is further required that the property subject to confiscation shall be actually captured and taken possession of. It shall then be adjudicated as prize by a proper authority, then sold, and the money received must be deposited in the public treasury. Such are the conditions attached by the law of nations to legal confiscation. Now compare these conditions with the Act of Congress, that in its true light the usurpations of that body may be seen. The Act of Congress allowed no exemptions of private property, but confiscated all the property of every kind belonging to persons residing in the Confederate States who were engaged in hostilities against the United States, or who were aiding or abetting those engaged in hostilities. This includes slaves as well as other property. The Act provided that the slaves should go free, that is, they were exempted from capture, from being adjudicated and sold and no proceeds of sale were to be put into the public treasury. The following sections are from the Act of the United States Congress, passed on August 6, 1861. Quote, Section 1. That if, during the present or any future insurrection against the government of the United States, after the President of the United States shall have declared by proclamation that the laws of the United States are opposed and the execution thereof obstructed, by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings, or by the power vested in the marshals by law, any person or persons, his, her, or their agent, attorney, or employee, shall purchase or acquire, sell or give, any property, 
of whatsoever kind or description with intent to use or employ the same or suffer the same to be used or employed in aiding abetting or promoting such insurrection or resistance to the laws or any person or persons engaged therein or if any person or persons being the owner or owners of any such property shall knowingly use or employ or consent to the use or employment of the same as aforesaid all such property is hereby declared to be lawful subject of prize and capture wherever found and it shall be the duty of the president of the united states to cause the same to be seized confiscated and condemned section three the proceedings in court shall be for the benefit of the united states and the informer equally section four that whenever hereafter during the present insurrection against the government of the united states any person claimed to be held to labor or service under the law of any state shall be required or permitted by the person to whom such labor or service is claimed to be due or by the lawful agent of such person to take up arms against the united states or shall be required or permitted by the person to whom such labor or service is claimed to be due or his lawful agent to work or to be employed in or upon any fort navy yard dock armory ship entrenchment or in any military or naval service whatsoever against the government and lawful authority of the united states then and in every such case the person to whom such labor or service is claimed to be due shall forfeit his claim to such labor any law of the state or of the united states to the contrary notwithstanding and whenever thereafter the person claiming such labor or service shall seek to enforce his claim it shall be a full and sufficient answer to such claim that the person whose service or labor is claimed had been employed in hostile service against the government of the united states contrary to the provisions of this act End quote. the following sections are from the act of congress passed on july seventeenth eighteen sixty two section six that if any person within any state or territory of the united states other than those named aforesaid End quote. confederate officers etc quote, after the passage of this act being engaged in armed rebellion against the government of the united states or aiding or abetting such rebellion shall not within sixty days after public warning and proclamation duly given and made by the president of the united states cease to aid countenance and abet such rebellion and return to his allegiance to the united states all the estate and property monies stocks and credits of such person shall be liable to seizure as aforesaid and it shall be the duty of the president to seize and use them as aforesaid or the proceeds thereof and all sales transfers or conveyances of any such property after the expiration of the said sixty days from the date of such warning and proclamation shall be null and void and it shall be a sufficient bar to any suit brought by such person for the possession or use of such property or any of it to allege and prove that he is one of the persons described in this section section seven that to secure the condemnation and sale of any such property after the same shall have been seized so that it may be made available for the purpose aforesaid proceedings in rem shall be instituted in the name of the united states in any district court thereof or in any territorial court or in the united states district court for the district of columbia within which the property above described or any part thereof may be found or into which the same if movable may first be brought which proceedings shall conform as nearly as may be to proceedings in admiralty or revenue cases and if said property whether real or personal shall be found to have belonged to a person engaged in rebellion or who has given aid or comfort thereto the same shall be condemned as enemy's property and become the property of the united states and may be disposed of as the court shall decree and the proceeds thereof paid into the treasury of the united states for the purposes aforesaid section nine that all slaves of persons who shall hereafter be engaged in rebellion against the government of the united states or who shall in any way give aid or comfort thereto escaping from such persons and taking refuge within the lines of the army and all slaves captured from such persons or deserted by them and coming under the control of the government of the united states and all slaves of such persons found or being within any place occupied by rebel forces and afterward occupied by the forces of the united states shall be deemed captives of war and shall be forever free of their servitude 
and not again held as slaves. Section 10. That no slave escaping into any state, territory, or the District of Columbia from any other state shall be delivered up or in any way impeded or hindered of his liberty, except for crime or some offense against the laws, unless the person claiming said fugitive shall first make oath that the person to whom the labor or service of such fugitive is alleged to be due is his lawful owner and has not borne arms against the united states in the present rebellion nor in any way given aid and comfort thereto and no person engaged in the military and naval service of the united states shall under any pretense whatever assume to decide on the validity of the claim of any person to the service or labor of any other person or surrender up any such person to the claimant on pain of being dismissed from the service End quote. these above-mentioned proceedings violated all the principles of the law of nations without a shadow of authority for it under the constitution of the united states the armies of the united states were literally authorized to invade the confederate states to seize all property as plunder and to let the negroes go free our posterity reading that history will blush that such facts are on record it was estimated on the floor of the house of representatives that the aggregate amount of property within our limits subject to be acted upon by the provisions of this act would affect upward of six million people and would deprive them of property of the value of nearly five thousand million dollars said mr garrett davis of kentucky quote, was there ever in any country that god's son ever beamed upon a legislative measure involving such an amount of property and such numbers of property holders end quote. but this is only one feature of the confiscation act which was applied to persons who were within the confederate states in such a position that the ordinary process of the united states courts could not be served upon them they could be reached only by the armies there was another feature equally flagrant and criminal it was extended to all that class of persons giving aid and comfort who could be found within the united states or in such position that the ordinary process of law could be served on them it was derived from article three section three of the constitution which says quote, the congress shall have the power to declare the punishment of treason but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attainted end quote. the mode of procedure against persons under this power was determined by other clauses of the constitution article three section two declared that quote, the trial of all crimes except in cases of impeachment shall be by jury and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed end quote. in section three of the same article it was provided that quote, no person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court end quote. this feature of the confiscation act passed by the congress of the united states provided for the punishment of the owner of property on the proof of the crime but excluded the trial by jury and made the forfeiture of the property absolute instead of a forfeiture for life heavy fines were imposed and property was sold in fee the property to which the act applied was not a prize under the law of nations nor booty nor contraband of war nor enforced military contributions nor used or employed in the war or in resistance to the laws it was private property outside of the conflict of arms and forfeited not because it was the instrument of offense but as a penalty for the assertion of his rights by the owner which was imputed to him as a crime such proceeding was in effect punishment by the forfeiture of a man's entire estate real and personal without trial by jury and in utter disregard of the provisions of the constitution it was an attempt to get a man's property real and personal quote, silver spoons end quote, included into a prize court to be tried by the laws of war it will be seen that we were treated by the congress of the united states as holding the twofold relation of enemies and traitors and that they used against us all the instruments of war and all the penalties of municipal law which made the punishment of treason to be death the practical operation therefore of these laws was that under a constitution which defined treason to consist in levying war against the united states which would not suffer the traitor to be condemned except by the judgment of his peers and when condemned 
would not forfeit his estate except during his life the government of the united states did proceed against six million people without indictment without trial by jury without the proof of two witnesses did adjudge our six millions of people guilty of treason in levying war and decree to deprive us of all our estate real and personal for life and in fee being nearly five thousand million dollars and after we have been thus punished without trial by jury and by the loss in fee of our whole estate the government of the united states assumed the power on the same charge of levying war to try us and to hang us the first object to be secured by this act of confiscation was the emancipation of all our slaves upon his approval of the bill president lincoln sent a message to congress in which he said quote, it is startling to say that congress can free a slave within a state and yet if it were said the ownership of the slave had first been transferred to the nation and congress had then liberated him the difficulty would at once vanish and this is the real case the traitor against the general government forfeits his slave at least as justly as he does any other property and he forfeits both to the government against which he offends the government so far as there can be ownership thus owns the forfeited slaves and the question for congress in regard to them is shall they be made free or sold to new masters End quote. it is amazing to see the utter forgetfulness of all constitutional obligations and the entire disregard of the conditions of the laws of nations manifested in these words of the president of the united states was he ignorant of their existence or did he seek to cover up his violation of them by a deceptive use of language it may not be unreasonable to repeat here the words of john quincy adams in his letter of august twenty second eighteen fifteen as above stated quote, our object is the restoration of all the property including slaves which by the usages of war among civilized nations ought not to have been taken end quote. let posterity answer the questions who were the revolutionists who were really destroying the constitution of the united states the agitation of this subject brought out another still more alarming usurpation in congress and showed that the majority were ready to throw aside the last fragments of the constitution in order to secure our subjugation the argument for this usurpation was thus framed assuming that the state of the nation was one of general hostility and that being so involved it possessed the power of self-defense it was asserted that the supreme power of making and conducting war was expressly placed in congress by the constitution quote, the whole powers of war are vested in congress end quote. united states supreme court brown versus united states one cranch there is no such power in the judiciary and the executive is simply quote, commander in chief of the army and navy end quote all other powers not necessarily implied in the command of the military and naval forces are expressly given to congress the theory was that the contingency of actual hostilities suspended the constitution and gave to congress the sovereign power of a nation creating new relations and conferring new rights imposing extraordinary obligations on the citizens and subjecting them to extraordinary penalties there is under that view therefore no limit on the power of congress it is invested with the absolute powers of war the civil functions of the government are for the time being in abeyance when in conflict and all state and national authority subordinated to the extreme authority of congress as the supreme power in the peril of external or internal hostilities the ordinary provisions of the constitution peculiar to a state of peace and all laws and municipal regulations were to yield to the force of martial law as resolved by congress this was designated as the war power of the united states government i should deem an apology to be due to my readers in offering for their perusal such insane extravagances under a constitutional government of limited powers had not this doctrine been adopted by the united states government and subsequently made the basis of some most revolutionary measures for the emancipation of the african slaves and the enslavement of the free citizens of the south one must allow that the chamber of deputies of the french national assembly of seventeen ninety eight had some claims to a respectable degree of political virtue when compared with the thirty seventh congress and the executive of the united states the specious argument for this tremendous and sweeping usurpation designated as the war power as presented by its adherents 
may be stated in a few words. Thus, the Constitution confers on Congress all the specific powers incident to war, and then further authorizes it, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, end quote. The words are these, quote, Congress shall have power to declare war, to grant letters of mark and reprisal, to make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasion and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States, or in any department or officer thereof. End quote. It will be seen that this unlimited despotic power was claimed for Congress in the conduct of the war under the last clause above, viz., quote, to make all laws which, end quote, etc., whereas no one familiar with the rules of legal interpretation will seriously contend that the powers of Congress are one atom greater by the insertion of this provision than they would have been if it had not appeared in the Constitution. The delegation of a power gives the incidental means necessary for its execution. Another step in the usurpations begun for the destruction of slavery was the passage by Congress of an act for the emancipation of slaves in the District of Columbia. The act emancipated all persons of African descent held to service within the district, immediately upon its passage. Those owners of slaves who had not sympathized with us were allowed ninety days to prepare and present to commissioners, appointed for that purpose, the names, ages, and personal description of their slaves, who were to be valued by commissioners. No single slave could be estimated to be worth more than three hundred dollars. One million dollars was appropriated to carry the act into effect. All claims were to be presented within ninety days after the passage of the Act, and not thereafter. But there was no saving clause for minors, femme covert, insane, or absent persons. On his approval of the Act, the Executive of the United States sent a message to Congress, in which he said, quote, I have never doubted the constitutional authority of Congress to abolish slavery in the district and I have ever desired to see the national capital freed from the institution in some satisfactory way. Hence there never has been in my mind any questions upon the subject, except those of expediency, arising in view of all the circumstances. End quote. For the previous twenty-five or thirty years, the subject had again and again been presented in Congress, and was always rejected. One of the incidents that led to our withdrawal from the Union was the apprehension that it was the intention of the United States government to violate the constitutional right of each state to adopt and maintain, to reject or abolish slavery as it pleased. This step showed the justness of our apprehensions. Among the rights guaranteed to every citizen of the United States, including the District of Columbia, was the right of property. No one could be deprived of his property by the government, except in the manner prescribed and authorized by the Constitution. Its words are these, quote, No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. End quote. Whenever it was necessary in the administration of affairs that the government should take private property for public use, it had the right to take that private property on the condition of making compensation for it, and on no other condition. Also, it could not be taken except for public use, even by making just compensation for it, nor could it be taken to be destroyed. The simple and sole condition on which the inviolability of private property could be broken by the government itself was that it was necessary for public use. Otherwise, there was no constitutional right on the part of the government to take the property at all. Again, this property, thus necessary, must be taken by due process of law. The government had not the right to declare the mode and arbitrarily fix the limit of price which should be paid. The Negro could be taken only as other property, even admitting that he could be taken for emancipation. The due process of law required that the citizen's property should be appraised judicially. A court must proceed judicially in every case, summon a jury, appoint commissioners, and, under the supervision and sanction of the court, 
the valuation of the slave by them must proceed as it does in relation to any other property of the citizen that might be taken by the lawful exercise of the power of congress or of the united states government thus it will be seen that by this usurpation of power the constitution was violated not only by taking private property for other purposes than for public use but in the neglect to observe the due process of law which the constitution required the next step in the usurpation of power for the destruction of the right of citizens to hold property in slaves was the passage by congress of an act which declared that after its passage quote, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the territories of the united states now existing or which may at any time hereafter be formed or acquired by the united states otherwise than in the punishment of crimes end quote, etc the subject had been brought forward at every session of congress for a number of years and was uniformly resisted by the advocates of equality among the states we claimed an equal right with the other states to the occupation and settlement of the territories which were the common property of the union and that any infringement of this right was not only a violation of the spirit of the constitution but destructive of that equality of the states so necessary for the maintenance of their union we further claimed our right under this express provision of the constitution quote, the congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the united states and nothing in this constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the united states or of any particular states end quote the obstinate resistance of the consolidation school to our views was an evidence of their aggressive purposes and justified still further our apprehensions of their intention to violate our constitutional rights another step taken to accomplish the emancipation of our slaves was the passage by congress of an act making an additional article of war for the government of the army of the united states it was in these words quote, all officers or persons in the military or naval service of the united states are prohibited from employing any of the forces under their respective commands for the purpose of returning fugitives from service or labor who may have escaped from any persons to whom such service or labor is claimed to be due and any officer who shall be found guilty by a court-martial of violating this article shall be dismissed from the service End quote. the constitution of the united states expressly declares that all such persons Quote, shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due end quote. in this instance congress passed an act declaring that they shall not be delivered up on such claim and as a penalty for disobedience any officer of the army or navy should be dismissed from the service thus an act of congress directly forbade that which the constitution commanded a more flagrant outrage upon the constitutional obligation could not be committed but it may be said a state of war existed that does not diminish the crime of the congress the commands of the constitution are positive direct unchanged and unrelaxed by circumstances they are equally in force in a state of war and in a state of peace the powers are delegated and cannot be amended or changed by war or peace its words are these quote, this constitution and the laws of the united states which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers both of the united states and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this constitution end quote it declares itself to be within its province the supreme law of the united states not merely during the condition of peace but continuing through all times and events supreme throughout the union until it should be altered or amended in the manner prescribed another instance of the like flagrant violation of the constitution is to be found in the ninth and tenth sections of the confiscation act previously referred to the constitution of the united states in article four section three says quote, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor end quote. it will be seen by reference to the constitution 
that the first part of the clause here referred to forbids the discharge of the fugitive, and the second part commands his delivery to the claimant. It has just been stated in what manner Congress commanded the claim for delivery to be repudiated. The, quote, discharge from such service and labor, end quote, in consequence of any state law or regulation is forbidden. This is a part of the Constitution, and it is thereby made the duty of the executive, legislative, and judicial departments of the United States government to enforce the prohibition, to make sure that the fugitive is not discharged by any action of a state. Will the friends of constitutional liberty believe our assertion that these acts, the execution of which it was so expressly made the duty of the United States government to prevent, that government itself did do in the most explicit and effective manner? The Constitution forbids the discharge. Congress and the executive, each, not only commanded the discharge, but to make it sure and thorough, forbade the incipiency of an apprehension not even permitting the shadow of an occasion for a discharge. Could human ingenuity devise a method for a more perfect subversion of a constitutional duty? The provisions of the Act are in these words, quote, All slaves of persons who shall hereafter be engaged in rebellion against the government of the United States, or who shall in any way give aid or comfort thereto, escaping from such persons and taking refuge within the lines of the army, and all slaves captured from such persons, or deserted by them, and coming under the control of the government of the United States, and all slaves of such persons found, or being within any place occupied by rebel forces, and afterward occupied by the forces of the United States, shall be deemed captives of war, and shall be forever free of their servitude, and not again held as slaves. End quote. Again, the next section of the same act says, quote, no slave escaping into any state, territory, or the District of Columbia from any other state shall be delivered up or in any way impeded or hindered of his liberty, except for crime or some offense against the laws, unless the person claiming said fugitive shall first make oath that the person to whom the labor or service of such fugitive is alleged to be due is his lawful owner and has not borne arms against the United States in the present rebellion nor in any way given aid and comfort thereto. End quote. In this connection, it is worth while to read again the words of the Constitution. Quote, no person held to service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. End quote. Let it be observed that there is no limitation, no qualification, no condition whatever attached to this clause of the Constitution. The words, quote, no person held to service, end quote, included every slave in the United States. In Article 1, Section 9, and in Article 5, are exceptions suspending the operation of the general provision. But in this provision there are none, because it was intended there should be none. The provision was designed to include every slave and to be in force under all circumstances. Perhaps it may be urged as an objection to this assertion that the Confederate states were out of the Union and beyond the protection of the provisions of the Constitution. This objection cannot be admitted in extenuation of this crime of Congress and the Executive, for there was, thus far, no act of Congress nor proclamation of the President in existence showing that either of them regarded the Confederate states in any other position than as states within the Union, whose citizens were subject to all the penalties contained in the Constitution, and therefore entitled to the benefit of all its provisions for their protection. Unhesitatingly, it may be said, and as will be still more apparent farther on in these pages, that all the conduct of the Confederate states pertaining to the war consisted in just efforts to preserve to themselves and their posterity rights and protections guaranteed to them in the Constitution of the United States, and that the actions of the federal government consisted in efforts to subvert those rights, destroy those protections, and subjugate us to compliance with its arbitrary will, and that this conduct on their part involved the subversion of the Constitution and the destruction of the fundamental principles of liberty. Who is the criminal? Let posterity answer. End of section 11.
Section 12 of The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, Volume 2, by Jefferson Davis, Part 4, Chapter 26. Forced Emancipation Concluded. Emancipation Acts of President Lincoln. Emancipation with Compensation Proposed to Border States. Reasons Urged for It. Its Unconstitutionality. Order of General Hunter. Revoked by President Lincoln. Reasons. The Pressure on Him. One Cause of Our Secession. The Time to Throw Off the Mask at Hand. The Necessity That Justified the President and Congress Also Justified Secession. Men United in Defense of Liberty Called Traitors. Conference of President Lincoln with Senators and Representatives of Border States. Remarks of Mr. Lincoln. Reply of Senators and Representatives. Failure of the Proposition. 300,000 more men called for. Declarations of the Anti-Slavery Press. Truth of our Apprehensions. Reply of President Lincoln. Another call for men. Further Declarations of the Anti-Slavery Press. The Watchword Adopted. Memorial of so-called Christians to the President. Reply of President Lincoln. Issue of the Preliminary Proclamation of Emancipation. Issue of the Final Proclamation. The Military Necessity Asserted. The Consummation Verbally Reached. Words of the Declaration of Independence. Declarations by the United States Government of what it intended to do. True Nature of the Party Unveiled. Declarations of President Lincoln. Vindication of the sagacity of the Southern people. His declarations to European cabinets. Object of these declarations. Trick of the fugitive thief. The boast of Mr. Lincoln calmly considered. The attention of the reader is now invited to a series of usurpations in which the President of the United States was the principal actor. On March 6, 1862, he began a direct and unconstitutional interference with slavery by sending a message to Congress recommending the adoption of a resolution which should declare that the United States ought to cooperate with any state which might adopt the gradual abolition of slavery, giving to such state pecuniary aid, to be used by such state in its discretion, to compensate for the inconvenience, public and private, produced by such change of system. The reason given for the recommendation of the adoption of the resolution was that the United States government would find its highest interest in such a measure as one of the most important means of self-preservation. He said in explanation that, quote, the leaders of the existing rebellion entertain the hope that this government will ultimately be forced to acknowledge the independence of some part of the disaffected region, and that all the slave states north of such part will then say, the union for which we have struggled being already gone, we now choose to go with the southern section, to deprive them of this hope substantially ends the rebellion, and the initiation of emancipation deprives them of it and of all the states initiating it. End quote. When it was asked where the power was found in the Constitution to appropriate the money of the people to carry out the purposes of the resolution, it was replied that the legislative department of the government was competent, under these words in the preamble of the Constitution, quote, to provide for the general welfare. End quote to do anything and everything which could be considered as promoting the general welfare. It was further said that this measure was to be consummated under the war power, that whatever was necessary to carry on the war to a successful conclusion might be done without restraint under the authority, not of the Constitution, but as a military necessity. It was further said that the President of the United States had thus far failed to meet the just expectations of the party which elected him to the office he held and that his friends were to be comforted by the resolution and the message, while the people of the border slave states could not fail to observe that with the comfort to the North there was mingled an awful warning to them. It was denied by the President that it was an interference with slavery in the states. It was an artful scheme to awaken a controversy in the slave states, and to commence the work of emancipation by holding out pecuniary aid as an inducement. In every previous declaration, the President had said that he did not contemplate any interference with domestic slavery within the states. The resolution was passed by large majorities in each house. This proposition of President Lincoln was wholly unconstitutional, 
because it attempted to do what was expressly forbidden by the Constitution. It proposed a contract between the State of Missouri and the Government of the United States, which, in the language of the Act, shall be, quote, irrepealable without the consent of the United States, end quote. The words of the Constitution are as follows, quote, No State shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, etc., end quote. This is a prohibition, not only upon the power of one state to enter into a compact, alliance, confederation, or agreement with another state, but also with the government of the United States. Again, if the state of Missouri could enter into an irrepealable agreement or compact with the United States, that slavery should not therein exist after the acceptance on the part of Missouri of the act, then it would be an agreement on the part of that state to surrender its sovereignty and make the state unequal in its rights of sovereignty with the other states of the Union. The other states would have the complete right of sovereignty over their domestic institutions, while the state of Missouri would cease to have such right. The whole system of the United States government would be abrogated by such legislation. Again, it is a cardinal principle of the system that the people in their sovereign capacity may, from time to time, change and alter their organic law, and a provision incorporated in the Constitution of Missouri that slavery should never thereafter exist in that state could not prevent a future sovereign convention of its people from re-establishing slavery within its limits. It will be observed, from what has been said in the preceding pages, that the usurpations by the government of the United States, both by the legislative and executive departments, had not only been tolerated, but approved. Feeling itself, therefore, fortified in its unlimited power from necessity, the wheels of the revolution were now to move with accelerated velocity in their destructive work. Accordingly, a manifesto soon comes from the executive on universal emancipation. On April 25, 1862, the United States Major General Hunter, occupying a position at Hilton Head, South Carolina, issued an order declaring the states of Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina under martial law. On May 9th, the same officer issued another order, declaring, quote, the persons held as slaves in those states to be forever free, end quote. The executive of the United States on May 19th issued a proclamation declaring the order to be void, and said, quote, I further make known that, whether it be competent for me as commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy to declare the slaves of any state or states free, and whether at any time or in any case it shall have become a necessity indispensable to the maintenance of the government to examine such supposed power, are questions which, under my responsibility, I reserve to myself and which I cannot feel justified in leaving to the decision of commanders in the field. End quote. Speaking of this order of Major General Hunter soon afterward, President Lincoln, in remarks on July 12, 1862, to the Border States' representatives, said, quote, In repudiating it, I gave dissatisfaction, if not offense, to many who support the country cannot afford to lose. And this is not the end of it. The pressure in this direction is still upon me and is increasing. End quote. This pressure consisted in the demand of his extreme partisans that the whole authority of the government should be exerted for the immediate and universal emancipation of the slaves. By a reference to the statement of the causes of our withdrawal from the Union of the United States, it will be seen that one of them consisted in the conviction that the newly elected officers of the government would wield its powers for the destruction of the institutions of the southern states. The facts already related in these pages furnish ample proofs of the justice and accuracy of this conviction. The time was now close at hand when the mask was to be thrown off, and, at a single dash of the pen, four hundred millions of our property was to be annihilated, the whole social fabric of the southern states disrupted, all branches of industry to be disarranged, good order to be destroyed, and a flood of evils many times greater than the loss of property to be inflicted upon the people of the South, thus consummating the series of aggressions which had been inflicted for more than thirty years. All constitutional protections were to be withdrawn, and the powers of a common government, created for common and equal protection to the interests of all, were to be arrayed for the destruction of our institutions. The President of the United States says, quote, This is not the end. The pressure in this direction is still upon me and is increasing. End quote. 
how easy it would have been for the northern people by a simple honest obedience to the provisions of the constitution to have avoided the commission of all these crimes and horrors for the law which demands obedience to itself guarantees in return life and safety it is not necessary to ask again where the president of the united states or the congress found authority for their usurpations but it should be remembered that if the necessity which they pleaded was an argument to justify their violations of all the provisions of the constitution the existence of such a necessity on their part was a sufficient argument to justify our withdrawal from union with them if necessity on their part justified a violation of the constitution necessity on our part justified secession from them if the preservation of the existence of the union by coercion of the states was an argument to justify these violent usurpations by the united states government it was still more forcibly an argument to justify our separation and resistance to invasion for we were struggling for our natural rights but the government of the united states has no natural rights how can a people who glory in a declaration of independence which broke the slumbers of a world declare that men united in defense of liberty property and the pursuit of happiness are traitors is it henceforth to be a dictum of humanity that man may no more take up arms in defense of rights liberty and property shall it never again in the course of human events become lawful quote, for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's god entitle them end quote. is the highwayman henceforth to be the lord of the highway and the poor plundered traveller to have no property which he may defend at the risk of the life of the highwayman on july twelfth eighteen sixty two the president of the united states persistent in his determination to destroy the institution of slavery invited the senators and representatives of the border slaveholding states to the executive mansion and addressed them on emancipation in their respective states he said quote, i intend no reproach or complaint when i assure you that in my opinion if you all had voted for the resolution in the gradual emancipation message of last march the war would now be substantially ended and the plan therein proposed is yet one of the most potent and swift means of ending it let the states which are in rebellion see definitely and certainly that in no event will the states you represent ever join their proposed confederacy and they can not much longer maintain the contest but you cannot divest them of their hope to ultimately have you with them so long as you show a determination to perpetuate the institution within your own states beat them at elections as you have overwhelmingly done and nothing daunted they still claim you as their own you and i know what the lever of their power is break that lever before their faces and they can shake you no more forever he further said that the incidents of the war might extinguish the institution in their states and added quote, how much better for you as seller and the nation as buyer to sell out and buy out that without which the war could never have been than to sink both the thing to be sold and the price of it in cutting one another's throats end quote. the reply of the majority consisting of twenty of the twenty-nine senators and representatives subsequently made to the president is worthy of notice they said that they were not of the belief that funds would be provided for the object or that their constituents would reap the fruits of the promise held out and added quote, the right to hold slaves is a right appertaining to all the states of the union they have the right to cherish or abolish the institution as their tastes or their interests may prompt and no one is authorized to question the right or limit its enjoyment and no one has more clearly affirmed that right than you have your inaugural address does you great honor in this respect and inspired the country with confidence in your fairness and respect for law End quote. after asserting that a large portion of our people were fighting because they believed the administration was hostile to their rights and was making war on their domestic institutions they further said quote, remove their apprehensions satisfy them that no harm is intended to them and their institutions that this government is not making war on their rights of property but is simply defending its legitimate authority and they will gladly return to their allegiance end quote. this measure of emancipation with compensation soon proved a failure 
a proposition to appropriate $500,000 to the object, was voted down in the United States Senate with great unanimity. The government was, step by step, quote, educating the people, end quote, up to a proclamation of emancipation, so as to make entire abolition one of the positive and declared issues of the contest. The so-called pressure upon the president was now organized for a final onset. The governors of 15 states united in a request that 300,000 more men should be called out to fill up the reduced ranks, and it was done. The anti-slavery press then entered the arena. Charges were made against the president in the name of, quote, 20 millions of people that a great proportion of those who triumphed in his election were sorely disappointed and deeply pained by the policy he seemed to be pursuing with regard to the slaves of the rebels, end quote. This is a simple statement of the progress of events, and it shows to the world how well-founded were our apprehensions at the hour of its election that the administration intended the destruction of our property and community independence. They further said, quote, you are strangely and disastrously remiss in the discharge of your official and imperative duty with regard to the emancipation provisions of the new Confiscation Act, end quote. They further boldly added, quote, we complain that the Union cause has suffered, and is now suffering, immensely from mistaken deference to rebel slavery. Had you, sir, in your inaugural address, unmistakably given notice that, in case the rebellion already commenced was persisted in, and your efforts to preserve the Union and enforce the law should be resisted by armed force, you would recognize no loyal person as rightfully held in slavery by a traitor, we believe the rebellion would therein have received a staggering, if not fatal, blow. End quote. The president replied at length, saying, quote, I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free." End quote. The education of the conservative portion of the northern people up to emancipation was becoming more complete every day, notwithstanding the professed reluctance of the president. Another call for 300,000 men was made, but enlistments were slow, so that threats of a draft and most liberal bounties were required. The champions of emancipation sought to derive an advantage from this circumstance. They asserted that the reluctance of the people to enter the army was caused by the policy of the government in not adopting bold emancipation measures. If such were adopted, the streets and byways would be crowded with volunteers to fight for the freedom of the, quote, loyal blacks, end quote, and thrice 300,000 could be easily obtained. They said that slavery in the seceded states should be treated as a military question. It contributed nearly all the subsistence which supported the southern men in arms, dug their trenches, and built their fortifications. The watchword which they now adopted was, quote, the abolition of slavery by the force of arms for the sake of the Union, end quote. Meantime, on September 13th, a delegation from the so-called Christians in Chicago, Illinois, presented to President Lincoln a memorial requesting him to issue a proclamation of emancipation, and urged in its favor such reasons as occurred to their minds. President Lincoln replied, quote, What good would a proclamation of emancipation from me do, especially as we are now situated? I do not want to issue a document that the whole world would see must necessarily be inoperative, like the Pope's bull against the comet. Would my word free the slaves, when I cannot even enforce the Constitution in the rebel states? Is there a single court or magistrate or individual that would be influenced by it there? And what reason is there to think it would have any greater effect upon the slaves than the late law of Congress which I approved, and which offers protection and freedom to the slaves of rebel masters who come within our lines? Yet I cannot learn that that law has caused a single slave to come over to us. And suppose they could be induced by a proclamation of freedom from me to throw themselves upon us. What should we do with them? How can we feed and care for such a multitude? If now the pressure of the war should call off our forces from New Orleans to defend some other point, what is to prevent the masters from reducing the blacks to slavery again? 
Now, then, tell me, if you please, what possible result of good would follow the issuing of such a proclamation as you desire? I have not decided against a proclamation of liberty to the slaves, but hold the matter under advisement. End quote. Nine days after these remarks were made, on September 22, 1862, the preliminary proclamation of emancipation was issued by the President of the United States. It declared that at the next session of Congress, the proposition for emancipation in the border slaveholding states would be again recommended, and that on January 1, 1863, quote, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom." End quote. Also, all persons engaged in the military and naval service were ordered to obey and enforce the Article of War and the sections of the Confiscation Act before mentioned. On January 1, 1863, another proclamation was issued by the President of the United States declaring the emancipation to be absolute within the Confederate States, with the exception of a few districts. The closing words of the proclamation were these, quote, And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. End quote. Let us test the existence of the military necessity here spoken of by a few facts. The white male population of the northern states was then 13,690,364. The white male population of the Confederate states was 5,449,463. The number of troops which the United States had called into the field exceeded one million men. The number of troops which the Confederate government had then in the field was less than 400,000 men. The United States government had a navy which was only third in rank in the world. The Confederate government had a navy which at that time consisted of a single small ship on the ocean. The people of the United States had a commerce afloat all over the world. The people of the Confederate States had not a single port open to commerce. The people of the United States were the rivals of the greatest nations in all kinds of manufactures. The people of the Confederate States had few manufactures, and those were of articles of inferior importance. The government of the United States possessed the treasury of a union of eighty years with its vast resources. The Confederate States had to create a treasury by the development of financial resources, the ambassadors and representatives of the former were welcomed at every court in the world. The representatives of the latter were not recognized anywhere. Thus the consummation of the original anti-slavery purposes was verbally reached, but even that achievement was attended with disunion, bloodshed, and war. In the words of the Declaration of Independence, quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, end quote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, quote, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. When a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. End quote. It is thus seen what the United States government did, and our view of this subject would not be complete if we should omit to present their solemn declarations of that which they intended to do. In his proclamation of April 15, 1861, calling for 75,000 men, the President of the United States government said, quote, in any event, the utmost care will be observed, consistently with the objects aforesaid, to avoid any devastation, any destruction of or interference with property, or any disturbance of peaceful citizens in any part of the country. End quote. On the 22nd of July, 1861, Congress passed a resolution relative to the war, from which the following is an extract quote, That this war is not waged on our part in any spirit of oppression 
or for any purpose of conquest or subjugation, or purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institutions of those Confederate states, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution, and to preserve the Union with all the dignity, equality, and rights of the several states unimpaired, and that, as soon as these objects are accomplished, the war ought to cease. End quote. The vote in favor of the resolution was, in the Senate, yeas 30, nays 4. In the House of Representatives, yeas 117, nays 2. It may further be observed that these proclamations cited above afforded to our whole people the complete and crowning proof of the true nature of the designs of the party, which elevated to power the person then occupying the presidential chair at Washington and which sought to conceal its purposes by every variety of artful device and by the perfidious use of the most solemn and repeated pledges on every possible occasion a single example may be cited from the declaration made by president lincoln under the solemnity of his oath as chief magistrate of the united states on march fourth eighteen sixty one quote, apprehension seems to exist among the people of the southern states that by the accession of a republican administration their property and their peace and personal security are to be endangered. There has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehensions. Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection. It is found in nearly all the public speeches of him who now addresses you. I do but quote from one of those speeches when I declare that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Those who nominated and elected me did so with full knowledge that I had made this and many similar declarations and had never recanted them. And more than this, they placed in the platform for my acceptance, and as a law to themselves and to me, the clear and emphatic resolution which I now read. Resolved that the maintenance inviolate of the rights of the states, and especially the right of each state to order and control its own domestic institutions, according to its own judgment exclusively, is essential to that balance of power on which the perfection and endurance of our political fabric depend, and we denounce the lawless invasion by armed force of the soil of any state or territory, no matter under what pretext, as among the gravest crimes." End quote. Nor was this declaration of the want of power or disposition to interfere with our social system confined to a state of peace. Both before and after the actual commencement of hostilities, the Executive of the United States repeated in formal official communications to the cabinets of Great Britain and France that it was utterly without constitutional power to do the act which it subsequently committed, and that in no possible event whether the secession of these states resulted in the establishment of a separate confederacy or in the restoration of the union was there any authority by virtue of which it could either restore a disaffected state to the union by force of arms or make any change in any of its institutions i refer especially for the verification of this assertion to the dispatches addressed by the secretary of state of the united states under direction of the president to the ministers of the united states at London and Paris, under date of the 10th and 22nd of April, 1861. This proclamation was therefore received by the people of the Confederate States as the fullest vindication of their own sagacity in foreseeing the uses to which the dominant party in the United States intended from the beginning to apply their power. For what honest purpose were these declarations made? They could deceive no one who was familiar with the powers and duties of the federal government. They were uttered in the season of invasion of the southern states to coerce them to obedience to the agent established by the compact between the states for the purpose of securing domestic tranquillity and the blessings of liberty. The power to coerce states was not given, and the proposition to make that grant received no favor in the convention which formed the Constitution. And it is seen by the proceedings in the states, when the Constitution was submitted to each of them for their ratification or rejection as they might choose, that a proposition which would have enabled the general government, by force of arms, to control the will of a state, would have been fatal to any effort to make a more perfect union. Such declarations as those cited from the diplomatic correspondence, though devoid of credibility at home, 
might avail in foreign countries to conceal from their governments the real purpose of the action of the majority. Meanwhile, the people of the Confederacy plainly saw that the ideas and interests of the administration were to gain by war the empire that would enable it to trample on the Constitution which it professed to defend and maintain. It was by the slow and barely visible approaches of the serpent seeking its prey that the aggressions and usurpations of the United States government moved on to the crimes against the law of the Union. The usages of war among civilized nations, the dictates of humanity, and the requirements of justice, which have been recited. The performance of this task has been painful, but persistent and widespread misrepresentation of the cause and conduct of the South required the exposure of her slanderer. To unmask the hypocrisy of claiming devotion to the Constitution, while violating its letter and spirit for a purpose palpably hostile to it, was needful for the defense of the South. In the future progress of this work, it will be seen how often we have been charged with the very offenses committed by our enemy, offenses of which the South was entirely innocent, and of which a chivalrous people would be incapable. There was in this the old trick of the fugitive thief who cries, Stop, thief, as he runs. In his message to Congress one year later, on December 8, 1863, the President of the United States thus boasts of his proclamation. Quote, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, issued in September, was running its assigned period to the beginning of the new year. A month later, the final proclamation came, including the announcement that colored men of suitable condition would be received into the war service. The policy of emancipation and of employing black soldiers gave to the future a new aspect, about which hope and fear and doubt contended in uncertain conflict. According to our political system, as a matter of civil administration, the general government had no lawful power to effect emancipation in any state, and for a long time it had been hoped that the rebellion could be suppressed without resorting to it as a military measure. Of those who were slaves at the beginning of the rebellion, full 100,000 are now in the United States military service, about one half of which number actually bear arms in the ranks, thus giving the double advantage of taking so much labor from the insurgent cause and supplying the places which otherwise must be filled with so many white men. So far as tested, it is difficult to say they are not as good soldiers as any." Let the reader pause for a moment and look calmly at the facts presented in this statement. The forefathers of these Negro soldiers were gathered from the torrid plains and malarial swamps of inhospitable Africa. Generally, they were born the slaves of barbarian masters, untaught in all the useful arts and occupations, reared in heathen darkness, and, sold by heathen masters, they were transferred to shores enlightened by the rays of Christianity. There, put to servitude, they were trained in the gentle arts of peace and order and civilization. They increased from a few unprofitable savages to millions of efficient Christian laborers. Their servile instincts rendered them contented with their lot and their patient toil blessed the land of their abode with unmeasured riches. Their strong local and personal attachment secured faithful service to those to whom their service or labor was due. A strong mutual affection was the natural result of this lifelong relation, a feeling best, if not only understood, by those who have grown from childhood under its influence. Never was there happier dependence of labor and capital on each other. The tempter came, like the serpent in Eden, and decoyed them with the magic word of freedom. Too many were allured by the uncomprehended and unfulfilled promises, until the highways of these wanderers were marked by corpses of infants and the aged. He put arms in their hands, and trained their humble but emotional natures to deeds of violence and bloodshed, and sent them out to devastate their benefactors. What does he boastingly announce? Quote, it is difficult to say they are not as good soldiers as any. End quote. Ask the bereaved mother, the desolate widow, the sonless aged sire, to whom the bitter cup was presented by those once of their own household. With double anguish they speak of its bitterness. What does the President of the United States further say? Quote, According to our political system, as a matter of civil administration, the general government had no lawful power to effect emancipation in any state. End quote. And further on, as if with a triumphant gladness, he adds, 
quote, thus giving the double advantage of taking so much labor from the insurgent cause and supplying the places which otherwise must be filled with so many white men, end quote. A rare mixture of malfeasance with traffic in human life. It is submitted to the judgment of a Christian people how well such a boast befits the President of the United States, a federation of sovereigns under a voluntary compact for specific purposes. End of section 12.